area 27.57.57, so 1101011 peaks, such peaks are observed um, at uh, 27.5 observed in the uh, XRD spectra, uh, so that indicates it is a tetragonal total phase of titan dioxide is formed. So here this is the XRD. Uh, we got 25.757, 36.101, and 41.371. So here you see uh, Tita, Rota, Titan dioxide has two phase, two electrodes. One is uh, anatase and another is rotile. So if, if, if it is anatase, you will get uh, 25.5 uh, the peak 101 peak should be obtained. But we got 27.7 uh, uh, and the other peaks also at the same areas that indicates it has a rotile phase and uh, the phases are uh, like this the major peaks so it is tetragonal so the sizes are uh, um, vertical sizes are uh, determined by using serrar formula and uh, full width and half maxima of xrd patterns uh, we got uh, 16 nanometers of size they are, they are uh, uh, you see this is uh, below 100 nanometers of rotile uh, titan dioxide crystals uh, and uh, the stem also uh, you suggest uh, supports the uh, part, 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 uh, formation of uh, uh, nano titan dioxide. So these particle sizes are dependent on the components present in the compounds present in the leaf extract. So the our gossypium reports tell um, uh, gossypium leaf extract consists of flavonoids and reducing sugars, steroids and tapenoids, etc. So they form as a capping agent. They form capping agent uh, and bioreductant so we got uh, that size of uh, uh, the sizes are dependent on especially the components uh, present in the leaf extract so it's <coughs> biosynthesis of uh, uh, this one so this is the uh, cotton after removal of the cotton you will get seeds uh, the extraction of seeds you will get uh, the crude uh, uh, cotton seed oil uh, one part of cotton seed oil and methyl alcohol, 18 parts we have taken, uh, and these those are, those are preheated to 60 degrees centigrade first. First, uh, in RB flask in micro oven, um, the cotton seed oil is uh, uh, taken, uh, and um, na methyl alcohol and nano titan dioxide cat catalyst are uh, um, poured uh, through the condenser, um, and it is uh, subjected to microwave irradiation uh, per about uh, two, three minutes, um, the 700 uh, watts power is uh, microwave power is uh, uh, given. Uh, so we got uh, after afterwards it is cooled in high school temperature. The reaction mixer and filtered by using Buchner funnel. In the funnel we got nano titan dioxide catalyst. It is washed and uh, uh, washed with the distilled water three times, uh, two to three times, and it is reused re 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 uh, for the other batch. And the, uh, the uh, filter it consists of two layers, which is uh, separated by separating funnel. Uh, bottom layer is heavier uh, glycerol byproduct and biodiesel. The biodiesel is uh, separated from the upper layer and washed with uh, uh, hot distilled water for three times uh, and uh, 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 dried uh, at one not five degrees centigrade to remove the moisture content in uh, biodiesel. So these are the results and discussion we we'll see. The reaction temperature compared to the conventional heating, Su King et al. reported these values. Our values are these. So you see reaction temperature 200 to 250 degrees centigrade. Ours is uh, 60 degrees centigrade. Uh, methanol 1 is to 40, 40 ml of methanol is required for every one part of the uh, CPM seed oil. Ours are less uh, reactant content uh, consume, consumption is uh, um, methyl alcohol is here, so is sufficient. Time is 8 hours. Three minutes here. So yield is also more in green method. So these results indicates micro heating is a more useful than conventional heating. Um, so here effect of um, amount of catalyst is also studied. So the amount of catalyst two percent to eight percent gives yield and rate of biodiesel. Uh, um, increasing the uh, their content. It is due to more surface area and uh, interaction of surface with the uh, gossypium seed oil react molecules. So this is the uh, graph. Two percent we got uh, ninety eight point uh, uh, six percent. Uh, so this is the 
titan dioxide uh, catalyst maximum catalyst that is 2% 2.8% used so it is a uh, uh, radcliffe jerry at all reported various acids present in the gossip seed oil so we converted those oils rcoo ch3 that is methyl linoleate methyl palmitate methyl oleate the percentage of you see the green one are unsaturated c17 h35 undali h35 should be there 31 is there that means they are mostly the unsaturation oils are 77.68 unsaturated are 22.32 the unsaturation mostly mono unsaturation is a uh, good for uh, the biodiesel the most of the reports tell mono uh, unsaturated oils are a good certain number um, and uh, uh, good quality for the biodiesel so ours are the uh, most of the react is 52.9 is mono unsaturated and 16.35% uh, is also mono unsaturated so it is a good one so other character density more density they are determined kinetic kinetic viscosity that is the viscosity by density the um, average viscosity by relative viscosity by density gives the kinematic viscosity low kinematic viscosity grade engine oils have high fuel economy better performance longer engine life greenhouse gases reduces friction also flash point uh, high flash point uh, is gives the safer handle because uh, um, yeah, more temperature is uh, uh, given uh, to uh, flash the uh, uh, fuel. Certain number, higher the certain number, the faster the auto ignition. Calorific value, everybody knows calorific value is more, it has more efficiency. So these are the uh, uh, characteristics of the, these are determined by standard measures ASTM, American Society of Testing Materials. So this is the density, this is the diesel, diesel with ASTM standards we compared. So Density of temp on temperature, this is 70, it is in the range of ASTM center, uh, ASTM, the American Society of Testing Materials, uh, the standard the values. So this is kinetic viscosity is also in the limit, flash point is also in the limit, certain number. So they are comparable with diesel and ASTM standards. Uh, the yield is also 98.6 percentage. This indicates uh, ours, are, ours is uh, um, good, uh, um, uh, biodiesel properties uh, and they can be used individually or you can combine you can blend with the diesel you can use uh, uh, as a fuel <coughs> this is the i also uh, this is the reference values in uh, literature jetropha biodiesel soya bean biodiesel palm oil biodiesel working cooking oil biodiesel diesel and these are so our values our diesel gossipium uh, diesel oil uh, biodiesel is a uh, Similar, similar and correlates these values. That means uh, we got a, a good uh, biodiesel uh, having um, better characteristics. Advantages of our method. The present method is green method. A person non-toxic, non-corrosive medium, high yield of biodiesel is obtained, clean reaction and green reaction, simple experimental and isolation procedures. Same tree products are used for the both catalyst synthesis of both catalyst and biodiesel. The catalyst can be recycled uh, by simple filtration and reused without any significant reduction in its activity. So this is the conclusion. So uh, nano titan is synthesized from gossipium leaf extract is a green process. Uh, sizes are 60 nanometers. Uh, particle sizes are 60 nanometers. It is uh, due to more surface area, uh, chemical stability, strong catalyst reactant attraction and the amphotric nature, the acid-based property, nanotitrate is a better catalyst uh, for this uh, uh, synthesis of biodiesel from gossypium seed oil. So here, uh, we done uh, biodiesel is done successfully um, in the microvascular synthesis in the presence of biodiesel uh, uh, titan dioxide. The parameters uh, synthesis of biodiesel are good agreement with the diesel oil, so it may be used alone or by blending with uh, diesel. So I'm thankful to the organizers of ICN 2022, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam, Kerala, for giving the, this great uh, opportunity. I'm grateful to the management principal uh, and heads of uh, mechanical engineering. And um, uh, we correlated with the mechanical engineering faculty staff and uh, equipment also we have utilized. Department of Chemistry of Sri Sivani College of Engineering, Srikakulam, for providing the facilities and support. Thank you very much for your patience. 
these thank are the you, google scholar so this one okay sir thank you thank you yeah please continue so this completed sir thank you professor thank you. tata for thank the excellent you. presentation okay there is a very you. relevant topic in the context of present energy needs thank you sir so the talk is open for discussion okay. i have one small question you mentioned that it is the catalyst is because of this nanostructure property of titanium oxide okay sir did you did you did you measure the surface area of titanium dioxide which you have synthesized uh, not Will sir not uh, not uh, determined i think we have, um, uh, we have already done various multi ferric uh, materials with titanium dioxide and silver ferrite and uh, some published okay. papers so but uh, mm -hmm. the size uh, catalytic property this is the first one sir catalytic property study uh, okay. the size uh, surface area we have not measured sir yeah as you have mentioned that the surface of this catalytic property will depend on the surface area so i think uh, yes, it is useful uh, to measure the surface uh, but, but uh, nano materials are having below 100 nanometers Uh, they have hundred yeah. percent of surface area. We know, sir. That the yeah, reason sixty yeah. uh, nanometers. So more surface area uh, is uh, we propose that more surface area that is that is. Yeah, right. yeah. So any other questions? So if there are no more questions, we thank the speaker once again. Thank you, Professor Tata. And now yeah. move to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Hello? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Hello. 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 Sir, I, uh, good morning, sir. Hmm. Good morning. Sir, actually, uh, sir, actually, I'm Dr. Saroj Rani Patnaik, and actually, first presentation was mine. Shall I give now? At yeah, sure. Uh, I invite you, Professor Patnaik, to give your presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. honorable vice chancellor sir esteemed uh, esteemed uh, uh, chairperson respected faculty members participants and uh, i am dr Pat i am saroj rani patnaik and i am working as associate professor in the department of mechanical engineering at veer surendra sai university of technology which is in, in the state of odisha and uh, and today i am going to uh, give a short review on improving the properties of pla based nano composites for packaging and biomedical application actually one of my phd st student is currently working on a small project on uh, pla based nano composites so before that it's a it's a review it's a literature review that has been done so nowadays uh, let me start that nowadays consumers are demanding biopolymeric materials because of the scarcity of the petroleum products and it is also causing a bad effect to the environment and which causes global warming so nowadays so biopolymers are in great demand because these are derived from naturally occurring products like uh, wheat maize corn and are completely biodegradable and compostable so currently these biopolymers are employed in many applications like in coatings mainly food packaging industries medicines etc so what are these biopolymers these biopolymers are nothing but monomeric units bonded together to form a bigger unit the possible use of these biopolymers are in diverse areas it depends upon the what kind of solvent we are using what is the type of the solvent and what is the application area and so out of these biopolymers one of the biopolymers is polylactic acid that is pla pla is a potential biopolymer which is which has been used to replace the petroleum based plastic which is a thermoplastic material the polymer based nano composite is a multi component system in which the major uh, proportion is a polymer and the minor part is a is a nano nano uh, material whose dimension lies uh, lies uh, that means whose dimension is less than 100 nanometer so but if, but we are adding a in minority but it it plays a very important role in increment in uh, in properties mechanical and thermal properties it has been found that a very little substitution of these nano nanoparticles in the in the polymers and of the, of the range between 1 to 5% leads to a substantial improvement in polymer uh, um, polymer matrix composite properties and these nanofillers are mostly nanoclay graphene carbon nanotubes 
nano silica etc so our aim at the base our the base material is our uh, polylactic acid it is the base material and which comprises of around uh, 70 to 80% uh, or more than that of poly uh, more than that of uh, a of uh, of a poly pmt polymetric uh, composite so the main uh, properties is that that it is it is it, it is a thermoplastic polymer which is derived 100% from the renewable sources like corn sugar beet wheat uh, from the agriculture uh, product and it is completely biodegradable that is the most important thing that's why we want to prepare a biopolymer so that it should not uh, hamper our atmosphere or environment and it is compostable but it is compostable in a humid environment so that biomass can be produced and uh, regarding the properties it has enough properties which can be used for packaging and biomedical biomedical applications what are the desirable properties of pla Poly in polymer matrix composites, uh, the, uh, the, we require that it should be insoluble in water. So this, this PLA, polylactic acid, PLA is insoluble in water. It is moisture resistant that we need for the food packaging industry. If moisture comes, uh, if moisture comes in contact with the food, it will, it will rotten the food. So it is a PLA, the moisture resistant, insoluble in water, completely biodegradable, compostable, and it is glossy in appearance. And it has appreciable mechanical properties and thermal plasticity. But still then we need some improvement in PLA uh, properties that we obtain from agriculture products. So this tells about the PLA life cycle. We can see that this PLA is derived from corn. PLA, PLA is derived from the corn and which upon fermentation, which upon fermentation uh, uh, produces lactic acid. And this lactic acid on oligomerization and derimerization forms lactide. And lactide, this lactide is not in a pure form. It, it on, on purification, it forms a purified lactide, which and on polymerization forms polylactide. That means PLA, then, uh, then that is a PLA. And then, which, uh, then uh, after using it, if you want to decompose it, or uh, it, it is after composting, it forms the biomass. These are the physical properties of PLA. The density of PLA has been found to be 1.25 grams per centimeter cube. And it, its moisture absorption rate is very low. That is 0.3%. Uh, its tensile strength is found to be 70 megapascal. And Young's modulus is found to be 3600 megapascal. Its impact strength is 16.5 kilojoules per meter square and elongation at break is 2.4 percent so it is if we compare the properties of pla with other thermoplastic uh, biopolymers or polymers uh, it, it has been found from the literature that the impact strength of a pla is comparatively less and as well as the elongation at break uh, break is less as compared to the polystyrene which is not a biodegradable polymer but uh, it, uh, it's uh, elongation at break is less we show that it is very it is more brittle than uh, than polystyrene and we have to improve this brittleness property of pla because it is it is very brittle we have to add something as a additive to that so that it it, it can be made a little bit of ductile, uh, ductile. And application areas of PLA, you can see that in whatever in our day-to-day -day life we, we use that uh, food packaging, uh, food packaging applications, food uh, as well as disposable tableware like plates, spoons, cups, forks, all these things. These can easily be uh, decomposed. So, uh, and we cannot uh, deny the usage of uh, PLA in our day-to-day -day life. Even tea bags, we can see. <clears throat> regarding agricultural applications we can see that mulch films are made up of polylactic acid then in medical applications like diapers wipes wound dressing all these things are used uh, in uh, in medical areas then uh, if we go to the advanced applications like it is used for orthopedics bone surgery we can use for prosthetic implants also because it is biocompatible and um, in, uh, in even tissue engineering it is used so and it is lighter in weight so and, and then then regarding the decomposition of the pla plastic it can be recycled it can go for industrial composting facility it can we can you go for the conventional landfills where they can be biodegrade at their own rate 
based upon the temperature and humidity. And now comes the advantages of polylactic acid. It is the most important advantage of uh, polylactic acid is that it is completely biodegradable. So that's why used for, for we use uh, PLA for bio implants, and it is environmental friendly, and it produces no toxic compounds when burnt or when decomposed. Then it produces methane, a, pot a potent greenhouse gas. It is a thermoplastic whose melting point is in between 150 to 160 degrees centigrade and completely glassy in appearance. And it can be PLA. It's a poly, it's a poly lactic acid. It is a it is a it monomer is our lactic acid. So it can be broken down into original monomers by thermal depolymerization process. Advantages always lie with few disadvantages. And uh, and here uh, the disadvantage of PLA is that that I've already discussed that PLA is a little bit more brittle than our polystyrene or ABS kind of uh, plastic, and uh, and it has been found that it is not suitable for high temperature applications like uh, such as containers made for holding hot liquid. So this is the disadvantage. And another disadvantage is that it is more permeable to moisture and oxygen gas. So if oxygen and moisture gas enter into the plastic, it will damage the, it will rotten the food. So, so we have to improve the, uh, um, uh, that means the uh, permeability of moisture and uh, we have to reduce, I mean, it, we have to reduce the permeation of uh, moisture and oxygen in the PLA based material. So it has been found from the literature that when PLA is reinforced with nanofillers, it, it, it drastically increases its properties. And the commonly used nanofillers are, are our graphene, carbon nanotubes, nanoclase, etc. And if we come to the first one, graphene. Graphene, uh, graphene. We all are aware of that the graphene is sp2 hybridized, and graphene is nothing but a form of carbon. It contains a very thin sheet of pure single carbon atom, which firmly held together in a hexagon honeycomb-like uh, fashion. And if, uh, if millions of graphenes are stacked on one another, it forms a graphite. The individual layers of graphene are held together by weak van der Waal force. And the thickness of graphene is only 0 0.335 nanometer. So that's why graphene is known as the thinnest known material to man. And it is the lightest one, thinnest as well as the lightest material. Tensile strength of graphene is about 130 gigapascal which is 300 times stronger than steel and it is eco-friendly and best conductor of heat and electricity which are the desirable properties of our polymer matrix composite so it has been found from the literature that when graphene when embedded in polymer matrix composites it increases its thermal conductivity as well as stability as well as the mechanical properties so this uh, this significant improvement in PMC's properties occurred due to the presence of high modulus graphene in low modulus PLA matrix. And th there are different preparation methods of uh, of uh, graphene reinforced PMC's like uh, two roll mill method, solution blending, mechanical mixing, polymerization method. And another nanofiller is our carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotubes are are also derived from the graphene sheets only. These are the single wall, uh, single wall carbon nanotubes or CNT that are the graphene sheets rolled into cylinders whose diameters are usually one nanometer. And they have very high aspect ratio and positive conductive properties. And uh, this multi wall carbon nanotube uh, comprises of concentric cylinders. Like single wall CNT, these are, these are the concentric cylinders whose diameter ranges from 10 to 20 nanometers. And the interlayer spacing between the cylinders is of, is of the order of 3.4 Amstron. PLA CNT nanocomposites have got increasing attention due to their biodegradability de and biocompatibility. Both because PLA is a biodegradable and biocompatible material. And it, enha it enhances both the thermal, me thermal, mechanical barrier properties, oxygen barrier properties also. And it has also been found that the addition of these fillers and other, other uh, fillers are our nanoclays, silicates, which also improve the same, plays the same role as that of your CNT, our graphene. 
and it improves their mechanical oxygen permeation properties and so and these fillers are compared that means these uh, clay and silicates are compared comparatively cheaper and a very high aspect ratio and strength so finally i would like to conclude that pla slash nano composites have widespread application in biomedical and packaging industries and due to its biocompatibility and, and environmental friendly and nowadays pla uh, pla is uh, blended with not only with nano uh, nanoparticles as well as with natural fibers so in 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 totality pla with nano fiber and with nano composite forms a completely biodegradable and biocompatible uh, uh, polymer matrix composite and 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 the thing is that it further enhances when when we when we embed natural fibers in pla based nano nano composites it further enhances their uh, properties mechanical properties so which are highly essential and these nano fillers when embedded with pla decreases its brittleness that is the demerit of our pla because pla is very little bit of brittle as compared to the uh, commercially available uh, plastic and it enhances its mechanical as well as barrier uh, property so uh, so it is uh, so it make uh, it useful for uh, its applications so these nanometals also provide thermal stability to the pla so these are the references thank you sir and any queries thank you professor patnaik <coughs> the yes your for excellent presentation the talk yes, is sir. now open for discussion Yes, sir. Any queries? So I have just one small query. Did you try yes, to, sir. or was it? I I think it was a literature survey. Yes, sir, literature review. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so in the literature, is the TEM micrograph of the PLA CNT nano composite reported? How does it look, or something like that? Yes, sir. PLA, PLA, uh, it, it, it literature it is there, sir. But in my PPT, uh, that figure is not there. Okay, okay. Sir, actually, in in my in my <coughs> students, the work that my student is going to do, he will mm -hmm. be blending the blending one novel natural fiber along with mm -hmm. uh, along with PLA and uh, nano clay. To okay. uh, and and finally, we will check for the barrier mechanical properties, thermal properties. Then barrier barrier oxygen barrier properties, and that yeah. the five yes sir. yeah along with all these things maybe it is important to record the TEM so to see how the structure modifies Tem. or yes sir yes sir the, of course yeah. then uh, yes sir TEM uh, TEM study is very important and finally yeah. after preparation of that then we will go for the TEM study sir sure in the future we will be going for the uh, trans uh, TEM study <clears throat> okay thank you so much. Say, are there any other question? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, madam? Yeah, please. Uh, yes, sir. So, if you fill these uh, nano materials, nano that is nano yes, uh, carbon, nano that is graphene, etc., the yes, it is generally used for packages. Yes, sir, packaging uh, and biomedical. Packaging, and and biomedical and applications and packaging of this. So, it yes, is, the cost will be somewhat more. Uh, uh, so a little bit that. more because nanometrals are 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 costly materials okay. but uh, by 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 employing just little bit of metal if we enhance uh, enhance a great improvement in mechanical variation and thermal properties so biodegradability yes sir yes sir that is important so biodegradability is very of, important without yes sir yes sir uh, okay. biodegradability okay that okay. is the beauty of it okay so thank you Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all of you for your patience, full hearing, and thank you the organizers, organizers, and the chairperson and the participants. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patnaik. Now we move on to the next speaker. Sir, it seems that Go Professor Ganesh Narayan is not yet joined. So, right now I'm thanking uh, Professor Rubal Chakravarti for sharing the session. Uh, for the wonderful sharing. 
and now moving to another session thank you so much thank you okay thank you sir uh, then and moving uh, to other session of biomedical application where i welcome uh, professor tata kondola rao co chair the session sir can you please start yeah yeah i am here Uh, good morning to all. Um, thank you for your uh, offer. I took it uh, as a privilege. Uh, so first of all, uh, before going to that, I am inviting first member, first uh, participant, professor and doctor Sonal I Thakur, Department of Chemistry. Faculty of Science, the MS University of Baroda, India, self therapeutic nanomaterials for cancer therapy. So, please share your uh, presentation and go ahead. Is he present? Is she present, Madam, Dr. Sonal I Thakur? Is she there? Yes, sir. She is there. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, Professor Sonal. Okay, okay. Are you there? Mm. Sir, you can call uh, the next part. No, no, meanwhile, no. I will connect with you. Okay, her. so meanwhile, I'm uh, inviting uh, Sudipta Chakravarti. Baba Atomic Research Center, Homi Baba National Institute, Department of Atomic Energy, Government of India. Uh, his talk is uh, on nanoscale brachy therapy uh, for cancer treatment using radioactive functionalized nanoparticles in emerging field. So, uh, Sudipta Chakravarti. Sudipta Chakravarti is there. Yes. Uh, so you can, you can share your presentation. Go ahead, sir. Uh, actually, uh, if uh, whether the organizers will display it because I had sent it earlier, or I I will share from here. So organizers and coordinators, please answer. Uh, uh, okay, sir, we will share it from here. Uh, sir, please wait. There is some technical issues over here. Uh, Let yeah, okay. me ask you. Please give two minutes. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. So full screen. Yes, sir. Slide mode.
okay so it is visible go ahead sir professor dr sudipta chakravarti sir yes sir you can proceed sorry for the delay uh, you can can you present now so is it it is okay am i am i audible now audible and visible also okay other uh, you see you check the slides are moving or not yeah they have checked it is moving moving okay and you, there you mean but uh, yes okay so you can proceed sir yeah so good morning to all of you uh, and thank chairperson for his introduction the topic of my presentation is nanoscale brachytherapy for cancer treatment using radioactive functionalized nanoparticles and emerging field so initially i will introduce the concept of using nanoscale brachytherapy with a background to cancer therapy then go to the actual work that is being carried out in this particular field can you change the slide yeah so yeah i will start by introducing how ionizing radiations are used in cancer therapy radiation therapy is a well established technique for treating localized and non metastatic cancer along with the conventional routes of surgery and chemotherapy when we talk about use of ionizing radiation mainly particulate emitting radiations like alpha particles beta particles and ojer electrons are used and when these particles deposit their energy into the dna of the cells they permanently destroy the dna and thereby cause the cancer <clears throat> killing of the cancer cells now ionizing radiation therapy is based on two basic principles one is external beam ion uh, radiation therapy in which the radiation source is outside from the patient's body and the beam of radiation interacts with the proliferating cancer cells which are externally accessible or superficial and thereby causes the therapeutic effect i'm sorry that the second procedure it is this external beam radiation therapy is repeated uh, in the uh, cartoon that is actually what we called brachy therapy as its name suggests it is based on some kind of use of needles brachy means needles where very tiny needles of radioactive sources are implanted either into the tumor mass or at a very close proximity to the tumor mass so that the radiation energy can be deposited into the tumor and thereby cause causing uh, tumor ablation please to the next slide slide yeah so what we have just mentioned about the conventional brachy therapy this is a minimally invasive technique in which sealed radiation sources in the form of tiny rods or wires are placed either inside or close proximity to the tumor volume and thereby it allows delivery of high doses of radiation precisely to the tumor volume while minimizing radiation exposure to the healthy tissues and organs sir outside it due to the precise and targeted dose delivery characteristics it can be employed effectively to treat solid tumors with short treatment duration and minimum side effects and at a relatively lower cost and this particular technique has been extensively used in prostate cancer breast cancer cervical cancer and head and neck cancer in various types of applications next slide please however having said that this is a very effective technique it has some limitations one most important is operational difficulty associated with the implantation of radioactive source have restricted its successful application this 
procedure sometimes quite cumbersome and it it affects the patients it causes severe pain on trauma or other complications and there is always a risk of inaccurate or off target placement of the source which may result in undesired radiation exposure to the surrounding healthy tissues so because of this this conventional brachytherapy often results in non uniform dose distribution in the tumor mass and may consequently result mild to severe clinical side effects so use of if we convert these radioactive tiny sources of radiation into radio level nanoparticle formulations thereby the concept of nano scale brachytherapy or nano brachytherapy is coming into the forefront this is an emerging field in which presently extensive research is going on and which has the potential to circumvent the limitations as i have mentioned in the conventional brachytherapy technique next please yes this uh, the technique and the dif difference between the conventional brachytherapy is uh, just uh, shown by this cartoon it involves localized or intratumoral injection of radio labeled nanoparticles into the tumor as an alternative to implantation of tiny seeds or uh, wares or needles of radioactive sources in the left hand corner this this cartoon shows the difference and the right hand side we are for a proof of concept one particular example is shown say one gold nanoparticle is radio labeled somehow with a radio uh, useful radioactive isotope and with that that need, uh, nanoparticle is also functionalized with a cancer targeting moiety by attaching somehow with its uh, surface thereby the entire formulation now can be in <coughs> injected into the tumor mass an example of a locally advanced breast cancer is shown here and due to its homogeneous distribution and excellent retention properties into the tumor volume the beta or alpha or other uh, radioactive particulates that emit from that radio isotope will actually be used to abolate the cancer cell and eventually it has the potential to cure the externally approachable uh, can different types of cancers one of them is of course the breast breast cancer next please yeah so when we talk about this nano scale brachytherapy approach what essential characteristics of the formulation we look into it first the administered formulation should deliver the required dose of ionizing radiation to abolate the proliferating cancer cell while sparing the surrounding normal cells this is one which comes from the property of the radio isotopes used and it has nothing to do with the overall formulation only the radio isotope what we have chosen has to be chosen appropriately such that this particular uh, function is carried out depending on the different types of tumor and tumor mass secondly most important is that the administered formulation should homogeneously distribute into the tumor mass and retain in the tumor volume for a prolonged period this is a property of nano formulation which must exhibit very strong affinity towards the malignant cells so that it doesn't come out also another important requirement is to be filled, fulfilled is that robust and nearly irreversible binding of the radio isotope with the nanoparticles such that the uh, radioactivity does not leak out from the tumor mass and the overall formulation should also be a biocompatible formulation so that it doesn't have any severe side effect or immune response when administered into the patient next please yeah so to de develop an ideal nano formulation in order to fulfill all these re requirements a multidisciplinary and coordinated effort from 
the entire chemist's fraternity is essential. It has the role of organic chemists or biochemists for synthesizing cancer targeting molecules. Definitely inorganic chemistry or material chemistry has most important role to play in synthesizing and characterizing the material involved. Since it is radio labeled formulation, then the role of radio chemists comes into the picture and obviously very important. And there are several analytical techniques are to be utilized for doing the required quality control of this procedure. Next, please. Yeah, when we talk about targeting cancer using these kinds of nano platforms by directly importing into the cancer volume, then the basic principle by which it may be quite familiar, uh, this scientific community doing research in nanoparticle formulations are quite familiar. The nanoparticles of suitable size tend to accumulate in the tumor tissue, mainly in the interstitial space of the proliferating tissue, much more than they do in the normal tissue and retain for a long duration due to enhanced permeability and retention effect primarily. Over and above, if the tumor targeting and retention can be enhanced significantly if the nano platform is functionalized with some tumor targeting biomolecules such that over and above the EPR effect, there is some direct targeting of the cells based on the receptor affinity of these biomolecules. So this is basically the concept by which the formulations for nanoscale brachytherapy are based on. Next, please. Now we come to how these radiochemical formulations are actually carried out. As I have, it may be quite clear now. So these formulations have basically two units or two major components. One is the nano platform, which is being used to carry to the tumor cells and the radioisotopes. Now, nano platforms can be any of the conventional things that are being extensively used nowadays for biomedical applications. They may be based on organic nanoparticles like dendrimers, polymer, liposomes, means biopolymers, hydrogels, and a host of inorganic nanoparticles like silica, gold nanoparticle based things, iron oxide nanoshells, quantum dots, carbon nanotubes, graphenes, etc. Next, please. And radioisotopes, we have mentioned there are three different types of particulate emitting radioisotopes which can be used. One is of obviously the most common one which emits by beta minus emission, although their range in the tissue is quite larger and their energy transfer per unit length is relatively less. So they are less effective for imparting the cell killing properties but because of their wide availability these are the most common things compared to that alpha particle em em emitters the radioisotopes emitting alpha particles deposit their energy in a much smaller space and with high degree of energy transfer so they are therapeutically much more effective but they have to be precisely localized and third is Oger electron emitter here the, inner, the range in which energy is deposited is even um, uh, lesser so that it can deposit its energy only within the nucleus of a cell. So it has, it requires the formulation to be very precisely targeted to the nucleus of the cell. So based on the different types of applications, we use these three types of radioisotopes. Next please. So this is a list of a host of uh, particulate emitting radioisotopes which people have used for brachytherapy and in nowadays nanoscale brachytherapy. You, you may be uh, seeing that they basically decay by emission of particulates, maybe uh, beta minus, sometimes Oger electron, and there are emerging trend of using alpha particle emitting uh, radioisotopes. And majority of them, if can, you can note that they have a concomitant gamma emissions. These gamma photon emissions actually help to detect the localization 
of the particles which are placed inside the patient, which are administered into the patient by doing different types of uh, imaging techniques, particularly what we call single photon emission computed tomography technique after administration of the formulation. Next, please. Now, how we actually irreversibly attach the radioisotope with the formulation? There are four basic techniques. First of all, mentioned in by A is using a bifunctional chelator. Some specially designed organic molecules do this particular function. One part of it is attached with the surface of the nano platform, and the other part actually used to chelate or complex the radio metal so that we get a very robust binding of the radio metal with the nano platform. Second, the nano platform is directly irradiated either in cyclotron or in reactor so that some in situ nuclear reaction takes place during the irradiation and one of the constituent elements of the nano platform becomes radioactive so that we get radioactive nano formulation concept Actually, this technique is very attractive, but seldom this is seldom it is used because of many other technical issues. And in C, this is the most interesting technique where in our institute we are pioneering it, where the radioactive nanoparticles is synthesized by mixing a part of cold elemental formulation and its corresponding radioactive formulation which are made either in reactor or cyclotron so that we get nanoparticles radio labeled in situ. This we call our intrinsic radio labeling and it has a special advantage that when once the radioactivity is incorporated into the matrix itself, there is there is a very little chance of this radioactivity to leach out. And finally, there is another, another technique where radioactivity is somehow adsorbed or some kind of electroplated onto the surface of the nano formulation without use of any bifunctional chelator. This technique is also quite extensively used. Now come to the next slide, please. Yeah, I will just show some of the very recent developments or uh, which are showing from. Promising outcomes. One particular work has been reported where lutetium 177 radio isotope is incorporated into a gold nanopart nanoparticular formulation by using bifunctional chelate chelator approach. And in that nano formulation itself, one cancer targeting antibody, what is called, they have used pantizumab, is actually also incorporated. And this particular nano formulation is used in animal models. And it shows that it can, could be retained for a prolonged duration of time. And the, they have compared using nano platform with the cancer targeting agent and without also and compared in between that and it has been found that there is a slight improvement when we use cancer targeting antibody also on the surface of the formulation and this these images actually show that once injected they remain in the particular region of interest that is the tumor mass and do not leak out and get spread to the other organs of the tumor which is essential characteristics of this formulation. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Another interesting work on theranostic palladium-103 nanoseeds, where the authors first synthesized hollow gold nanoparticles and somehow deposited 103 palladium radioisotope by uh, some electrochemical uh, approach, some kind of electroplating. And they are very nicely characterized with HRTEM, showing that on the gold nanoparticle, the palladium uh, is actually deposited. And I just uh, took out this uh, 
serial scintigraphic images they have required uh, uh, they have uh, recorded after administrating this nano formulation in the tumor mass nearing the shoulder of these animals and it has been found that even after five weeks they have carried out the imaging there is absolutely no leakage of any radioactivity from the particular uh, region where it is incorporated from into the other organs of the tumor so these shows were very excellent potential to be used for nano nano brachytherapy technique next slide please yes now another group of uh, scientists they have developed kind of an organic framework covalent organic framework incorporating silver metal into that framework and modifying their surface with peg so that this peg modification enhances its dispersibility in aqueous medium and some circulation stability now because of incorporation of silver they could easily absorb 125 iodine onto the surface of this uh, nano formulation that is what i had mentioned earlier as the chelator free approach and then they have carried out animal studies by injecting localized injection into the tumor and very interesting to note that the authors have showed how only radioisotope without any nanoparticle formulation make and with the nanoparticle formulation makes the difference in the first series it is seen that even after prolonged uh, time prolonged duration when we use the nano formulation it remains in the tumor but when they only incorporate free iodine 125 within 10 12 hours of duration it completely leaks out from the tumor and mainly accumulate in the thyroid gland as the basic property of i minus and little bit it clears through the renal root at shown in the second uh, bracket where there is some uptake in the bladder is also shown and mainly incorporation is in the thyroid and with this uh, now i will come to some of the one or two specific specific work what we are carrying out at our institute next slide please with the example yeah next slide yes one of our interesting work was rgd functionalized gold 199 nanoparticles where we first produce gold 199 by irradiating platinum metal in the reactor and radiochemically separating gold from platinum now this chlorooric acid with 199 gold that we have made is converted into a nan functionalized nano formulation in a unique way by reacting it in presence of a cyclic rgd peptide R cyclo rgd fk in alkaline medium now this rgd peptide itself must be working as a reducing agent to convert AU plus 3 into gold nanoparticles of around 15 to 20 nanometer uh, uh, size uh, diameter that TEM studies have shown here. Now when we inject this formulation intra-tumorally into the tumor mass, it is by carrying biodistribution studies, we had shown that the, tum the activity primarily retains, we have carried out studies up to eight days only in the tumor. There is no other uptake in any other organ. And here we have carried out tumor regression study also. Please go to the next slide. Yes. Here it is shown that from the figure in the left hand side, the tumor growth can be very nicely arrested. And in fact, there is a tumor shrinkage effect is also seen when the administered dose is more than or equal to 5 mega becquerel in the figure right hand side it is shown that the body weight remains almost the constant so there is no significant side effect by this particular type of therapeutic effect so this therapy is quite effectively working in animal model and shows a very good potential for future clinical translation Next, please. So I will just uh, describe another interesting work. We have synthesized lutetium oxide with radioactive 177 lutetium with 
human serum albumin uh, hybrid nanoparticles where we produce lutetium once sorry please go back to the uh, yeah we produce lutetium 177 in the reactor and that is converted into a nano composite of appropriate size by reacting with human serum albumin which is a very biocompatible material and this particular nano platform is then injected into tumor and we carry out uh, tumor regression studies here too i will come in a little more detail just next slide please so here it shows the basic biomineralization approach for this synthesis so first lutetium complex of hsa is made and then an alkaline ph it is converted into a nanopart nanoparticular formulation where lutetium oxide is actually entrapped somehow into a nanoparticle cage of hsa we have characterized it and proved that a nanoparticle is formed by different uh, physicochemical techniques like Raman spectra by carrying out TEM, the broad peaks in H XRD shows the significant uh, characteristics of nano formulation. Now to the next slide, please. And first we had shown its therapeutic efficacy in vitro by flow cytometry. It is seen that when we treat the cells with uh, this HSA nano formulation, the percentage of cells destroyed are much more when uh, in case of controlled one or when we use cold nanoparticles without any radioactivity. Now the same is then we do it, did it in in vivo model. Go to the next, next slide. Please. Yes. Here we carried out the tumor uh, therapeutic efficacy study in tumor where there is a significant retention has been uh, a significant reduction of tumor volume is noted beyond a certain uh, dose delivery. And similarly, we have carried out the body weight index study shows that in that particular dose, there is no significant side effects. The tumor, the uh, animals remains healthy. And here this picture shows the actual tumor shrinkage effect with the controlled animal and with the treated animal where it is seen that because of our therapeutic effect of the formulation we had made, uh, the tumor is actually got treated or shrinked or almost uh, vanished in that. So this formulation also has a very high potential for uh, na nanoscale brachytherapy in the future. So with that, we I come to the conclusion of my presentation. <coughs> and I thank the organizers for providing me this platform to present my work to the community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your uh, interesting presentation, sir. Now the floor is open for uh, question answers. Uh, good morning, sir. Oh, okay. Dr. Sonal Thakur. Yeah, yeah. So as I was, uh, I, I was unable to present uh, early earlier. I'll do. I'll be doing now. So, uh, Dr. Sudipta, I am uh, really impressed with the kind of uh, application this type of uh, work has, and I am particularly working on this uh, cancer targeting material synthesis and all. I'm a chemist basically, so I would be very much interested in you know, making certain materials which would be useful for such applications. I will be presenting now. Uh, kindly see so that you can, yeah. you know, we can think of working to, uh, like. Together. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, means we have the expertise for using radio level platforms. So if your your potential cancer targeting things, we can use for as a radio level uh, platform yeah, yeah. for future use. I will look forward to your work. Yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir. We will modify them accordingly. Yes, for now, yeah. yeah, for now we have not done radio labeling uh, type of ah, application. That, yeah, yeah. But we can think of uh, because the yes, material yeah. is similar to what you have been presenting. Yeah, thank sure, you. sure. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, Excellent, sir. Sudip, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, the, any targeting molecule we are they are, they are essential for this? Sir? So we yeah, have, it is, it is, we have is, uh, magnetic targeting material. It is advantageous if the nanoparticle form, uh, surface is um, functionalized with cancer targeting, receptor targeting agents like sometimes peptides, 
sometimes other small receptor targeting molecules or antibodies it it enhances the effect of uh, cancer targeting by prolonging the retention the probability of leakage from the cancer site this tumor site will be even reduced if we use target specific molecules and compared to if we do not uh, another uh, question sir uh, lutetium is lutetium is not toxic do you think no actually these radio metals are even that applied to palladium and other things these are toxic after a certain level of concentration in the radio labeling studies the amount of this um, metallic elements used are in a very low concentration maybe in nanogram femtogram level to formulate with a certain dose of radiation so in this particular area when we these are called radio pharmaceuticals where the toxicity of the radio metals does not matter because they are in very low extremely low concentration okay, okay. so one more sir uh mm, yes uh, the that uh, what even called the cancer uh, tumor should be only if it is outside then only you can cure if it no, is this is this, yeah. uh, this is one particular Practical. area uh, where these formulations are being tried in the cancers where it is externally accessible obviously this radio label formulations are used for targeting cancers which are deep rooted or metastasized means well spread over then there the role of these cancer targeting molecules are even more important there are several formulations which are injected intravenously means into the blood stream and they will specifically target to wherever the cancer growth is there no, so no, that no, is especially it uh, should be specifically targeted if not yeah, uh, it's somewhat yes. uh, difficult somewhat difficult yes. okay. okay thank you thank you sir thank you for your presentation sir very yes. good uh, talk so next one next sir uh, is uh, dr swati jagdala jagdale is available swati jagdale dr swati jagdale no Sir, uh, sir, sir, I am there. I was to oh, be so presenting. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, okay. You are, you are, you are now presenting. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Sonal, I talk for Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, the MS University of Baroda, India, Self Therapeutic Nano Materials for Cancer Therapy. So, you can proceed. You can present your uh, uh, PPT and go ahead, sir, madam. Thank you, sir. Is the presentation the presentation visible? Oh, so so it's a full screen mode. That is, uh, you have to. Uh, slide slide share slide share mode. Uh, now? No, it's not. Uh, not yet. Mode. Not yet. Okay, give me one minute. Now. Not now, not not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Uh, okay. So again, you I go back. Okay. Some corner seminar corners. May I can yeah, yeah. Go. I am doing that. I can see full screen. I don't know why there it is not seen. Ma'am. Uh, uh, yeah. I interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you are uh, presenting the uh, screen, uh, mm -hmm. so click on the present entire screen. Then only entire you screen. Can see. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Entire screen. Okay, okay, okay. I'll do that. Thank you. You can go back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, Professor Sabu Thomas. Good no, morning. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Your, your presentation is not visible. Yes. Welcome. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Entire screen. Namaste. Namaste, sir. Professor Sabu Thomas. Most welcome.
now it's visible no no the full screen presentation afterwards you click uh, at the uh, window and go to the share then the presentation yeah main dikh raha hai nahi ah par main to wahi kar rahi hu i'm doing that one to go to the back yeah i'm doing that interesting then go to presentation wala tab yeah and i am presenting the full screen da from the down right yeah but the clear nothing is visible i don't know why it's happening like this उटरी Personal yeah. desk. Uh, please yeah. uh, make it uh, in slideshow mode. I did it. I don't know why it's not work. Seeing the full screen, I am. I can see the full screen. Uh, can you please? Maybe this is slides? okay. Yeah, at least it is visible, isn't it? This no, is okay. No. Let us let us see. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, but uh, please, can you please change the slides for confirmation? I if it is moving, then we can proceed. Yeah. I. I okay. Okay. Yeah. This a new slide? No. We no? cannot see. The, we are in oh, first slide no. itself. I don't know then what. That's why. Uh, please uh, share while sharing. Uh, please click on share entire screen. You present entire screen a uh, menu. Uh, then only we can see the uh, next slides. Still no. Should I sh share the presentation to you? Should I mail to you? Ah, uh, if you cannot, then please mail to us. I'm doing it, but I don't know nothing else is happening beyond this. I'll mail it immediately. Yeah, please. Mail. Sonal. Yeah. Uh, no, no, nothing. Yeah, I'm mailing. Is Swati Jagle is there? Doctor Swati Jagle is there? And next, uh, Subhangi yes, Gaikwad. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm present. Yes, okay, okay, okay. Well, you, okay. You, you, afterwards, afterwards, after uh, Sonal Tagore. इंटरनेट कनेक्शन इज एन इश्यू ओके आई जस्ट केम टू आई थिंक दैट वॉज द प्रॉब्लम आई गेट आई गॉट इट ओके आई बी एबल टू डू इट नाउ ओके I was able to attend. I don't know.
Is it visible now? Is it visible? Uh, yes, sir. Visible, but not. Is it visible? Uh, not in uh, slide share mode. It's not screens. Uh, the slides are moving. Uh, slides are not moving. Not so moving. Not, not, not moving. I don't know what's the problem. Ma'am, it's okay. it's moving. The next presenter can present. I will do it in. I'll try to sort the problem. Ma'am, uh, it's just moved. Moved to the moved? second. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, please, uh, okay. please put it in slideshow mode. Yeah. Slide okay. Slide. Okay. Is it moving now? Okay. No, ma'am. Oh, I don't know. I'll sort out next. Please call, call the next presenter. I'll try to sort. Sorry, I'm really sorry. Okay, ma'am. Uh, you 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 are uh, already mailed to us this PPT. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mailed. Oh, okay. Then uh, we will uh, we okay. will share it. After, Dr. Swati, uh, Dr. Swati is Jagdala is there? No. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Subhangi Gaikwad. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. So, coordinator, can I can I permit the Subhangi uh, Gaikwad, sir? Gaikwad, madam, to present? Okay. Okay, sir, you can call and uh, then after that we can keep talking some more later. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, so, it's fine. Dr. Subhangi S. Gaikwad, Department yes, of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, Sevagad Institute of Pharmacy, Pune. Uh, his innovative talk is Evaluation of a Green Synthesized Tungsten Oxide Nanoparticles from Brassica Olericea Extract for uh, in vitro antibacterial and anti cancer activity. Yes, so you sir. Yes, proceed, madam. You can proceed yes, and sir. share your presentation. Sir, presentation is visible. But uh, not in full screen mode or uh, that's uh, uh, slide share mode. So, the same thing, same problem again. To avoid the pretty mirror, don't. Sir, now is it visible? Ah, uh, it's visible. Now it's visible. Okay, it's visible. So go ahead. Okay. Shall I start, sir? Ah, uh, start. Start, madam. Yes. Very good morning, all of you. Today, my topic of discussion is evaluation of green synthesized tungsten oxide nanoparticles from Brassica olarisa, that is broccoli extract, for in vitro okay. antibacterial and anti-cancer activity. So these are the contents which we'll discuss one by one. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yes, sir. Your slides are not moving. Not moving. Okay, sir. Yeah. Please, uh, please make that. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It uh, it's moving, moving, moving. That's okay. Yeah. Sir. Yes, visible. sir. Visible. Well. Yeah. Visible. Can you please uh, put it in slideshow mode? Yes, sir. I put it on slideshow mode. No, it's not in slideshow, I think. Okay, sir. So it's not appearing. Uh, slide share is not appearing, I can So it's, it is, I think it is in slideshow. In the uh, right, right. Yes, sir. Side, there's, there's an option to. Ah, yeah, yeah. So now is it no, visible? Sorry. Visible. Uh, it's okay, visible, sir. but we think it's, it is not moving. Uh, please, please change the slide. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Then you can continue. It's moving. Ah, uh, moving. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. It's not, not over. Okay, sir. Continue. Previous, uh, uh, you go to the previous uh, slide and uh, continue. Okay. Yes, sir. Previous slide. Yes, sir. Now is it visible? Not visible. Not moving, sir. Only introduction that is showing. Mm. 
So now is it visible? Visible or not, but I think it is moving, whether it is moving or not. In, yes, sir. Uh, on your side, on your side. But it is not moving here. Not moving. Uh, not moving means slide sharing, slide uh, moving is not there. Okay, sir. Uh, sir. Again, uh, uh, now, uh, okay, right, right. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. The content. Yes, sir. Now uh, the next slide is introduction. Yes. Uh, you tell the content also. Go to the content and uh, okay. tell explain, explain. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, sir. So uh, these are the contents which we'll discuss one by one. So as we know, the nanoparticles are the key areas of the research and idea of nanoparticles was recognized by scientist Richard Feynman in 1959. So the major advantage of nanoparticles is size and that impact the therapeutic effect. So the currently metal oxide nanoparticle that comes under the area of bio inorganic chemistry. So the current research emphasizes the synthesis of tungsten nanoparticles from broccoli leaves. So the main thing is that why we chosen the broccoli leaves as the broccoli is a health promoting food because it naturally has a high content of biotic bioactive phytochemicals such as the glucosinolates, vitamin C, phenolic compounds and so many mineral nutrients. So thus, uh, uh, diet rich broccoli plays a role in the prevention of chronic diseases such as uh, cardiovascular diseases carcinogenic pathologies and uh, mostly the breast cancer and the prostate cancer so that the broccoli has been found to exhibit the antioxidant stress related to the many diseases so the purpose of this study is to evaluate the green synthesized nanoparticles for anti-cancer and antibacterial activity so the so we know that the synthesis of nanoparticles there are various method for the synthesis of nanoparticles that is uh, some of the enlisted over here that is chemical synthesis physical synthesis and the biological synthesis methods. We know that uh, uh, the biological synthesis has the several advantages over the chemical synthesis methods and the physical synthesis method. Here for the synthesis purpose, I preferred the biological synthesis and uh, green synthesis, uh, uh, green synthesis method for the synthesizing the metal oxide nanoparticles. So, uh, why uh, the biological synthesis? Yes, uh, there are uh, remarkable advantages in the pharmaceutical industry to cure the various disorders. And the physical and chemical method utilizes the uh, toxic chemicals as well as these are the costly method. So the green synthesis of nanoparticles is a new way to synthesis of the nanoparticles. So in this method, the mostly the plant extract is treated with the metal oxide and act as a reducing agent so that it creates the nanoparticles. So these are the safe, economic as well as shows the synergistic effect. So uh, as we know that there are the several disadvantages of the uh, recent cancer therapy, those are uh, available, uh, that is the uh, surgery. Uh, then we know that the stems, uh, stem cell transport, uh, transport. Uh, then there will be the radiation therapy, targeted therapy, surgery, as well as the laser therapy are available. But they are, can be used as separately or in combination. But many of these treatments has the capacity to have a variety of effects on the directly of the patient's quality of life. So as this the treatments have a number of side effects after the treatment there is a need to introduce the new therapy uh, that is the site specific and has the fewer side effects so along with this uh, the antibiotic like the major uh, micro, micro, microbial resistance uh, that get uh, uh, reaching towards the critical level so that there is a need to develop the alternative to the conventional uh, antibiotics also. So the uh, basic behind that uh, to overcome the disadvantage of this therapy is we have to introduce the new therapy that is uh, cost effective as well as uh, there is a less side effects. So uh, 
as uh, we know that the uh, we move uh, uh, for, forward that is the yes we prepare the broccoli extract that contain the phytochemically uh, sul uh, sulforaphane uh, which is a potentially cytotoxic chemical which is a cytotoxic chemical to the tumor so cells so that's why the green synthesis with broccoli extract for the synthesis of nanoparticle it is the having the major potential to treat the cancer cell now uh, uh moving towards the uh, practical point of view uh, these are the chemicals and uh, instruments that are used for the study purpose uh, the major uh, chemical is a tungsten trioxide which is used as a raw material for the synthesis of the tungsten oxide nanoparticles then uh, dried broccoli sprout powder is used as a uh, 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 generally the raw material for the uh, preparation and the distilled water and ethanol these are the chemicals which are required uh, which are uh, which uh, was used for the synthesis of these nanoparticles and along with this uh, these instruments uh, was used uh, these instruments used for the study purpose that is the characterization as well uh, characterization and evaluation of the nanoparticles now the uh, uh, that is the preparation of uh, broccoli extract uh, we know that uh, the brassica olivera is the uh, biological name of the broccoli extract and we all know about that is the broccoli is the name the family belongs to the brassica c that contain the sulforaphane as an anti cancer agent which is uh, uh, the most important part that is the uh, 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 the selection of this uh, plant extract for the synthesis of the tungsten nanoparticles as the tungsten nanoparticles we considered it is having the low cytotoxicity as well as the genotoxicity as compared to the other metal ions as well as the uh, phytothermal ther uh, photothermal therapy it is a more effective one so the tungsten oxide is mostly select as a metal element for the further study so that this is the five gram broccoli powder we take in the 50 ml distilled water reflex for one hour at 70 degrees centigrade filtered out cool and filter it out and uh, stored it for the at the four degrees centigrade for the stability purpose for the further use purpose so these are the step by step procedure of the preparation of the broccoli extract and after that the synthesis of the tungsten broccoli nanoparticles uh, uh, we prepared this uh, extract uh, that, uh, by using this extract we uh, use the uh, 4.6 62 gram of uh, uh, tungsten oxide nanoparticles which is dissolved in 100, distil 100 ml distilled water uh, and the 90 ml of 0.2 molar solution stirred uh, it at uh, 1000 rpm for 6 hours at 80 degree centigrade temperature and after that the 10 ml broccoli extract drop wise with stirring added then we saw the color change in that and so that uh, we observe that there, yes there is a chemical change we observe and with the help of the probe sonicator that is for one hour at 250 millivolt uh, we use for the uh, conversion into, into the nanoparticles so the cool wash and filtered it out and dried for 70 degree centigrade for one hour uh, in oven and after that the calcination is provided for four at 400 degree centigrade for 40 minutes so we will get the uh, we uh, got this 77.48 uh, percent uh, practical yield of this uh, green synthesized tungsten broccoli nanoparticles uh, so this is the schematic presentation that uh, uh, we uh, prepared the uh, total nano uh, nanoparticles from the broccoli extract step by step. You can observe you observed here that is yes uh, we mix it properly then uh, add the extract then we see the color change then we use the probe sonicator after filtration we will get the powder and uh, the after calcination you can observe the color change over here that is for the nanoparticles okay so uh, now moving towards the result and discussion that is uh, synthesized particles we evaluated uh, uh, we characterize it for the uh, uv spectroscopy then uh, again we uh, perform the scan uh, same same inductive coupled uh, plasma optical emission spectroscopy uh, then xrd we also done on the same nanoparticle so we will got the uh, result that is yes we uh, the uv spectroscopy you can be observe here that is the uh, the whatever the uh, spectra observed here is the 
the tungsten trioxide nanoparticles and you can be observed here the tungsten peak that is the tungsten nanoparticles peak so that uh, you can be observed here uh, the uh, the same spectra we will get at the range of the 300 to 400 nanometer uh, nanometer with the reference nanoparticles then next will be the uh, in ftir spectra in ftir spectra we observe here the, that is the, the the stretching of the tungsten bond is observed at the, uh, the observed range is a 673.92 and reported range so as per reported range we will get the exact peaks at the ftir spectra then uh, the particle size particle size uh, we know that that is it is a important and we will get the particle size within the range of 95 to 32 nanometer with the pdi that is below 0.9 so that we got that uh, that is whatever the particles we will get within this range these are the uniform uh, in size and uh, we observe the zeta potential also in that we will get the uh, uh, point 18.87 uh, milli hold that is the minus 30 below minus 30 that means the particles are more stable yes then uh, we observe the xrd spectra the xrd spectra yes the we check the crystallinity and crystal size with the stabilization and phase identification over here so that the uh, uh, we get uh, the uh, different values that is the major peaks of the two theta value we, uh, we got at the 23 23.56 and you can observe here the sharp peaks that means the uh, the particles are the crystalline in nature then uh, uh, also perform the uh, ICP OES spectroscopy so that uh, we got the concentration of uh, the tungsten nanoparticles that we got synthesized and uh, here you observe that that is the tungsten was present around 1.22 percent uh, or the 12,200 uh, parts per million that is present in the synthesized nanoparticles so uh, the next that is also performed the uh, same study uh, just uh, for the confirmation of the particle size and observe your here yes the different size particles are present over there that is from 5 micrometer to 400 nanometer also uh, uh, but a majority of the particles that is the uh, we consider that is uh, the same uh, rubic shape uh, particles are observed over uh, there uh, so uh, this uh, we observed uh, at the same study then in a transmission electron microscopy yes uh, exact procedure is displayed over here but uh, just uh, uh, observe that that is the the particle size, uh, size is observed that is 100 nanometer in the micrograph and the different cubic shape was observed were observed with the aggregates also so these are the 10 images then So uh, after the uh, complete characterization of these nanoparticles and we got that there's yes, the tungsten uh, oxide nanoparticles uh, uh, was uh, present in the uh, 1.22 percentage in that particular sample that we export the sample to the in vitro evaluation for both the activities that is antibacterial activity as well as the anti-cancer activity. As the antibacterial activity is possible uh, at the college level so that uh, we preferred first that is try to uh, do the antibacterial activity and uh, then uh, uh, anti-cancer activity so we expose the antibacterial activity by the club pet, club pet method and the uh, uh, both the uh, gram positive as well as the gram negative bacteria uh, is uh, was used for the study purpose uh, so that uh, this uh, for the antibacter antibacterial activity and for anti-cancer activity uh the as the both the uh as gender wise considered that is the breast cancer is the major uh major in the females and the lung cancer is the major uh, majority uh in males so both the cell lines that is the uh, mcf cell lines for the breast cancer and the a549 for the lung cancer cell line uh the mtt assay is performed for the uh, uh anti-cancer activity uh, so that uh, we got the uh, uh, preliminary that is yes the compound is uh, show uh, compound was shown the anti-cancer activity for the breast cancer as well as the lung cancer cell line 
yeah i know that the, the further study is needed to prove that that anti cancer activity of the tungsten oxide nano particle so these are the results of the this was a result of the antibacterial activity so the in this uh, the zone of inhibition of this microbial stain at uh, 50 microgram per ml uh, was shown in the results and the gram positive bacteria uh, which is uh, demonstrated the zone of inhibition with the uh, diameter of 10 to uh, 8 uh, uh, millimeter for the staph aureus and the bacillus subtilis and the zone of inhibition for the standards for 14 and 20 millimeter for staph aureus and bacillus subtilis uh, so uh, that the compared uh, to a standard the zone of uh, inhibition of the diameter that is 10 millimeter of the gram negative bacteria these findings uh, implies that the synthesized nanoparticles suppress the gram positive bacteria more effectively than the gram negative bacteria so the proposed mechanism of this antibacterial activity of this uh, tungsten oxide broccoli nanoparticles with the bacteria is based on uh, the hypothesis uh, that the reactive oxygen species formation and so the electrostatic interaction between this microbial surface and synthesized nanoparticles triggered the cell death and uh, was the activity high uh, during the strong uh, contract. So the, it causes the generation of more active oxygen species which cause uh, destroy the cell membranes. Uh, uh, the cell membranes are being uh, destroyed so that the nanoparticles are absorbed on the microorganism and once they have created and the limiting the development of this reactive oxygen process uh, that causes the oxidative states and ultimately lead to the cell death. So the zone of inhibition of the standard and sample are compared and uh, uh, presented over here. Now the uh, MTT uh, assay that is uh, uh, this is the comparative statement of the antibacterial stains for the Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus subtilis, and the E. coli nanoparticles. Now the no, next that is the anti-cancer activity. The result of the MTT assay uh, in this the uh, MTT assay. Uh, the method that is uh, obviously the water uh, soluble MTD dye is converted to the insoluble blue formazine and uh, the cell viability of this MCF7 line cell lines was significantly reduced by the synthesized nanoparticles in dose dependent manner so that the high MCF7 cell lines were alive for 10 to 30 microgram per ml concentrations when compared to the A540 cell lines so that the uh, in, indicating more cited toxicity to the a549 that is a lung cancer cell lines uh, at the uh, concentration of the 40 microgram per ml so approximately similar similar toxicity was observed for the both the cell lines and the suggested uh, suggested that the cytotoxicity is directly proportional to the concentration of the synthesized nanoparticle also uh, the inhibitory concentration that is IC50 value was found with for MCF7 cell line it will uh, it, it was the 39.95 microgram per ml and for uh, A549 uh, it will uh, it was the 45.6 microgram respectively so the result shows that the synthesized nanoparticles are capable of eliciting the cytotoxicity which is followed by the reduction in proliferation in the cancer cells and that have been treated against the cancer cells um, uh, uh, actually in synthesized nanoparticle treated cells there was a cell shrinkage abnormal form uh, the, uh, and clumping of the cell uh, suggesting the cell death that I was seen in the dose dependent monitor so the results reveals that the previous study on the uh, effect of the tungsten uh, nanoparticles and broccoli on the cancer cells which subject to the standard drugs that is doxorubicin and the uh, etoposides um, doxorubicin for MCF7 and um, uh, etoposide that is for the lung cancer cell line that is used as a standard for the same and the MTT experiments reveal the synthesized nanoparticle which shows the inhibited growth significantly. So these are the uh, results uh, for the MCF7 cell line cytotoxicity and uh, conclusion as that uh, the green synthesis approach uh, it is a it could be the cost effective and alternative to the traditional physical and chemical nanoparticle synthesis method with the potential uh, in a biomedical applications uh, does the study exhibit the rapid 
इको फ्रेंडली ग्रीन मेथड फॉर द सिंथेसिस ऑफ ब्रासिका अलरेसिया अलरेसिया एसिस्टेड टंगस्टन ऑक्साइड नैनो पार्टिकल्स एंड दिस प्लांट एक्सट्रैक्ट हैव लार्ज अमाउंट ऑफ फाइटोकेमिकल्स व्हिच रिड्यूस द टंगस्टन ऑक्साइड टंगस्टन ट्राइऑक्साइड नैनो पार्टिकल्स टू द टंगस्टन ऑक्साइड नैनो पार्टिकल्स सो दैट प्रेफर दिस ब्रोकोली एक्सट्रैक्ट फॉर द सिंथेसिस पर्पस एंड Now uh, this method is eco-friendly as well as the non-hazardous grease synthesis method, which is helpful in pharmaceutical application. So, uh, uh, further investigation is also necessary to study the detailed mechanism of this uh, nanoparticles for the pathogenic as well as the cancer cell. Uh, these are the key references. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, all uh, ICN committee members for giving me opportunity to present myself in this conference. thank you um, thank you for your interesting presentation now the uh, presentation is open for audience for question and answers any questions uh, from my side uh, one question madam yes sir uh, do you think uh, tungsten is non toxic yeah yes sir. as according to literature say way many other uh, as tungsten oxide having the photothermal activity and when we use in a less amount that is in a nanoparticle size it is a less cytotoxic and less genotoxic material when you inject uh, intravenously mm -hmm. or uh, orally the yes. tungsten goes into the cells and uh, accumulate so they may cause uh, some again cancer or other side effects sir actually uh, we prefer this material as a uh, site specific targeted material and in that we are going to uh, prepare the diagnostic device with the same nanoparticle so we prefer the uh, Make a uh, medical devices use of the tungsten nanoparticles instead of the direct use. Direct use. So, madam, one more question. Yes. Uh, you are preparing tungsten oxide broccoli nanoparticles. Material. Nanoparticles. Yes. So, yes. that means tungsten oxide in, along with the tungsten oxide, the broccoli broccoli material is also there. You are thinking? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. When sir. when you uh, calcinate that amount into six hundred or four hundred degrees, I think uh, you have said. Yes. So sir. at that temperature, the organic material will be burn and it will become in the form of carbon. Sir, actually, uh, in this synthesis, the broccoli itself acts as a reducing agent. Only reducing the... agent for tungsten oxide converting yes. tungsten only. Uh, yes, yes, sir. So you should not call a tungsten oxide broccoli nanoparticle because it is broccoli is used as or uh, reducing self reducing agent. I think. Yes, self reducing agent. Yeah, okay. Yes. Not, uh, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay thank you very much sama thank you for your best presentation uh, okay. next uh, uh, to again sonali i tagur uh, is you, ready sir. yes sir uh, they are going to present for me okay 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 so go ahead sir madam again uh, once i introduce again once again i, introduce, I want to introduce uh, sonali i tagur thakur she is uh, department of chemistry of ms university of baroda india uh see, her talk is uh, self therapeutic uh, nano materials for uh, cancer therapy yeah thank you um, everyone uh, and good again, morning everyone again we want uh, the slide share mode madam yeah the, uh, the i request ngu uh, yeah uh, okay okay thank no. you so much yeah uh, no, i'm um, really sorry for go ahead for go ahead madam go ahead yeah. madam all the best so uh, Yeah, so this I'll be talking about again in the line of cancer therapy. I would like to talk on a new uh, generation materials that are about uh, cell therapeutic uh, materials. So uh, kindly uh, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so the challenges in cancer therapy are uh, uh, we all know. Uh, one is the targeted drug delivery that we have been talking about and the other thing that is there is the uh, multi drug resistance that is another issue the uh, uh, the cancer uh, become resistant to drugs uh, and therefore the chemotherapy doesn't work so therefore uh, to overcome this uh, nowadays people are developing materials which can load multiple drugs so so that uh, you know uh, this uh, mdr can be taken care of next slide please 
so uh, we uh, so the, so we take advantage of the whenever, whenever there's a cancer therapy the targeted cancer therapy takes advantage of the difference between the normal cells and the cancer cells uh, we know that uh, there are very minor but still there are some differences like the cancer cells have acidic ph slightly acidic ph and they have a slightly higher temperature and the most important is the over expression of certain receptors for example uh, folate receptors glutathione receptors so uh, there is an over expression of the uh, receptors and these receptors have an affinity for certain chemical agents for example folate receptors have affinity for folic acid so such uh, ligands can be attached to the cancer targeting or uh, cancer uh, carrying uh, drug carrying uh, systems for so that we can uh, the the we can accumulate these carriers near the cancer cells because of the affinity with the receptors these carriers would get accumulated near the cancer and then release the drug preferentially uh, near the cancer cells next slide please So nanomaterials are important simply because of this passive targeting or this uh, enhanced uh, permeability retention effect. That is the cancer, uh, the tumor, uh, near the tumor, there is a leaky vasculature. And this leaky vasculature permits the entry of nano-sized materials. That's the reason a lot of uh, hike is there in the, uh, a lot of uh, potential is expected to be there with the nanomaterials uh, for use in cancer therapy. So it, this is known as passive targeting. And next slide. When uh, when uh, there are several methods of active targeting as well. Now, what is active targeting? Active targeting means we are uh, designing the materials in such a way that uh, they will have uh, more affinity to, towards the cancer cells. The challenge uh, with the uh, cancer therapy is, as I said, the targeted uh, drug release. That is a more drug release near the tumor cells. And hardly any drug release in the normal cells otherwise if there is equal release in both the cases then there will be side effects and most of the side effects that we see with the existing drugs are due to this reason because they treat the normal cells and the cancer cells in the same way so uh, one of the developments in this area is smart polymers so smart polymers are uh, mainly include the stimuli responsive polymers which are mainly responsive to certain stimuli already i just showed you that there are the cancer cells have high uh, pa uh, low ph acidic ph and slightly high temperature so we can target this uh, uh, properties of these cancer cells and we can design the polymers so that they can release drug uh, on demand what is said to be on demand that is the stimuli responsive smart polymers they respond to changes in the surrounding environment and they change the properties accordingly accordingly now stimuli responsivity helps in targeting release of the drug and also it uh, it can be uh, utilized for the therapeutic modality like overheating of the tumors with the help of magnetic nanoparticles this step so we can attach these polymers to the magnetic nanoparticles and such uh, different types of therapeutic efficiency can be achieved next please so the the stimuli responsive polymers are of different there are different types of stimuli and similarly there are different types of stimuli responsive polymers one is thermoresponsive polymers which respond to the change in temperature so this property can be used to uh, release the drug near the cancer cells in response to the change in temperature the cancer cells have a higher temperature and if your polymer is responsive to higher temperature it releases drug whenever the temperature is slightly high the, and, uh, the, and does not release the drug when the temperature is uh, close to body temperature, then it will be very useful for targeted release. Similarly, pH responsive, wherein, whereas where the, acid, the drug should be released in response to acidic pH and not released to the normal pH, and this can also help in selectivity of the drug release. Another is redox responsibility, which is uh, due to certain uh, functionalities like SS bond. When when you when you introduce SS bond in your uh, design of the carrier, then you can get a redox response. The, the, there will be a drug release uh, when the carrier comes in contact with glutathione, 
and then this type of response is called redox responsivity and the uh, another one is light that is photosensitive polymers we can use for this purpose and then, then that can be used for photothermal therapy in photothermal therapy uh, we use light of a particular wavelength like for example laser light of a particular wavelength can be uh, uh, irradiated the, the carrier when irradiated with such a light only uh, releases drug so we can uh, uh, have a targeted release of the drug at the site of tumor because it will be only when the laser is beam is coming in contact with the carriers of course here the challenge is to uh, have the response near the temperatures which are uh, suitable for the biological systems next slide please so there are uh, now, uh, there are several nanomaterials that have been used and uh, for making polymer nanoparticles the most important uh, method that people That's have right. been using That's is right. you know a surface functionalization next slide hello uh, sir 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 uh, seminar coordinator next slide yeah this is the one sir this is fine yeah uh, so people have tried the surface functionalization of the polymers that is uh, so that, that that way the polymer can be brought to the nano scale but another uh, option is uh, the met because the metals have their own uh, residual toxicity when you try to bring the polymer to the nano scale by surface functionalization of metal for example cnt's have been used magnetic nanoparticles have been used whole nanoparticles have been used but then and then quantum dots have been used but the problem with some of these metals is that the leaching of the metals and the uh, the renal clearance these issues are there so therefore people have uh, developed metal free uh, polymers wherein the polymers are brought to the nano scale by self assembly so these uh, uh, these are the examples of uh, self assembling nano materials so wherein we have to make block copolymer block polymers block copolymers which have hydrophobic a proper balance of the hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, levels so if you have a proper combination of the hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, mole molecules or moieties then we can have self assembly and the self assembling polymers can be in the form of polymer micelles they can be in the form of polymer vesicles depending on the choice of uh, the choice that we have made of the uh, like for example if you have a branched copolymer you get vesicles if you have a straight chain uh, polymer we get micelles so these are very interesting nowadays next slide please so we have uh, resorted to this type of work lately we have uh, earlier we were working by surface functionalization of metal nanoparticles but slowly we shifted to this uh, polymer zones these are called as polymer zones uh, which are uh, similar to liposomes. So they are bio-inspired. They are inspired from liposomes. And such materials are always very useful because they are having more, we can relate them more to the uh, biological systems. And the toxicity issues will be always less. So the polymer same zones have been synthesized in different forms. People have synthesized them in so many different forms. So you can play with the hydrophobic, hydrophilic balance. You can play with the functionalities. Organic chemists do, can do a lot of work here and can uh, get different shapes. And the shapes are also very important when we are trying to target uh, the, uh, the, tissue, the cancer tissues. And when we are looking at the endocytosis, what we call where the entry of the uh, drug carriers into the cells that by endocytosis, here the shape plays a very important role. Uh, next, please. So we have started working in this direction. Uh, so people uh, in the literature, uh, the next uh, what we what we could uh, come across is uh, micelles. Uh, so uh, micelles uh, can uh, enter the uh, cells and then they can uh, uh, undergo disintegration. The biggest challenge here is the. Uh, the polymersomes, the toxicity of the polymersomes, whether the polymersomes will create tox, they will release drug, no doubt, they will carry drug, they will release drug, they will be able to give a sustained drug release, but whether they will create any toxicity. So for that, one has to be very sure that uh, the polymersomes, after releasing the drug, they should not re be retaining in the body for a longer period of time and create residual toxicity, and also they should be cleared from the body at the right time. So this is an example of uh, 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 the disassembly of the uh, micelles. The micelles goes into the system and undergoes disassembly 
breaks into components which are non toxic and also releases the drug so this was very interesting and so we tried to work in this direction next next please next slide ha yeah so our work now is at the development so what we thought is why not prepare a mice yeah this is the slide sir. that I, i think it has come our work yeah so we are uh, aiming to develop a uh, curcumin uh, based mice so why we thought why not use a therapeutic agent to make a mice to prepare a mice to construct a mice and which will undergo uh, disintegration and release the therapeutic agent itself so we developed curcumin product mice which are therapeutic we call them self therapeutic because they themselves are made up from a therapeutic molecule the pro drug mice were formed by self assembly of rationally synthesized block copolymers and so for the synthesis we used curcumin which was conjugated to a non toxic Uh, pro moiety that is formal benzoic acid we used ester linkages then we used next we used acetal linkages so we used linkages which are responsive to enzymes so that when the mice enters the body comes into the contact with enzyme it disintegrates and releases the therapeutic agent and the polyethylene glycol was also utilized to conjugate with the curcumin so that we can have greater circulation time the next scheme synthetic scheme will make this more clear next slide please so the next slide is uh, okay and that is uh, and we also used biotin as a targeting lig ligand biotin we tag the biotin because uh, the biotin will be uh, as as i said the targeting is very important so not only that we made the mices from biocomponent biocompatible uh, precursors but we also Uh, attached it with the biotin kind of uh, ligand so that we can have preferential accumulation biotin is also known as vitamin h and it is uh, very well uh, known that, that the vitamin h receptors are over expressed on the surface of cancer cells and therefore cancer cells have an affinity for biotin next please the this is the synthesis of uh, uh, our uh, uh, pro drug mycels so this is curcumin yellow in yellow and we have attached to formyl benzoic acid and so we have formylated the curcumin and then with the help of uh, another molecule we developed acetal linkages what we could develop is acetal linkages why acetal linkages because we want to break this molecule our ultimate target is to break this molecule when it comes in contact with enzyme and then curcumin will be released so the entire focus is on release of curcumin by, by breaking the micelles so and then uh, 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 so the next step is uh, uh, making acetal linkages after that we prepared a, a biotin peg conjugate we attached biotin to peg peg was used for uh, long term uh, blood circulation and biotin the targeting ligand and then this whole uh, the the a and b the a component which is curcumin with the acetal linkages the b component that is pegylated biotin the two were uh, uh, condensed and we could uh, we can we finally have the amphiphilic polymer which is having curcumin at the center so we prepared an amphiphilic polymer using curcumin at the end we have biotin which is the targeting ligand next please uh, so we characterized this block copolymer with the help of nmr spectra but i will not go into the details of nmr spectra and of course ftir and several other characterization techniques next one please now this my cell now this whatever uh, amphiphilic copolymer that we prepared you can see it has we can see it has uh, self assembled in such a way that the curcumin is the hydrophobic end is at the center the curcumin is at the center and the biotin ligands are at the ends the peripheral uh, biotin ligands are there so therefore this peripheral biotin ligands will help uh, the the receptors will have will have an affinity for this biotin and this my cell will accumulate where the biotin receptors are there and so be this uh, this my cell formation whether this my cell formation has taken place or not was confirmed by several characterization techniques uh, the hypothesis that there is a self assembly we could see the nice uh, sphere, spherical shapes in the tem so we could see see that they are nano micelles and then we could see we have done dls and uh, the size is close to 100 nanometers 
and then uh, we have even loaded the drug and checked after loading the size of the drug uh, the nanomyces increasing increases slightly then we have afm analysis also confirms the formation of these micelles so basically we prepared nanomyces which have curcumin at the center and biotin at the end and in between the pg it's for long term blood circulation next please so uh, other characterizations also were done like uh, the cmc we have to find out uh, this since these are micelles the critical micro micellar uh, concentration was also estimated the hydrodynamic radius was estimated we actually prepared p1 p2 p3 is three we prepared using different chain lengths of peg we use different chain length of peg to understand what uh, if, is the effect so we used peg 2000 we used 4000 and then 6000 and then we have drug loaded and without the drug and we uh, can uh, we see we saw all these parameters uh, in case of without the drug and uh, with drug next please and then uh, we also calculated the molecular weight with the help of nmr and then the curcumin loading was also uh, not, uh, noted that whether the, the my cells have curcumin or they do not have curcumin in, uh, but we could see the percentage curcumin loading also in this case next please uh, so then now the question about a uh, non-cytotoxicity of the carriers or the non-toxicity of the carriers. Already we have selected the precursors in such a way that we expect that there should not be any toxicity. And then ultimately uh, we proved the non-toxicity with the help of MTTSA. We, could, uh, we carried out the MTTSA and we could, we could confirm that this uh, the, there is no cell, vi uh, cell death, the cell viability is as it is. So the carriers by themselves are not uh, showing the toxicity, but but when they come in contact with the enzyme that is esterase, you can see the figure D. The figure D shows uh, the response in enzyme. So when when the uh, my cells come in contact with the enzyme, then they are going to disintegrate and then they are going to release the drug. So a very slow and sustained release of the curcumin was observed. The, the free curcumin, if you see, it will release, it will, it will not be able to, we will not be able to have a sustained release. Will not, there will not be any bioavailability because of the poor solubility of the curcumin in, water, in the aqueous medium. But these nanomyces have actually in, increased or improved the, uh, the uh, solubility in water and therefore the bioavailability in aqueous medium. Yeah, next please. So this is how the disintegration occurs. Uh, the, if you in the initially, we can see the, the in the center there is the micelle, and this micelle, uh, if there is the pH is seven point four and the temperature is thirty seven degree, there is hardly any release. And I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that this micelle was even loaded with docs. It it was prepared from curcumin. And then uh, the micelle was loaded with doxorubicin. In the hydrophobic region, we could load doxorubicin also. So we have two true therapeutic agents here. One is curcumin and the other is dox. Dual therapeutic um, uh, uh, no, uh, nature. And so in at uh, the normal pH and at 37 degree, you can see that there is hardly just 30, less than 30% dox release. But when the pH is acidic, and when there is uh, the um, enzyme, then there is a disintegration of this, uh, basically the acetyl hydrolysis takes place and there is a disintegration of the micelle and there is greater than 80% drug release. So this is what uh, we, uh, the in vitro, in vitro drug kinetics we followed and then from this we could come to this conclusion that uh, there is a very selectivity uh, of the pH, of the enzyme, so the release occurs only under such conditions. So we tuned our design so that to achieve this target. Next, please. So uh, this again, uh, the study uh, shows the that uh, the, how the esterase acts on the acetal and breaks the acetal linkage and uh, in the presence of buffer. And uh, when there is an ester, uh, when there is an enzyme, sorry, when there is an enzyme, there is disintegration, release of curcumin as well as drugs. Here, there is a release of curcumin also. When there is an enzyme, there is a release of curcumin as well. This long uh, tube-like curcumin and the dots represent the docs. 
and we have both the drugs coming out and when the uh, and when the conditions are favorable so you can see the chart b and chart d uh, we are the uv spectra has been taken and the kinetics has been monitored and we can see that there is a release of the drug whereas c and e show that when there is no enzyme there is no release of the drug curcumin that is basically next please madam please conclude yeah so this all was supported with the help of uh, in vivo studies as well we uh, we did some rat studies we induced tumor and then uh, we could uh, see that uh, this uh, whatever our uh, hierarchical disassembly was we we expected that we could see in presence of the enzyme next please so our results were sub, uh, uh, sub, next please our results were supported by in vitro and in vivo studies both Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, to conclude, we uh, report the synthesis of acetal and ester linked uh, curcumin derived block copolymers, which are actually pro drug micelles, which can which can undergo sequential degradation only in the tumor environment, and the carriers are non toxic. They have low CMC, and the, they can carry the drug dogs. And the dog's release occurs under mild intracellular acidic media of the cancer cell due to the acetyl hydrolysis. So thus, the micelles are found to rupture and release 80 plus, greater than 80 percent of both dogs and curcumin on ex only on exposure to the tumor milieu that is low pH and lysosomal esterase. So this is uh, uh, the next slide is just uh, to show you our uh, work. We have published this one. Next slide, please. We have published this work recently in uh, bioconjugate chemistry. This is the kind of work that, going, that is going on in our lab. So if anyone is interested in collaboration, they can please get in contact with us. Uh, and uh, um, uh, thank you for, uh, yeah, please. Next slide, please. So these are the publication, recent publications, uh, Bioconjugate Chemistry, uh, as I said, this work was published. Apart from that, we have worked earlier with CNTs and magnetic nanoparticles. The work is published in carbohydrate polymer. If anybody is interested, they can uh, go through these publications and uh, acknowledgements like please. So I'd like to really thank uh, the organizers for, and I really thank uh, Professor Sabu Thomas. He has always been, uh, next slide please. He has always invited me to all his conferences and uh, I'm so glad to be here and uh, talk here and I uh, thank my funding agencies and my collaborators and my students of course they work very hard for this thank you so much uh, thank you Dr. Sonal Tagur um, it is a very interesting uh, presentation yeah now the so presentation much. is uh, open to the question and answers any discussion also anybody Again, Madam, my side. Yeah. Uh, whether you are uh, is this tar targeting material, the material is yes, uh, related to the what your pH activated or uh, acidic activated or uh, you have told already. Yeah, temperature. it is yes, it is acidic pH, pH. not temperature, pH. only uh, pH and enzyme dual responsive ph oh, so and enzyme. hydrolysis and uh, yes it will be happen yes. Okay. yes sir yes sir. so you, how can you inject uh, this material to the yeah, yeah. Body? so these are almost orally or, orally or intravenously intravenous sir iv it can be intravenous yes uh, so how can you know this is it goes to the same target in, without uh, uh, touching the other cells uh, yes uh, other absorption of other cells how can you how can we know they may sir, that is some, yeah, so that is uh, because we have biotin. Okay. So uh, with the, the biotin, biocompatible. Biocompatible. yeah, so biotin okay. is the ligand. And this we have studied using normal cells. We have compared normal cells and we have compared cancer cells. We okay. have compared in both the cases and we could see that there is more drug release when in contact with cancer cells in in vitro studies. And when okay. there were normal studies the cells, there was very less drug release. So that proves that uh, there is targeting. So any questions? From other dignitaries. If there is no questions, thank you, Dr. Sanal. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, next. Uh,
Next member, Dr. Swati Jagdale, is issue present? No. Sir, she was uh, not present as uh, no, she is having the network and technical issue. Okay, okay. Now, another person is there allotted, Sayyid Saiman, Dr. Sayyid Saiman. He is also not there. Dr. Sayyid Saiman from Department of Chemistry, uh, Lahore, Pakistan. is there. Lahore, Pakistan, University of. Uh, sir, he's there. I'm here. Uh, so you can present your presentation, sir. So Syed, sir, Dr. Syed Saiman, uh, yes. Department of Chemistry, Division of Science and Technology, University of Education, Lahore, Pakistan. His work is uh, um, anti-fungal and uh, wound healing evaluation of uh, Statistically optimized silica nanoparticles loaded with uh, silicic acid, so sorry, salicylic acid and ketoconazole. So you can present your proper uh, your uh, work, sir, and do presentation. Uh, thank you, you so much oh. uh, uh, for providing me an opportunity uh, to present my research work. So initially, I shall. Uh, explain the contents of this talk. So, first of all, I will explain uh, what is a scaffold. Sorry, can you excuse me? Can can you share? Uh, can you please put it in full screen? Uh, because uh, sharing. I have put my screen. So, is it not visible to you? Not visible. Uh, it is not, not visible. In, because uh, can we can we present? We have the EPT sound here. Yes, I have just emailed to you. Yeah, so, can we present? Because yes, you, you are can presenting present. in your mobile phone, so the other delegates can see. It. Uh, so, yes, so, so, so you can present. You can present, madam, no, sir. Sir, no problem. No problem, sir. No problem. Okay, okay. you can present. Yeah, we have. Uh, we will present it. Yes, uh, I can see my presentation at your screen. Uh, okay. So okay. Uh, you, can, you, go, you can go ahead, Dr. Sayyid Salman. Thank you so much. Uh, initially, I shall explain what is a scaffold and uh, a biopolymer alginate, which is commonly used as scaffold, then silicon nanoparticles. Uh, please move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So then are uh, two common drugs, ketoconazole and salicylic acid. Uh, they have been reported in literature due to their antifungal properties. And then what were the problems which we tried to address during this research work? Scaffold is a temporary supporting material. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, OK, so scaffold is a temporary material uh, which is used for developing cells and tissues. It can help to provide platform on which cell can uh, proliferate, migrate, and differentiate. It also helps in the formation of tissues because it has similarity to the original part of the body. So it has capability to regenerate in the in vivo experiment, uh, in vivo environment that is supported by extracellular matrix. As far as applications of scaffolds are concerned, Scaffolds have been reported uh, for their applications as delivery vehicles for cells and drugs in tissues. Uh, generation scaffolds have tendency to combine with various types of molecules. Scaffolds have tendency uh, to uh, combine with the, uh, uh, to release specific soluble molecules. So in the field of cell attachment, migration, regeneration, so scaffolds have numerous applications. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, 
sorry, you skipped one, uh, one slide. Uh, that's that's uh, alginate. Alginate is a biopolymer. It is an ionic polymer. So it is usually extracted from brown seaweeds. So it is heteropolysaccharide. So it has uh, widespread uh, biomedical applications due to its biocompatibility, low toxicity, cost effectiveness. It also has high water sorbitivity and homeostatic potential uh, that makes it a good candidate for wound healing applications. Keeping in view these properties of alginate, alginate was selected uh, as a material to develop a new scaffold. Next slide. Mesoporous silicon nanoparticles. Uh, these these were selected as drug carriers because they have advantage of high surface area, large pore size, high loading capacity. And uh, we uh, studied during literature review that these are a very good candidate for the controlled drug delivery. So uh, further, these uh, silicon nanoparticles have a plenty of hydroxyl groups on their surface. So it has a, a dual character because its surface can interact with water and its core is a hydrophobic in nature. So it can develop mycelium within the body, body which is a, a very demanding material uh, for the development of a scaffold which has tendency of sustained drug delivery. Next slide. Ketoconazole and salicylic acid. So as it is mentioned on the slides, so they have their therapeutic applications as antifungal agents and in as well as in wound healing. So next slide. Problem statement. Uh, what was the problems? Usually the persons uh, with immunocompromised viral infections are Parkinson's disease. They suffer with fungal infections resembling dermatitis. So the therapeutic option for treatment of fungal infection is usually uh, polyenes, pyrimidines, and econidates. So the problem uh, that is encountered by the patients is the high morbidity and mortality, drug-resistant antifungal strains, and systematically or topically is usually complicated, high risk of toxicity, abrupt or prolonged drug release, and chances of inadequate penetration and poor response due to uh, these problems. So to address these issues, uh, we try to design a scaffold which has a sustained drug delivery. Next slide, please. So uh, the objectives of this study was to develop a mesoporous silicon nanoparticle loaded with ketoconazole and salicylicated through sol gel method and characterization of these materials by chemical and physicochemical analysis and to study the biological study of developed scaffold, uh, their in vitro and in vivo antifungal studies and sustained drug delivery by this developed scaffold. Next slide. Methodology. Uh, Salicylic acid and ketoconazole loaded silicon nanoparticles were prepared by Solgel method, and alginate scaffold was uh, uh, developed by freeze gelation method. And all this uh, formulation was uh, uh, supported by uh, CCRD, uh, which is a statistical tool. And this is uh, in this methodology, a three factor five level CCD was uh, developed to prepare an optimized formulation. Next slide. Uh, okay, so during this methodology, the independent variables were pH, steering time, and steering speed, and dependent variables were percentage yield, entrapment efficiency, salicylic acid, and release of uh, KCZ. So this design expert software, uh, in this software, we used these uh, parameters. So uh, by manipulating their values, we came to an conclusion to develop an optimized uh, formulation 
uh, by uh, changing or adjusting the values of pH, steering time, and steering speed. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, so, uh, due to shortage of time, uh, I'm going to skip this preparation of silicon nanoparticles. Uh, can you move to the next slide? Uh, scaffold, I already explained freeze relation method was used. So, it is just a methodology. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So, here is a scheme of uh, methodology. So the previous slides, which I skipped, uh, can uh, highlight the process. So in this slide, we can see initially uh, we developed silicon nanoparticles by using tetraethoxy silane under acidic media. And after the preparation of soil, both of the drugs were uh, poured off into the silica soil. So then it was allowed to be set for a specific time to develop a gel and further silicon nanoparticles were uh, separated out. Then these silicon nanoparticles were uh, reacted with alginate. Then uh, this was uh, uh, allowed uh, to freeze for a specific time interval. So at the end, we can see that a, a reddish color scaffold was developed. So please move to the next slide. So now we want to come across the physicochemical characterization of this formulation. So in FTIR spectra, we noticed that uh, the uh, absorption peaks of pure drugs were available in the formulation. Uh, means we am talking about two types of formulations. First level is loading of drug in silica. And second level of formulation is drug loaded silica in alginate. So we can see the peaks of drugs are available in silica as well as in alginate. So from XTIR, it was concluded that there is no physical interaction between drug and silica and alginate. Next slide, please. XRD. So in XRD graphs, the similar findings were observed that the peaks of pure drugs are available in the final formulation. That is the fourth one, uh, which I have captioned as SAKCZ MSN alginate. So it is the final formu uh, formulation, uh, which is depicted in pink color. So we can see the peaks of KCZ and SA are present in the formulation. So XRD results revealed that there is no chemical interaction between drug and silica and alginate. Next slide, please. So DSE, DSE is a tool uh, which is used to determine uh, the degree of crystallinity of drugs. So from DSE, we can see from SA and KCZ, there are two endothermic peaks near the melting points of drugs, but these two peaks were found missing in the drug when drugs were loaded in silica and when drugs were loaded in alginate. So from DSC results, it was uh, concluded that drugs have been transformed into amorphous form when they are loaded in silica and alginate. Next one, please. TGA. TGA is a very important tool to determine the loading capacity of uh, excipients. So here in this TGA uh, result, I have uh, mentioned TG of pure drugs, drugs loaded silica, and drug loaded alginate. So from TGA curves, it was founded that maximum weight loss was observed in case of formulation, final formulation, which is uh, SAKCZ MSN alginate. So this was an evidence uh, that uh, in case of final formulation, uh, most weight loss was observed. And similar findings we also found while we conducted HPLC of this material. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, uh, due to shortage of time, I want to uh, skip the entrapment efficiency of scaffold and CCR results. So it will take longer time to explain this quadratic equation. So please, uh, here are the graphs. 
so if some, you people are familiar with the ccrd so these graphs are sufficient to uh, view the trend or effect of independent factors and dependent factors next slide next slide okay i will stop you when i i, I need to stop so you can pass on the slides yes uh, please previous one the drug release drug release kinetics so drug release studies uh, were uh, studied and zero order model first order fugachi and uh, kp model was applied to the experimental data which was obtained during the percentage cumulative drug release so it was observed that the release of drug was sustained uh, from the scaffold so that was one of our objective uh, as i mentioned on the slide of objectives that our objective was to prepare a formulation from which drug can be released in the form of um, very slow uh, release next one so these are the uh, bar chart which is uh, uh explaining the in vitro antifungal performance of uh, pure drug uh, suspensions and uh, drug loaded silica and uh, drug loaded silica encapsulated in alginate so on third day fifth day seventh day and even 14th day we can clearly see the blue color chart is indicating that the antifungal performance of uh, scaffold was maximum uh, as compared to pure drug suspensions as well as drug loaded silica next slide please cytotoxicity uh, is one of the key parameter uh, to evaluate the efficacy of any uh, newly developed formulation so we can see Uh, from the cytotoxicity study uh, that uh, msn's loaded uh, with alginate scaffold uh, show uh, 95% uh, cell viability uh, as compared to pure drugs and drug loaded silica nanoparticles next slide so zeta potential and uh, zeta size is also an important uh, parameter Uh, to uh, investigate the efficacy of a formulation uh, either positive or negative potential on formu formulation is uh, uh, favorable uh, but if the formulation has some positive and some negative charges so this kind of formulation is usually is not suitable to develop a, a scaffold so from these Uh, graphs we can see uh, the potential of uh, formulation uh, falls in negative uh, trend and it shows a value of minus 23.1 mv so which is uh, due to uh, the silanol groups on uh, silica so this chart also uh, depicting that the developed formulation is a suitable formulation for antifungal and wound healing applications next slide please scanning electron microscopy images of uh, alginate and for silica uh, can be uh, seen from this slide that al alginate has hetero heterogeneous porous and rough surface and uh, from the image b we can see there are small dots which are indicating that silica nanoparticles are present in alginate and then uh, these uh, Uh, particles have physical uh, physically embedded in the alginate next one please so now i would like to conclude my talk and that is uh, the development of sakcc msn alginate scaffold by free resolution method was a successful experiment and uh, process variables were optimized precisely by using uh, ccrd drug loaded silica nanoparticles uh, were prepared by sol gel method although sol gel method is an expensive method but 
uh, we concluded the silicon nanoparticles prepared by solgel method were mono dispersed having regular morphology and uh, then combination therapy means combination of two drugs at a time in two different excipients was also a wonderful experience so it has remarkable effects on the skin of rabbits so due to shortage and limitation of time i could not include my wound healing studies so we found that these materials were efficient uh, in healing of wounds on rabbit model polynomial equations response surface method analogy uh, was uh, better uh, to develop optimized formulation FTIR, TGA, and DSC studies that there is no chemical interaction between drug and excipient. So drug was available uh, in its chemical form, but it was transformed into amorphous nature. So some some images also confirmed the uniform distribution of drugs in empathen matrix. So uh, cases scaffold accepted 15 days sustained uh, in vitro drug release, which was uh, one of our main objective. So. with this i would like to say thanks for your patience and listening my talk uh thank you dr sayed salman uh, for your great presentation uh, now the presentation is for uh, open for questions and answers okay anyone any, if has any questions some a uh, slight uh, doubt from me that is okay. what are the sizes of uh, uh, silicon dioxide before and after loading uh, there was no much difference uh, in the size of silicon and particles because oh. this was uh, just a physical uh, adsorption of drugs in the pores of silica silica so what is the uh, uh, size Uh, the size was 500 to 600 nanometer so 500 to 600 nanometers uh, then it won't come in nanomaterials yes typically 1 to 100 is usually used for yeah, nanometer uh, 2000 uh, in the literature it is mentioned nanometer so rather to mention it 0.5 or 0.6 micrometer micro, micro 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 nanometer uh, okay. oh okay oh it's good it's good good presentation thank you so much So now, anybody left? Swati, Swati is not reporting. I think. So lastly, I report the organization of ICN twenty twenty two. All the present works presented works are uh, good. I thank the organization for the work uh, assigned to me in this uh, mega conference. Uh, the absent is uh, the Dr. Swati Jagdila. was not reported uh, to present his work is a presentation thank you very much to the organization over to the seminar convener thank you sir thank you professor tata kondala rao for your excellent sharing on the session and to all the all other professors who have uh, done the presentations here uh, now we are moving to the other session uh, that is about nano wires here um, the professor sishan hussain khan from the department of applied science and humanities is a faculty of engineering and technology from jamia mila islamia new delhi and the topic is studies on metal doped aluminum nanowires so i call dr sian hussain khan person his hello hello i am am i audible yes sir you are audible hello hello sir am i audible Yes, yes, we are audible, sir. Okay. We can start. So let me start the presentation. Uh, can you like uh, do? Do I need to share the presentation, or can you share it because I have sent by email? Uh, sir, you have sent to which mail ID? Is it seminar at mgu. Okay. Then, then let me share it. Okay, sir.
so the presentation is visible to everybody sir hello ah, yes sir is it visible to everybody yes sir yes, it sir. is clearly visible okay so uh, good morning good morning everyone uh, the topic of my talk is studies on metal doped alq3 nanowire so i am zishan husain khan and i am in the department of applied sciences and humanities amia millia islamia new delhi so so as we know that alq3 is a very well studied material and it's very popular in organic light emitting diodes and solar cells and other optoelectronic devices because of its interesting optical properties so let me give a general introduction of this material so we know that molecular formula of alq3 is alc9 s6 no to the power thrice and its melting point is almost near about to 300 degree celsius is insoluble in water and absorption maximum absorption occurs to get absorption peak at 29 nanometer and for fluorescence the excitation wavelength is 390 nanometer and emission wavelength is 519 nanometer so this is the typical name of this alq3 is tristrate 8 hydro hydroxy quinoline aluminum and this is as i told this is very much popular as a emissive material in organic light emitting diodes due to its excellent yellowish green fluorescent emission and it is being used in electron transport layer in oled solar cells other electronic devices and also being reported to be used in the fabrication of active and passive passive wave guides and in spin spintronics devices so these are some of the applications of alq3 so you can see that typically it is used in a oled as an emissive layer electron transport layer in solar cells and also used in spintronics devices so what we are doing in the lab so this is not our major work this is like one two students are working in this area so our major focus is on basically hybrid solar cells so we are just interested to use this material as a electron transport layers that is what I, one of my student he started working on this and produced beautiful nano wires with this and we try to use it in solar cell so i'll i'll show you later on in this presentation so in the lab what we are doing we are synthesizing uh, beautiful spherical nano particles of alq3 and the nano wires of alq3 using very simple approach so alq3 luminescence why it is so important so if you see that the pl spectra of this you see that the as i told that the excitation wavelength and the emission wavelength you can see in the diagram and if you see the uh, jablowski diagram of this so you see that singlet singlet transition material there is only 25% probability of forming this singlet transition so because of this the emission intensity is small or less so people are trying to enhance this emission the luminescence intensity emission intensity so that this material can further be utilized in many other devices so our objective of today's talk is to show the results on enhancement of emission intensity using a very simple concept of metal doping in this kind of nanowires 
LQ3 nanowires. So tuning of luminescence towards lower wavelength is also needed for the functional application of this material. And metal doping in LQ3 is obviously a successful approach for the enhancement of this luminescence intensity. So this is one of our work, which is published a long time back. So what he, we did here, we incorporated silver in ALQ3 nanowires. And you can see the morphologies of these nanowires. And from EDX, EDX, we got confirmation that, that all this ALQ3 and silver is present in the synthesized materials. And this is very simple approach, simply mixing AgNO3 and LQ3 using sonicator and then using solid state diffusion to do this kind of doping. And finally, we use CVD method to grow nanowires. So you can see the diameter of this nanowire that is from 60 to 100 nanometers. So, and this is the UV visible spectrometer, spectra of pure and silver doped silver incorporated alq3 nanowire so you will see the hump at 360 nanometer which enhances increases with increasing silver concentration so this shows that the alq3 oligomers small crystals of alq3 are present around alq3 structure so and from xrd pattern also we, we, uh, we are getting a peak of silver. So this shows the uh, doping of silver or the incorporation of silver in ALQ3 nanowires. And this is the infrared FTIR spectra of for pure and silver doped ALQ3 nanowires. So we are getting the IR modes of you can see that silver and ALQ3, so which again shows the presence of ALQ3 in the ALQ3 nanowires. But what we have predicted in this paper that ALQ3, that silver doping, it doesn't in, like doesn't go into the structure of ALQ3. It is around the ALQ3 structure. So you can see the predicted structure in the diagram. And this is obviously the purpose why we have done this. So you can see that the enhancement in the PL is dramatic. So we are getting a very good enhancement in the luminescence intensity or the emission intensity on metal doping. So this is uh, like a very interesting work. We started long time back. And this work was published in Journal of Luminescence. Then, then we tried to do zinc in LQ3 and produce the nanowires using the same approach. And you can see that the beautiful nanowires in the same micrographs and the presence of zinc is verified using EDX spectra. Here, the XRD patterns and the FTIR patterns. So in case of zinc, we could not get any new peak in the ALQ3, zinc doped ALQ3 nanovirus spectra. So the peak intensity, but the peak intensity was observed to decrease on doping zinc. So no peak belonging to zinc chloride, which is our material or zinc, the starting material, or zinc metal was observed. Similarly, in the FTIR spectra, no new F, uh, IR mode has been observed in zinc incorporated LQ3 nanowires, which indicates that zinc ions does not form any bond with ALQ3. So from this FTIR and XRD studies, it is confirmed that the zinc incorporated in the form of zinc ions in the LQ3 matrix. So this was our conclusion and the paper was published. And the, again, you see that this is a UV visible spectra. And again, 
in the UV, we do not get any new band. That is due to the zinc doping in the absorption spectra, while the intensity of the white pump in the range of 270 to 550 nanometer have been found to enhance with the increase of zinc incorporation. So this enhancement may be attributed to the intermolecular interaction between LQ3 molecule and zinc ions. And here you can see that the PL emission spectra. And again, this was our ultimate purpose. The intensity was five-fold increased, five-fold, five times in the original one. So this drastic enhancement in the PL intensity may be attributed to the combined effect of two factors. The first one is the incorporation of metal ions and the formation of fine crystalline nanowires to the highest PS PL intensity has been observed for LQ3 zinc doped nanowires having a concentration of, you can see here, 1 is 2.9. And this is, again here, the next published work, which is erbium doped ALQ3 nanowires. So again, you can see a very beautiful high yield of nanowires of ALQ3 and erbium doped ALQ3. So EDEX was used to confirm the presence of erbium. And the XRD pattern, you can see that pure and it BM do nanowires. So you will get here, we get a peak at 27, 24.7 degree, which is which shows the presence of IBM tris hydro hydroxychloroquine or ERQ3. Similarly, in the XPS spectra, pure and it BM do nanowires. So small, small peak around 590 nanometer shows it gives erbium nitride stretching vibration. So here we are able to confirm the presence of ER, erbium in the ALQ3. So the enhancement in the absorption due to erbium doping. So it is maybe due to the presence of rare earth excited states near lowest unoccupied molecular earth lumo of alq3 which may enhance the overall optical absorption in the rpm to alq3 nanowires similarly enhancement in the luminescence for one percent of rpm to samples so it is due to the enrichment of bandage states by four f electrons so this for justification in the paper then enhancement in the luminous for sample more than 1% of doping. So you see that we are getting the maximum enhancement for 1%. And in other case, it is enhanced as compared to the orig original or pure ALQ3, but the maximum is 1%. So it is maybe due to the relaxation through non radiative energy transfer. Now, this is the work on platinum doped ALQ3 nanowires. So this is on PL kinching and improved DC conductivity. PL ALQ3 platinum nanowires. So here again we have produced very beautiful high yield of nanoparticles, and the EDEX confirmed the presence of platinum in the nanowires. The XRD pattern also shows the peak for the platinum, a peak dedicated to platinum, 200 plane. And in the FTI, FTIR spectra, we are getting the presence of, we are, presence of platinum is also verified. So UV visible spectra of ALK3, you can see, and the platinum doped ALK3 nanowires. So again, a peak at 274 nanometer, which is a kind of a small shoulder P. It corresponds to small platinum particles or nanoparticles. And the UV visible spectra of 
of this you can see this is sorry this is pl spectra not uv spectra so pl spectra of alk3 and num dope nanoparticle you can see that you can see that here for oh, one is 2.9 like where you are putting 0.9 percent of platinum in the lk3 the pl is almost quench so here i would like to mention that i am talking about two kind of devices organic light emitting diodes and solar cells so people know that for oled or for leds you need to enhance the emission the pl has to be maximum size whereas for solar cells you need to quench it so i thought that we, this is the best material for our solar cell to be used as electron transport layer and we did in the lab so here you can see that the pl is almost quench at this concentration at this ratio and this quenching is explained that on with a concept of that that a donor is acceptor pair in nanometal surface energy mechanism we have transfer mechanism we have used to explain this PL quenching. And this is a simple arrangement of DC conductivity. So we measure the DC conductivity and try to calculate different electrical parameters. So here we did we calculated activation energy and the electron density and try to explain the energy band gap or the electrical conductivity or electrical conduction in these kind of nanowires. So again, you see here, as I told that we have tried to use this in the solar cell as cathode interfacial layers for improved performance of perovskite zinc nanocomposite based solar cells. So now here you see that we have used this FTO as the substrate, then we have NIOX as a gold transport layer, then we have our active layer of perovskite. Here this perovskite is mixed with zinc oxide nanoparticle. So we have, uh, then we have in other case, so here we have used zinc oxide as a ETL, then CIL, cathode interfacial layer, as this ALQ3 and ALQ3 platinum nanowires, and then finally, context of food. So you can see, you can see the same images of HTL, and you see that the beautiful nanoparticles of nickel oxide can be seen, and which is synthesis of these nanoparticles is verified using XRD spectra. Now, uh, the HTL layer is zinc oxide and we have done the SAM and XRD and EDS to verify the presence of zinc oxide particle. Here you can see that the perovskite zinc, which is a composite, as I told you, is as a photoactive layer. And here with this EDS, we have confirmed the zinc and perovskite in this photoactive layer of solar cell device. So this is our XRD. You can see that the active layer peak intensity and full with half maxima. So this is for pure perovskite and this is for zinc dope perovskite. So this is all being confirmed using XRD. And the crystalline domain size we have calculated. So this is for pure, this was around 21 nanometer. And for zinc oxide, dope perovskite, it is around 44 nanometer. So the size of crystalline domains, it is calculated using simple shellarication. Now, the absorption spectra of perovskite and perovskite Zinc, of, zinc oxide uh, composite film on the FTO, FTO substrate where we, in the device where we have used it as a photoactive layer. So initially we did the study of perovskite and perovskite zinc oxide composite 
decompose it and then we use it in the photoactive layer that device layer result i'll show you later on so you can see here the study state pl is also done this is also for the photoactive layer so you can see that the pl of uh, peruskite materials then different combinations of zinc oxides have been used so the maximum quenching is observed for you can see that the, for the sample where we are using zinc is one milligram per ml and with alq3 platinum with the maximum quenching you can see here so we have all of the maximum quenching so this will waste material for solar cell then we produce fabricate four devices out of these results so the device was the original device or the parent device so this is the peruskite with zinc oxide as etl nickel oxide as htl and fto substrate then gold contents and the second device was uh, like the photoactive layer was changed with uh, uh, peruskite zinc composite and we have used the same stl and etl the third device we have used peruskite and zinc oxide as a composite and then zinc as a etl then cil cathode interfacial layer as a q3 and then finally our metal contents Similarly, in the last device, we change ALQ3 with ALQ3 platinum doped ALQ3 nanowires. Now, what we are getting, you can see here the results. So, the first device, you can see that the JE performance of this current density. You can see that the first device, and then the last one gives the maximum. Okay, so you can see that the device parameter in that table so the maximum efficiency around 10.65 percent so this is all in ambient nothing had been done in the vacuum so we try to do everything in ambient because ultimately the device has to come in ambient. so we have done everything in air in ambient atmosphere so the maximum efficiency we are getting with the four device four which is 10.65% and the fill factor of 67%. So this is very interesting. And you see that the stability of the device. So you can see that the, again, the device four, it remains stable, almost stable up to 30 days. Whereas the original device, the peruskite device decays very fast. So the conclusion, the first work of silver incorporated ALQ3 nanowires shows the dramatic enhancement around fivefold in the PL intensity in comparison to pure ALQ3 nanowires. And the ALQ3, the second paper, the ALQ3 zinc nanowire also showed an enhancement in the intensity. Similarly, in the erbium doped, we are again getting the five-fold enhancement in the PL intensity. Whereas in case of the platinum doped LK3 nanowires, the PL quenching is observed. And this system is also being used in the device where it shows the efficiency nearly 11% and a fill factor of 70, 67%. With this, these are our publication based on only LQ3 material. So with this, I'm thankful to the organizers for providing me an opportunity for the presentation. Thank you, Professor, for the nice yes. presentation. Uh, right now, the session is open for Hello. Us. Hello. Questions, sir. Yes, any question? 
Any query, please? Okay, so, hello, hello, Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, we, I think. Yeah. The Should I leave now? Queries. Yeah, you can. Okay. Thank you for Thank your you. good presentation. Uh, so now uh, we are moving to another session, which is the synthesis of nanoparticles where Professor Architna Girish Nane is a postdoc at King's Market University, Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, so he will be taking the topic, Transforming Nanoparticle Synthesis. Sir, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. You can have your presentation. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes. We can see them. So uh, this is this is my current profile. Right now, I'm working at uh, King's Mongkut University of Technology at the Sensor Technology Laboratory. Uh, so the these are the existing challenges in uh, nanoparticle synthesis, such as the existing uh, synthesis methods uh, possess passive approach. Then there is like a partial mixing of reagents. Uh, there are, uh, after the synthesis, uh, there are unreacted reagents remaining. And several, there is a possibility of uh, several undesired reactions that are happening uh, during the synthesis. So to solve uh, such problems, uh, uh, there are some key points uh, such as automated approach, active mixing, and immediate purification of uh, product. So I would like to uh, present some of my results from my doctoral thesis. So in my doctoral thesis, uh, I have developed a new synthesis uh, method for uh, magnetite nanoparticles by using ascorbic acid. So this is the overview uh, of my study. So the presented method is new, simple, and reproducible. In this method, we carried out a reduction of uh, FeAcC3 by ascorbic acid. Uh, before uh, synthesizing nanoparticles, we estimated the influence of uh, various synthetic parameters on decomposition of precursor and then the uh, properties of the product. Then further, this method was extended for uh, doping magnetite uh, nanoparticles on graphene and in this method we uh, elaborated uh, formation mechanism in detail and this is a motivation behind uh, the work so established synthetic methods have uh, difficulty in controlling particle size shape and properties size control with reproducibility is still challenging and many of the reported methods have their own practical limitations and disadvantages. So therefore, uh, to solve such problems, it was necessary to develop a new synth synthetic method for Fe304 nanoparticles, which can yield nanoparticle with higher uh, accuracy and reproducibility. So 
these are some general methods which are utilized for fe 304 nanoparticle synthesis among which uh, co-precipitation and polyol methods are most widely used methods however uh, these methods have their own limitation for example in co-precipitation method ph control is a very important factor and it is very tedious task so when there is slight change in ph then it is difficult to generate fe 304 particles with stoichiometric composition in case of polyol method the formation mechanism of fe 304 is still not clear so uh, it is unknown uh, that uh, origin of oxygen element in uh, magnetite element these are the general applications of fe 304 nanoparticles then uh, we have uh, developed this uh, mechanism of uh, formation for fe 304 nanoparticles so you can see that this precursor fecs 3 is getting reduced by ascorbic acid and in this method water is acts as oxygen supplier ethanol is solvent this is a simple uh, synthesis experiment so the precursor solution uh, was heated up to a preset temperature for example 60 degrees or 70 degrees or 80 degrees at this preset temperature we added the uh, re reducing acid solution which was made up of ascorbic acid water and ethanol after the addition the temperature was uh, increased up to 190 degrees for one hour where crystallization occurred and then the mixture was cooled down and the product was washed with chloroform and uh, filtrated and dried in vacuum. So before the actual uh, nanoparticle synthesis, we estimated the decomposition efficiency uh, of precursor. And then uh, we estimated the influence of reaction parameters on particle diameter and composition. So to calculate the decomposition efficiency, we took out uh, some sample uh, after the addition uh, of reducing acid solution, 1 ml sample. Then it was uh, diluted with diphenyl ether and the UV spectra were measured for all samples. And from this, uh, a calibration curve was plotted and we used this formula to estimate the decomposition efficiency. These are the different uh, experimental conditions at which uh, this study was carried out. It was found that as the preset temperature is increasing, the decomposition efficiency percentage was increasing. Uh, it was found that there is no effect of uh, different concentrations of water on decomposition efficiency. But there is an effect uh, due to increase in temperature. So we observed that uh, at 60 degrees and 12 molar water concentration, after 25 minutes, uh, decomposition efficiency was found to be 33.57%. The theoretical estimate was 33.33%. So this indicates the one third reduction of precursor by ascorbic acid. Uh, these are different uh, 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 parameters at which synthesis was carried out. Uh, we synthesized 15 nanometers fe 304 nanoparticles at 70 degrees Celsius. This result was uh, reproducible and further they were characterized by uh, EDAX, XRD and XPS. This is the XPS analysis. Then uh, we carried out one experiment, uh, one experiment when water was not uh, used in the synthesis method. And we found one interesting uh, outcome that uh, when the water is absent, uh, there was like only 3% of oxygen. In presence of water, there is like 22%. And uh, this shows that uh, like we also characterized by TAM, XPS and other uh, instruments. So it was observed that in absence of water, Fe, uh, iron nanoparticles are generated and they're coated with iron oxide because of uh, surface oxidation. 
so we developed this mechanism for the uh, formation of uh, fe 304 nanoparticles so then this method was extended to synthesize graphene fe 304 nanocomposites so in this method uh, magnetite nanoparticles were doped on graphene so initially graphene was functionalized by carboxylic groups and then uh, it was added into the uh, fe 304 nanoparticle synthesis method This, we carried out this characterization. It was found that 10 nanometer, uh, uh, 10 nanometer particles were deposited on graphene sheets. So these are this is like a, this is like a summary and future scope. So uh, this research in future can be oriented in several directions, like scaling up and making making it commercial. Uh, automated approach for large scale synthesis. So I will just give a short introduction about automation approach. So this slide shows the industrial revolution. So right now we are dealing with in industry 4.0. So in this uh, era, uh, I mean, all in almost all fields, the digitalization is taking uh, place, even in nanomaterial uh, synthesis also. Uh, digitalization is taking place. The next era will be 5.0, which will be symbiosis between human and machines. So these are the advantages of uh, automation. Automation is very useful for uh, accurate prediction, um, perfect synthesis, op optimization of parameters and product. Uh, it can eliminate the drawbacks in reproducibility. Uh, it can give quick response to market needs and it can reduce the labor intensive tasks automated approach can be applied in all these fields like synthetic biology molecules nanomaterial synthesis and 3d, 3D printing that is additive manufacturing by using ml and ai machine learning and ai so this slide shows the progress in automated synthesis so you can just compare from 2000 to 2021 how how the automation took place in uh, synthetic biology and material science. So this is a simple example uh, in synthetic biology to like uh, first step will be like engineering uh, biological systems by several uh, genetic engineering tools. Then uh, they can optimize by building blocks by using AI, machine learning, and other computing models. And then they, they can go for automated uh, manufacturing of that biomaterial. Uh, this, this is an example for automated uh, molecule uh, scale synthesis. So they use the robot, robotic infrastructure here for the synthesis. And before that, this they did the retro synthetic planning by using various algorithms and machine learning ai so at first they uh, did the retro synthetic uh, pathways they predicted the product they optimized the product and then they used this uh, robotic platform for synthesizing some organic molecules the similar st uh, study was carried out for the silver nanoparticles in which uh, nanoparticles were synth synthesized automatically and then they characterized also automatically. In case of additive manufacturing, it is a layer by layer uh, fabrication of material and a wide range of products can be manufactured by using additive manufacturing as you can see in this slide. So I would like to acknowledge uh, all my professors and thank you for listening to my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your amazing presentation. Right now, the session is open for the questions.
हेलो हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल सर यूर ऑडिबल any questions or any discussion if there is no questions we can move to another session all right thank you sir thank you now i welcome uh, to share the next session of water purification um, i welcome professor lakshya bharat kumar she is from the department of chemistry avan college assam ma'am can you please share the next session yes i am here uh, so can you please share the il 111 and il 112 okay yes thank you sir Am I audible? So you are audible. Okay, for this session we have two invited lectures. Yes, Now sir. Now I go. Monica Joshi. Yes, Monica Now Joshi and Kaushal Kumar. Yeah. Is Monica Joshi are you here? Uh, yes, sir. I am here only. So Monica Joshi is from MIT. In Institute of Technology, MIT University. So she will be presenting her work on adaptive removal of hypoxic sodium from water using microalgae synthesized activated carbon matrix decorated with magnetized iron oxide nanoparticles. So I request Monica to present your work. Uh, yes, sir. Let me share my screen. my screen is visible to everyone hello sir am i audible uh, you are audible and slides are visible please make it uh, okay slide. powerpoint yes sir yes sir i'm i'm doing that i'm doing that uh so good morning everyone and uh, thanks the organizing committee to provide me an opportunity to present my work here Uh, myself monica joshi i am uh, from amity institute of nanotechnology amity university uttar pradesh so today i am i would like to present my work on some adaptive removal of contaminants from water using a biological mediated uh, carbon matrix with their composite so the outline of the talk is as follows motivation of the work introduction experimental part resulting discussion followed by conclusion um as we all know that water air and food all these three things are uh, uh, very very essential for all the human beings but unfortunately this all these th uh, things are full of 
contaminants. Um, not only in India, but it's a worldwide um, scenario that that the water um, the waterborne disease are much more higher compared to the normal disease. This only not affects our uh, human beings, but also affects our flora and fauna. And um, as per the um, uh, report given by WHO, that uh, per day around 780 lakhs uh, person died due to the consumption of unsafe water. So uh, this uh, motivates me to work on this area. Um, now, if um, as everybody knows that water is a complex mixture and uh, the pollution is not a single pollutant that, that can affect our uh, water bodies, but the pollutants are of uh, various types. Like uh, we can say that the domestic wastewater even uh, goes to uh, the, um, the clean water streams and uh, make it uh, pollute, uh, polluted. Similarly, the industrial wastewater, that is a, a, a bigger uh, site that also contaminates uh, water and um, a major industry that that are um, that uh, that uh, plays a um, a very um, crucial role for for creating this water contaminant is food industry textile industry automobile industry oil industry pharmaceutical industry and so many other industries um if i compare this uh, water like domestic wastewater in general has a bacteria type of infection and um, industrial wastewater had um, have uh, a lot of uh, toxic chemicals uh, as well as they have uh, a variety of uh, pollutants right that 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 most of them are non biodegradable in nature so what happens due to if we, if, we, if we will go to the traditional techniques it's it's very difficult to to uh, to clean that um, water even uh, or uh, if even we will um, get success till 70 percent or 80 percent but apart from that even the trace elements are always present in water and uh, they can come directly through some um, means and uh, even polluted our um, fresh water that that is a drinkable water so uh, going to the my topic, let's discuss about the pollutants, type of pollutants. As I told you, that it, it's not from a single stream. If if we have to find out the pollutant, it, it is a mixture, actually, uh, that consists of a chemical pollutants like organic pollutants, radioactive pollutants, inorganic pollutants, biological pollutants, physical pollutants, a variety of pollutants are present. So uh, based on that, um, uh, my major area of work is to, to treat the industrial wastewater and uh, using nanomaterials even uh, for the detection purpose as well as for the uh, treatment purpose. For that, uh, we generally uh, check if we'll check the, the type of pollutant present on that. That is sulfates, nitrates, phosphate, chlorides, heavy metals, uh, dyes, chlorinated organic uh, compounds and other things. So these are the major uh, major uh, things available from most of the industry um, um, industries uh, uh, waste generated wastewater. So now um, if uh, we will go through the literature, in general, a variety of uh, techniques are available for the remediation purpose. So, um, but for the trace, uh, trace level uh, removal, like um, uh, if the concentration of that pollutant is only on, of the order of nanograms per liter, or sometimes in uh, micrograms per liter, it is sometimes very, very uh, carcinogenic towards the human health. For example, if we were, if we will talk about the pharmaceutical contaminants, the uh, their level in water metrics is very very low, but they they create a very very harmful effect not only to the uh, to the humans but also our what um, uh, uh, water based uh, plants species also, and plus they are very very harmful towards the AMR and GMR. So with respect to that. Um, our major goal is to detect first these pollutants in a very low level, even till micrograms or nanograms per level. And second thing is their removal, even at the trace level. And the method which we generally 
Opt is a, a, a reusable material uh, that can be easily recoverable with a low cost and that provides a complete removal. So um, uh, in that way, the material which uh, we are using uh, for water remediation is uh, uh, metal oxide, metal-based nanoparticles, carbon-based nanocomposite, polymeric nanoparticles, as well as some head Hydro, uh, um, hybrid nanostructured material that includes like zinc oxide, titanium oxide, their composites, um, carbon-based material, activated carbons, graphene oxide, as well as um, uh, some biologically mediated materials like from algae or from some other materials and metal organic framework for adsorption as well as for the photocatalytic purpose uh, but today i have more focus towards um, the adsorption side adso uh, the carbon based adsorbent for the for the removal of contaminants from water so um, if we will uh, go uh, for the industrial purpose for the then we always have a demand that the high scale material production uh, with with a uh, low cost because once uh, um, we'll increase uh, the um, the quantity the cost will al always be increased second thing is um, uh, the material should be biocompatible because yes if we are going for the water treatment the material itself is non-toxic and after that um, because um, we have to reuse that it should be reusable on also so based on that uh, we have um, chosen some agriculture waste that is like sugarcane bagasse algae uh, watermelon range and uh, sawdust even sludge for the for the synthesis of of some adsorbent good adsorbent that can remove um remove the contaminants from water so um, come to the main part of the experimental work here um, as we all know that um, after covid from last two years everyone has uh, consumed a lot of um, um, medicines and uh, as a result um, our mat uh, water metrics uh, in water metrics uh, there is a threefold rise in the uh, pharmaceutical residues from last one and a half year so uh, though uh, the concentration if you will check it it's it's very low um, in water but they are very very dangerous to to the human beings based on that what we did we have uh, choose a, a, a nsaid that is from uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug uh, uh, the beauty of this drug is that that can be prescribed that can be taken by any human being or uh, for medical purpose even for veterinary purpose without the consultation of doctor that like diclofenac or like ibuprofen and uh, 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 only 30% of this drug is um, is uh, taken um, by uh, the, adsorbed by the humans, but in the rest, 70% is discreted out in the water matrix. As a result, its presence in the water matrix is very very high. So uh, to to adsorb that drug, to check the um, uh, adsorption of drug, the drug we have developed a material that uh, we we only choose a uh, water based algae. Um, and that is um, Clomidomonas, and this is the isolated species of that, and we have converted it to activated carbon. After that, uh, we have mixed this uh, material in iron oxide uh, nano rods. The purpose of using iron oxide uh, nano rods here is so that the material can be easily uh, separable. Uh, and uh, the purpose of taking activated carbon is it has a very good surface area. Now, um, uh, and it is a very low cost material. Uh, we can synthesize in bulks um, of this material. and. Uh, uh, after that, after mixing these two materials, uh, we have checked its um, uh, uh, SAM image um, surface morphology as well as apart from that, we have checked its surface area and XRD that confirms the successful formation of, of iron oxide activated carbon composite. This, this material we have synthesized using a simple hydrothermal route. 
then uh, we have checked its efficacy towards the the removal of um, uh, diclofenac in water uh, this experiment we have performed with uh, with a very low concentration to very high concentration uh, from around 10 ppm to 100 ppm uh, and the material shows a very good efficacy towards the the um, the adsorption of uh, dcf the ph we have optimized uh, is uh, has the value of 5 as we know that pH is a very important factor for pharmaceutical residues because it, uh, it totally depends its pK value and um, only uh, one gram per liter is sufficient for to remove that uh, water it from water as well as uh, the reusability of that material is around five cycles. One can easily separate out that material from water um, because it is a magnetic material. Uh, second work uh, which we had done is we had uh, we had again using algae we have synthesized some TiO2 nano particles and uh, we have prepared some mats of this by mixing it in a um, polyacrylonite nanofiber. PAM is a very uh, low cost uh, material, low cost um, uh, um, polymer, and but uh, though it is very good for water treatment application, but it's. Uh, um it's uh, compatibility with water with its lifetime is not so good to improve that we have mixed some tio2 nanoparticles on that and this tio2 nanoparticle is further synthesized using algae and um, we have checked uh, checked its efficacy for the removal of oil oily trace elements in marine life marine life mein, uh, we have a lot of um, oil traces so we have checked it and the material works very well for um, six cycles um, and it is able to treat uh, oil a variety of oil like um, chloroform petrol diesel uh, from water it is it can be easily uh, the material can be easily separable from water this is again another low cost material with a very good efficacy now uh, further uh, we have utilized the the material um, this activated carbon in that case we had synthesized by both the women's uh, by by um, using uh, sugarcane bakas as well as using uh, algae also and uh, we had mixed it in um, in uh, tetrapods, JDNO tetrapods, it is a tetrapodal kind of a structure. This is again a high yield material that can be scalable uh, for the industrial purpose. And um, we had used it uh, for the removal of a very um, dangerous component, which is widely present in almost all the water metrics is chromium. So we had used it for the removal of chromium-6 from water. And um, you can see the morphology, surface morphology of this composite, uh, the activated carbon and JDNO tetrapod uh, matrix. Uh, the material, the good part about that uh, material is, it is, uh, it is good for, um, even for a highly acidic condition. And though uh, sometimes what happen in industrial wastewater, the, the pH of the material is either highly uh, acidic or sometimes it is highly basic. So uh, it is uh, very difficult to sustain a nanomaterial under that condition. And we had checked it till pH 2. And uh, even at the pH 2, the adsorption efficiency is of 97%. This material um, has, we had checked it even um, after six months or after one year, its reusability, the material works very very well with uh, with a very low concentration of two gram per liter um, dose and uh, uh, and uh, the contact time is six hours and um, um, the concentration level we had to started from 10 ppm till uh, furthermore um, as um, initially i have told you that my major area aim is to remove the complete removal complete removal means even it is a, if it is under a very low concentration we can remove it um it from water this work uh, is the detail of that work is available in uh, our paper that is in chemical engineering general it is a, a highly cited paper from last one year and uh, uh, similar way, we had synthesized um, copper oxide geno tetrapod uh, composite. This we had used it for the for the adsorption of water from uh, textile industry. In that, uh, we had not only uh, removed the the 
the heavy metal apart from that we had uh, we had used it for the removal of for the adsorption of um, um uh, of um, uh, chromium 6 and the dyes so the material also showed a very uh, good efficacy of uh, only three cycles though but it's it's uh, it's uh, efficiency is around 98 percent and um, this is simply using solar right one can use that uh, for dyes and for heavy metal it, it works it works like a very good adsorbent uh you can find this detail of this material in materials today chemistry paper uh, as my major uh, area is uh, for the algal mediated adsorption so so uh, uh, if we are using a core not nor, normal algae a bare algae um, the efficiency is not um, is uh, uh, not very high so to improve the efficiency of algae what we did we have mixed some graphene oxide uh, material that again we have synthesized using waste and um, uh, what we did we have coupled our algae in graphene oxide and checked it for the for the removal of uh, textile dyes that is the industrial wastewater and uh, um, and uh, even which we have checked the it's uh, it's uh, by compatibility it's viability that whether the material is viable towards the towards the um, graphene oxide or not and uh, in that case uh, we have we we have generate uh, we have uh, um, use it for the dye removal apart from that whatever the material left out that is the adsorbent uh, we have used it for the lipid production that is for biodiesel production so in that case we have 100% uh, use of that material because um, um, what happens sometimes the the sludge is also very very uh, it is very very difficult for uh, that uh, to treat the sludge because sludge has again a full of toxicants so we have used it for the lipid production um, after after treatment of um, after treatment of that water and um, uh, this is a uh, the another work which we have used using algae and uh, you can refer that uh, work in our two papers it is in um, chemical engineering general where we have used it for the growth as well as for the dye degradation and the enhanced lipid production uh, then uh, coming forward um, some studies we have also done uh, using uh, textile sludge. Um, X less sludge is uh, is a, is one of the major challenge for the industrial fellows. So they it's very difficult for them to treat that sludge. So we have converted that sludge into activated carbon, not not activated carbon, sorry, biochar. And after biochar mixing it uh, in a biochar, we have we have prepared. Uh, hydrophobic uh, sponge kind of material uh, where we have mixed it in a PDMS matrix and um, after that uh, we have prepared a, um, a, a cubes of that um, um, that the biochar uh, we have embedded it in the sponge you can control the size of the sponge and uh, this is one of the very uh, low cost material with a very good efficiency towards the removal of oil traces in water and um, and the uh, second thing is uh, it can this material can uh, by by utilizing this uh, uh, by converting this um, sludge to the biochar actually we are we are uh, we are saving our agriculture land also because sludge is again itself is a biggest problem for um, uh, for the for the agriculture land it, it has a full of contaminants uh, toxic contaminants so and after that we have checked it for the for the removal of um, for the removal of uh, oil traces this is this is in a very minor uh, traces free oil which is present in the uh, marine life and we have uh, we have uh, removed that and we have checked its efficiency towards the removal of benzene towards the removal of diesel towards the removal of uh, kerosene petrol and tolin so um, uh, we have uh, done with a uh, variety of um, uh, different different oils and the material shows a very good efficiency towards all these oils with the um, with the um, reusable with, with the uh, reusability of till seven cycles so uh, this is available in um, in uh, environmental nanotechnology monitoring and management the details are available there 
Uh, so, um, in general, uh, in conclusion, I would like to uh, say that uh, the synthesis of nanomaterial, eco-friendly nanomaterial, in fact, using agriculture waste is a cost-effective and eco-friendly approach. And uh, um, this method, method is very well appropriate for the industrial uh, scale uh, production, you can say. Um, though sometimes the efficiency is not uh, till 100%, but yes, we can uh, we can uh, enhance the efficiency by, by mixing some other um, um, nanomaterials on that. And um, the, uh, uh, this material, this this technique is also viable in that way that the, it is the materials are not very very toxic. If they are synthesized using eco-friendly uh, route by uh, by compatible route, the materials um, cannot be very very toxic. Um, uh, the work which we have, I have showed it not uh, done alone by me, but it's a collaborative work. Um, from Amity side, I have a good uh, um, uh, um, uh, team members uh, with uh, uh, me. And uh, apart from that, I have a collaboration, a strong collaboration in with um, Southern Denmark, University of Southern Denmark, uh, University of Finland, IIT Kharagpur, as well as in KIT Germany. So um, with this, I thank the organizers once again uh, to provide me an opportunity to present my work here. And uh, I'm uh, happy uh, to answer the question, if any. Thank you, Monica, madam, for your nice presentation. Thank you so much, sir. I think I have completed within a time frame. Yeah, you have. Yes, sir. Now the seminar is open for discussion. Any question? Very yes. Ma'am, I have a query. Yes, sir. So. What is the temperature you use for conversion of algae to activated carbon? Uh, okay, uh, so that is uh, 550 degrees centigrade. And what is the yield? Uh, sir, the yield ratio totally depends on the 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 purity of that algae, and um, that how much the algae uh, is uh, pure. Uh, it is around um, uh, two third of the material that you are using. This is raw. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. okay. Any other question? If not, we once again thank you, Monica, madam, for her thank nice you. presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Next, we have another talk by Koshal Kumar. Dr. Kumar, are you here? Koshal Kumar, are you here? We will be presenting on up conversion emission in nanophosphorus, nanophosphorus and its application. He is from IIT Dhanbad, Department of Physics. I request Koshal Kumar to stop. Sir.
you are not audible dr kumar you are not audible Hello, sir. Are you present? Kaushal, uh, sir. Can you present now, Dr. Kumar? Hello, Kaushal sir. Uh, can you present right now? I am connecting from mobile phone. Okay, we cannot. Uh, it's, uh, the sound is not clear. Hello. 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 Are you, sir? Are you, sir? sir. Are you hearing my voice? Yes, sir. Uh, can you mute on your laptop? Otherwise, it will be. Yes, sir. I have. There will be an echo. Yeah, yes. I have connected through mobile phone actually. My laptop is not working. Not uh, showing the any voice. Yeah. Okay. We can. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you present? From the laptop. Okay. Okay. So let's hear.
So, good afternoon, good afternoon to, everyone. to everyone. So, myself, Dr. Kapoor Kumar, I am a Dr. Kapoor Kumar, of Northern Mission in Nano Pharmacopar Sample Applications. मोबाइल अनम्यूट एंड प्लीज म्यूट योर लैपटॉप I have muted my laptop. It's okay, sir. Oh, now it's okay. Okay. So there are three images that are shown on the screen, and these three images are showing green emissions. This green emission has caused infrared excitation, and the beauty of these three images is that there is no background. So this is the beauty, and I will discuss later. So first we will explain what is the Applications of rare earth in photoluminescence. So the rare earth can be used in photoluminescence in variety of applications. Some of the applications I have written here. So they are used used in LCD displays, light lighting, uh, like CFL LEDs in lasers, medical bioimaging and therapy, forensic science as a security in and etc. Night viewing devices and also in fiber communication. So all these applications are the luminescent properties are the डे So that tells the uh, uh, sorry uh, 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 potential of the rare earth in photoluminescence and as well as in other ions. So let us see one example of a photoluminescence device that is generally we use. This is a fluorescent lamp, and this is a small one known as compact fluorescent lamp. So if we broke this CFL, this is made up of a glass tube. So, if we broke it, then we see that the inner side of the tube is coated with a white material. So, if we see the composition of this white material, we found that in first generation it was zinc beryllium silicate. So, nowadays our CFL or uh, tube lights are in second and third generation. So, in second generation we see that this is calcium phosphate, and there are some small amounts of Sb and Mn three plus. There are three triply ionized ions. Inside the this is the post material. So if we see the composition and if we excite them with a mercury lamp, so we see one spectrum. So the spectrum is shown in the right hand side. So these uh, star lines are associated with the mercury emission that is inside the tube light. But we see that there is a blue emission in here. So this blue emission can be assigned to the antimony Sb and This broad hump can be assigned to Mn3+. So, if you combine emission from these two ions, it gives a white color. So that is why the CFL and tube lights giving a white light. So this combination is known as combination of blue light plus yellow light, and it will give a white light. But the problem with this combination is that the color purity is not so accurate. So that is why we have seen the third generation of phosphors. There are three types of compounds were used. One is the beryllium magnesium aluminate, doped with europium three plus. Another one is lanthanum phosphate, doped with Pb three plus. And last one is tritium oxide, doped with europium three plus. So there are three phosphors. They are combined to each other to produce a white light. So if we see the spectrum of this three phosphors, it is seen in this middle graph. So the blue blue one emission, this broad one, it is coming from europium two plus. The terbium three plus gives very intense green emission, but it is very sharp. You can sharp you see the sharpness of the terbium emission. Also europium three plus, it gives emission in red region. 
but the property is there it is also giving a sharp impression so now we can combine red green and blue to produce a white light so the white light produced by these three colors have more purity compared to the combination of blue and yellow so nowadays mercury is uh, supposed to harm our environment so that is why mercury is now replaced with gallium uh, nitride in white light leds so nowadays in leds we have gallium nitride plus phosphor so what we see that what is the phosphor so phosphor is nothing but is a compound and that contain in interestingly dope some rare earth ions here we have seen one example that is lanthanum phosphate and then terbium 3 plus inside the lanthanum phosphate host so this composition lanthanum phosphate is 99% and terbium contains only are less than 1% so this type of composition we call phosphor and when we excite with uv light they can give emission in visible region so if we see the lanthanum the rare earth series so lanthanum is placed in column third we are the periodic table so the series is lanthanum series starts from element lanthanum and ends with terbium ion it sorry it is a element so this is this is the f block element so the f block element f orbit starts from lanthanum and ends with terbium so there are protein elements but when these elements are doped into a host material so generally they take three plus ion state so lanthanum would uh, lose three electrons it converts into lh3 plus so lh3 plus does not have any uh, f orbit electron so this is optically inactive so it, it does not show any luminescence so luminescence we have starting from cerium to ytterbium because ytterbium also loses three electrons so now f orbit is partially filled and promethium is found to be radio radioactive so it is not using then other luminescence so we have 12 ions and many of these ions also possess 2 plus and 4 plus state except three generally three plus state so we have lots of combinations of these ions which gives luminescence so from these rare ions we can give luminescence so if we compare the luminescence from these ions to other popular luminescence device uh, so sources so if we compare the organic molecule like rhodamine so if we see that the emission spectrum of rhodamine it is quite dark so in visible region we can hold, have only one band and also there is a small shift from excitation to emission bandwidth next we if we see the quantum dots the semiconductor quantum dots emission is sharper than the uh, organic molecules but it is still broad so in visible region we can have more uh, one or two not more than this but their emission wavelength is size dependent so if we have different size emission wavelength will shift now if we see the emission from the rare ions so this emission is found to be host independent so if we do a single rare ion to different host the emission wavelength remains almost same but intensity may vary and also the emission from rare ions is very very sharp so in this graph in this spectrum there are very emission, uh, many emission bands from 300 to 700 nanometer so that is the beauty of rare ions they give atomic line emission lines and in visible region we have many emission bands so have large selection of emission band so that is the beauty so if we see the electronic structure of rare ions so lanthanum so this is the lanthanum element so filling is given by this so here is a 4f ion and then outer are 5s2 5p6 and 6s2 so these are complete filled so when this lanthanum goes to a host ion host, host material the 4f ion loses one electron and two electrons from 6s outer 6s3 remove so now we have configuration like this so we have 4f and minus 1 that is optically partially filled so if we have any partially filled orbit so it can so optical activity so that is why we are getting emission from 4f to 4f transition but this 4f orbit is shielded by outer field 5s to 5p6 
So these are outer two arenes are completely filled. So they are sealed from the outer crystal filtration, and that is why the emission bandwidth does not vary when we go to different holes. So if we write the Hamiltonian of the resonance, it can be written like this. So it is H core, H electron, electron, and spin orbit, and then the last arm is H crystal field. So when a ion is doped in, inside a, uh, inside a host material, so the H crystal field comes from there, and this splitting is order of 10 power to 10 inverse. So it, the splitting of due to the crystal field is quite low, but it affects the transition probability. So if we see the energy uh, general energy levels of a here example of iridium shown here in visible region. So we can see that there are lots of energy levels starting from ground level to so many levels. So we, if we decide to have levels, we get emission from different bandwidths. So here the effect of over a perfusion electron so the person and the coupling is new and compared with the in organic molecule. So here in case of rare times, energy levels are quite soft compared to the energy levels of the organic molecule because of the there are so many lots of vibration levels. So that is the beauty. So what happens if we do rare times into a host material? So after doping, if we excite a material through a photon, so the only photon uh, electrons in the down state. So after excitation, the atom from ground state goes to excited state, and from the excited state they come down to ground state. But there are two ways: one is the radiative emission, another is the non-radiative emission. So in the radiative emission, light is emitted, so the because this is photon emission. But some part of the energy is also converted to the non-radiative condition, and we can say this emission of the photon, and these are not nothing but they give heat to the system. So in order to get a higher emission, emission or higher quantum yield, this non radiative transition has to be minimized. So that is the part of the search, how to minimize. So how can we minimize this non radiative transition? So if we look the frequency of the theater, so if we do the ion in, inside the host here, so this ion is bounded to per millimeter of the host and this bond can vibrate. Frequency can be given by this formula on F where F is the bond strength and M is the reduced mass. So if we F bond strength is lower and we have a lower frequency, so that is why we select such a host which has a lower covalency, a lower bond strength. And we select the reduced mass or mass of the light is which has which is higher. So that new can be minimized. So there are the two parameters through which we can play with the phonon frequency to get the emission. So this phonon frequency matters a lot for a conversion emission. So here some materials are given with their phonon vibrations. So borate, phosphate, and silicate, their phonon frequency is around 1400, 1100. So this is quite high. So these holes are not suitable for a conversion, but these are suitable for a downshifting or down combination. So, but uh, later one, germanium to iodide, the phonon frequency is quite low. So if you are going to lower phonon frequency, we will get higher quantum yield and less non-additive transitions. So this is the part of the search, and that is why different force are using to get a higher quantum gain for a fast quantity. So now we can explain what is the frequency of conversion emission in rare ions. So if we excite a material through a can put on to have a pH new one, so it excites to atoms from ground state to that level. From there they relate to lower level and from there they emit to the ground level by emitting a frequency of new two. And generally, this new two frequency is lower than the incident photon frequency, and that is the normal process where we are normally seeing in normal life. That is the down shifting or down conversion emission. But if we have a condition, if we have a metastable type of levels, 
अभी एक्साइट ना वैसा मेरे लेस तो है वन लेवल तो जी मेटा स्टेबल ही करेगा तो लाइफ टाइम में ना तो था मिली सेकेंड तो व्हाट विल हैपन तो दे विल एक्यूमेट लार्ज नंबर ऑफ एटम्स इन सच ए लेवल एंड दिस एटम्स आर ए ट्रांस देन फर्दर इन एब जॉब देन फोटन एंड गो टू फर्दर हायर लेवल एंड फ्रॉम देयर फ्रॉम देयर दे विल लिमिट डाउन लेवल बाय इंटिंग ए फ्रीक्वेंसी न्यूक्लियस व्हिच इज हायर देन दी एक्सटेंड फ्रीक्वेंसी एंड दिस प्रोसेस वी कॉल दिस इज दी अप कन्वर्जन एफ फ्रीक्वेंसी एफ कन्वर्जन प्रोसेस एंड दिस फ्रीक्वेंसी अप कन्वर्जन प्रोसेस इज दी प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ रेयर ट्रांसफॉर्मर बिकॉज़ बिकॉज़ दे हैव ओरस ओरस ट्रांजिशन दे आर पार्टिकली फर्बिडन एंड बिकॉज ऑफ दिस पार्टिकली फर्बिडननेस दे आर लाइफ टाइम आर इन मिलीसेकंड रीजन एंड दैट इज व्हाई दे एक्यूमेट लार्ज नंबर ऑफ ऑपरेशन एंड एबल टू एब्जॉर्ब फर्दर प्रोटॉन्स so if you compare here in the right hand side one example is given borium and yb c plus so this ion is excited with 90 nanometer so if you see the excitation this is in right hand side but normally it passes on left hand side around yb region but here it is higher excitation 980 excited and we are getting emission from 350 to 700 So largest one intensity is found around 500 nanometer. So we can say there is a large shift from 900 to 500. So around 300 to uh, 400 nanometer shift. So that is the beauty of the conversion. So we can grab the advantage of a conversion over the down shifting emission. So first uh, property is that the conversion can be get through inside excitation. And when we use inside excitation, then we have advantage that we can use this excitation for biological applications. Because UV excitation or light emission excitation cells can be damaged for biological samples, so they are not suitable. But NIR emission is equally suitable. Nanometer nanometer is found as per for the biological samples. And then second one is the large stroke shift. Yeah, I have given example here from 90 to 500. So the large stroke is there is no interference between the excitation and emission wavelength, and then there is no background emission also because this is property of red ions only. So if we excite these ions, we will get no emission from background because they do not contain red ions, so they are not able to get emission. So at most we get zero background. That's why I have shown in the first slide. and then photostable so these nanomaterials are inorganic so they are photostable compared to organic or not blinking in the same mechanism so these are the advantage of the absorption that is why they are used in balance collecting or balance collecting so uh, how emission process occurs in a resonance there is one example here here and yb so yb here is used as a sensitizer which actually absorbs 980 nanometer and then transfer energy to the cerebrum ion through various channels and it, it, it excites up to uv region so we are getting emission from starting from 521 to uh, 492 to 500 to transfer the ion blue and green emission so we can get many emission through energy transfer so if you see the power dependence of the emission process we see that this is Look like a non-linear process. So here we found uh, from this intensity is proportional to energy power of the pump photon. So the value of n gives how the photon is involved. So if you found the slope, then we found the slope is around 1.45 or 1.34. So it looks like a non-linear process, but it is quite different from the second atomic generation or non-linear. So this no relation with the non-linear of the material, but It shows a two photon or four photon depending upon the number of photons involved. So now come to the application part of this. So after the process I have defined, then come to the application. So first application of the nanoparticle and nanoparticles. If we prepare this uh, phosphorin, nanoparticle size we can call it using NPI or other nanoparticles. So these can be used for a photothermal reaction. So here one example is the hydrogen, lens and mark hydrogen, hydrogen YB. So we excite this phosphor with an air laser. So we can achieve a temperature higher than 500 Kelvin, which is too high. 
So per quarter sum therapy, actually we need a 43 or 45 centigrade because of the cell, but it is quite high. So it is used as a localized heater to generate a temperature. Also nanoparticle size is a large response from the cooling, so it can produce large, so if we need to decrease the size, then we have large response from the cooling and we need the heat production. So this property is used in photochromal treatment. So here one less than one size level given here. So if you excite, why we excite? By 100 nanometer. And uh, even sir, if I do you, you please wrap up. Hello? You please conclude, sir. You please okay. wrap up. Uh, okay. So if so, in the experiment, so that it can generate up to 750 degrees centigrade. And another application is that uh, UCNP can be used in OCT after the forest tomography imaging. So this is uh, preparation is, and these are some same and same images are prepared. So the collider nanoparticles were prepared through the combustion uh, through thermal recombination techniques. And this phosphor uh, collider particles were used to get the tissue imaging uh, chicken tissue image. This is the chicken tissue image through OCT. So if we compare this is control, the no application of nanoparticles and just two are the with application of nanoparticles. So we can see that there is improvement in the contrast. So application of nanoparticles in OCTM being can increase the contrast. So we can also see in this left hand, right hand side graph. Also signal to noise ratio when it's happening coaching for the pound to increase with use of nanoparticles in OCTM being. Other application are petty OCT, photothermal OCT, after the also, they can use in temperature sensing, they can sense temperature for volatile environment. And lastly, UCNPs can be used as a hard fingerprint detection. So, here one fingerprint was made on glass light, so it varies with infrared radiation. And it gives the insulin green radiation. So, but there is no background. So, there are some other fingerprints are shown in green color, they are transmission. And this thing, uh, cyan color is true. Use are the Kamarka nanopartners. This is down shifting. So if you compare the down shifting, the upper nanopartners can give higher contrast. So that is the duty. They can also to produce ink. So the ink was prepared for nanoparticles to bind into ink jet printer and was printed on a pen paper which is in white color. But when we sign the color in our edition, we can get the image. Thank you. Thank you, Koshal Kumarji, for your nice presentation. Now, the seminar is open for discussion. Any question and query is welcome. No query. If there is no query, we once again thank you, Koshal Kumarji, for this. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now over. Uh, thank you, Professor Alexia Alexia Borkumar, for sharing the session. Uh, thank you, Professor Kaushal Kumar. It was a nice presentation. Uh, now we are moving to a single short invited lecture. That is Mr. Manoj Rawla. Uh, he's from the Department of Amity Institute of Applied Science, Amity University. And his uh, topic is Tunable Redox Active Inorganic Cluster Anionic Cotted Antacid Titanium Dioxide Nanoparticle with a tunable reactivity towards water splitting. Uh, uh, is my slide visible? Ah, uh, yes, uh, it's visible. We can start. Uh, Okay, uh, I am Dr. Manoj Rawla, working as uh, assistant professor Department of Chemistry, uh, Amity University, Noida. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, of the conference, International Online Conference on Nanomaterials. So today I, I am going to discuss a little bit about the how the redox activity of the lichens, uh, which is being, uh, you can put on the nanomaterial surface, especially suppose TiO2. 
and the, thereby by you can tune the redox activity of the whole composite material and how that will affect the water splitting uh, characteristics okay so uh, uh, these things are very introductory slide uh, like uh, all of us know how the energy is important and uh, day by day we are uh, we are consuming much more energy like if you compare 1971 to 2017 uh, within just a uh, few uh, 30 40 years we have uh, energy consumption have increased almost more than uh, double almost 2.5 times so these things all uh, all uh, all of us already know and uh, most of this energy although is coming from the petroleum or petroleum uh, products uh, and also natural gas and natural gases. Uh, but uh, day by day, we have to think of a renewable energy uh, because those, uh, those uh, uh, um, uh, like uh, petroleum ores are, uh, is actually day by day, we are, uh, we, uh, we are uh, getting shortage of this uh, uh, petroleum ores. And uh, as you know, the petrol and diesel prices are going up, up uh, each and every day. So, uh, uh, so uh, renewable energy, as you know, the renewable energy is becoming more popular with time. And uh, but uh, but now most of the renewable energy coming mostly around 43 percent of the renewable energy is coming mostly from the biomasses. Uh, but uh, but still uh, that solar energy uh, is uh, can be a very big chunk of almost 10 percent. And uh, with time, uh, uh, like government is also investing a lot to increase the uh, uh, to harvest more from the solar energy. And, and its applications and uh, uh, why people are thinking on the solar energy because uh, sun is a unlimited source of energy so if you can if you can harvest from the sun you will uh, you will be able to uh, solve a very big problem which uh, currently the mankind is experiencing so when i whenever i'm saying about the solar energy mostly people are using the uh, uh, the uh, the way which is being uh, which is being uh, given over here that uh, the uh, sun rays uh, in the photovoltaic cells they are converted directly to the electricity but uh, here we will think about a way by which we can use the solar fuels means the hydrogen and oxygen and convert uh, like we will con uh, will uh, preserve the solar energy in terms of the chemical energy and uh, wherever we need we can use it uh, so uh, like this is uh, also you know that solar electricity is like uh, in which photovoltaic cells uh, that crystalline silicons are being used to to produce the electricity but this is not we are not going in this way we will go to the next way what uh, nature has taught us uh, like the uh, like uh, uh, like the generation of oxygen during the uh, photosynthesis okay but here we are con uh, we are uh, focusing our study on the artificial photosynthesis means we'll take water and we'll try to split it into hydrogen and oxygen okay and uh, this is uh, like uh, people are also working on the uh, like uh, in fuel cells uh, and uh, generation of the fuel cells but here in our study we will mainly concentrate on the photolysis of water to produce either hydrogen or oxygen or both okay so uh, for the photolysis of water the catalyst is being used they have a big role uh, that uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, for the uh, for the decreasing in the activation energy for the water splitting reactions. So uh, uh, so we need to use we need to use uh, we need to choose uh, we need to choose the photocatalyst in such a way that they will fall. Their band gap should be more than 1.23 electron volt because this is this is the minimum energy required for the splitting of the water and also the band edge potential. This is this is called the band edge potential for the water splitting. They should be well uh, uh, well uh, above this uh, this limits. So if you see this uh, um, this in a uh, band energy diagram so there you can see that all these all these uh, nanoparticles uh, all these uh, semiconductors are well and good enough for the water splitting so here for the time being we are we are focusing our study on the tio2 tio2 nanoparticles and uh, and i will see how the ligands can be a good uh, uh, 
ligand can be a good material for tuning the photocatalytic uh, tuning the uh, tuning the reactivity of the uh, uh, TiO2 uh, photocatalyst. Okay, so here uh, during my study, that uh, cryogenic TEM have actually played a big role uh, uh, in my uh, in my study. Uh, I'll gradually I'm going to going to tell you, and uh, all of you know about the cryogenic TEM technique um, uh, because in 2017 these three people got the Nobel Prize, but for a uh, applications of the cryogenic TEM in the protein study three-dimensional protein structure studies. So anyway, we are, we'll, we are going to use the cryogenic TM technique for the study of the inorganic materials, which, in, which is being covered on the nanoparticle surfaces. So as you, uh, 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 this is another introductory slide, which, uh, which is also very, very important. As you know, to for the stabilization of the nanoparticles, uh, we usually uh, we, we usually uh, like uh, you can use the concepts of the uh, like stabilization of the nanoparticles in the solutions by the stabilization or by the so most of the people use this steric stabilization process like using the long chain uh, long chain thiols polymers uh, etc uh, for the uh, for the stabilization of the nanoparticles but there are very few people who use the electrostatic stabilization technique for the stability of the nanoparticle and we are one of them and uh, for that we will use polyoxo metal a special kind of material which is called the molecular transition metal oxides they are popularly known as the polyoxo metal they are being prepared using uh, uh, mostly using these three element of the periodic table like vanadium molybdenum and tungsten and they are actually very very uh, very very um, interesting materials because they are stable uh, in wide pH range, they are inexpensive, non-toxic, and uh, can, can, and versatile in their properties. Another important is the uh, uh, Aja. This is uh, this is the uh, POM actually first synthesis synthesized in 1822-26. But at that time, people have not able to characterize it properly. Uh, uh, yeah, it is it is in 1934. James Tegin was the first uh, who gave the crystal structure of the. Uh, the uh, ammonium phosphomolybdate and uh, and uh, for uh, just to give uh, and uh, and these structures of the POM are being uh, known uh, as the Kagan structure given in, uh, on his name. Uh, but here, what we will do, we will we will prepare. A, this is a Kagan type structures, and in the Kagan type structure, what we will do, we will uh, will take out take out one tungsten oxide unit from the surfaces and so there will be an lacunary lacunary on the structures and this lacunary we are going to use for the synthesis of our nanomaterials but why we are concerned about this kind of uh, polyoxometallate because most one of the most important characteristics of the pm are the they are redox active in nature so so uh, so, um, so your nanoparticle, which is uh, um, uh, which is photoactive and uh, it has the redox activity as well. So, what you can do, you can combine with the POMs to tune its photoreactivity. Okay, and also like uh, like uh, another another important uh, another important characteristics of the Kagan's is that you they can absorb they can they can they can be used as an electron sponge like they can absorb lots of electron they can stabilize because of this molybdenum or tungsten moieties so uh, there are different types of kegins we have used uh, for these studies like kegin kegin Ols dawson fresler type of molecules and this is a uh, uh, this is one of the very very famous uh, famous tm graph in which uh, the ligands even even uh, even the ligands can be can be seen on the gold nanoparticle surface. So these are the ligands. These are the molecular POM ligands, uh, Al tungsten 11, uh, and on on top of the uh, on top of the gold nanoparticle surface. This is the three-dimensional model for your visual visualization, which is being published uh, way back in 2008. So same concept we are being uh, uh, we are uh, yeah yeah. This is another examples in which the Pressler ion can be seen on the gold nanoparticle surface. The same concept will be used uh, uh, for the synthesis of the hybrid TiO2-POM hybrid nanostructures because 
if you prepare such kind of hybrid nanostructures they will uh, they will act as an active site on the ti to surface and also the electron reservoir and facilitate the hydrogen generation water splitting and hydrogen generation so while doing so we we have prepared prepared one uh, we have uh, uh, prepared uh, uh prepared uh and material which is a very very new to the society which is called the molecular hybrid materials and the, these poms are being uh, are being attached with the tio to surface on the tio to surface by mu1 oxo or mu2 oxo uh, uh, oxo linkages which is we have published in 2015 in anguranth uh, so this is the paper and uh, so i will show you how how the POMs are covalently attached on the TiO2 surfaces. So this is the typical synthesis in which uh, the synthesis uh, process is very, very simple. We have taken titanium isopropoxide in presence of the POM solution, lacunary POM solution, and look at it at 170 degrees centigrade for 20 hours. We got a clear solution. This is this is a uh, this is a uh, anatase nanocrystal dispersed material uh, from the DLS study. You can see this, and what we have done, we have the was this uh, was this material to uh, take out the unreacted species by the precipitations and redispersion process. So if if we continue for three four times, still we are able to get a completely clear solution, which is quite amazing and even after four times of washing uh, the uh, the increase uh, the aggregations are not so high and uh, we have characterized the nanoparticles uh, using uh, the conventional tm study uh, in which they show the crystalline structures and also the uh, diffractions uh, uh, using a device share equation we got the crystalline size around six nanometers and also uh, also the particle size we have calculated from the tm which is also closer around 6.9 uh, 9 nanometers and uh, this is the this is the most beautiful thing uh, we from the cryo tm study we are able to get the poms on the ti to surface so you can uh, uh, you can very very clearly see the poms which is being present on the TIO2 surfaces. And uh, to support this, we have also done head of STF uh, element analysis. Here you can you can see the uh, the more brighter spot on the TIO2 surfaces are basically uh, uh, our POMs. So uh, we have done very, uh, very, uh, very small uh, area EDX, EDX uh, and there we got that these brighter spaces have more tungsten, uh, more tungsten than uh, than the uh, side areas. Okay, and uh, to uh, to prove the covalent uh, covalent attachment, what we have done after repeated washing, we have digested the material and then yes, done the uh, mass spectra and also the NMR spectra, and from there we have confirmed the uh, that the the pure yes, molecule. Sir. Hello. Sir, it's almost over ten minutes. It's already passed. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, so these are the uh, molecules. Uh, like we can, you can by changing the central metal atom, you can actually change the redox activity, and and by this you can see the hydrogen evolution. Different uh, uh, different uh, POMs giving you different hydrogens uh, evolutions, and I have we have studied the A as well, uh, and also uh yeah so this i would like to thank uh, uh, my mentors and also my students uh, and also funding from csir and acrv uh, for for conducting this study so thank you all uh, for listening uh, if you have any queries i'm happy to uh, answer So the lecture was very interesting. Thank you. So, uh, hello. Yes. So I just want to first of all thank you for the presentation. It's a very unique uh, synthesis. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, very unique. And uh, uh, so, um, where would such um, 
yes uh, it really tunes the properties such synthesis such nanoparticles really tunes the properties a lot but yes. where, which would be the um, application which really needs this material yeah that's a, one of the applications i told that water splitting you can tune the like uh, mm -hmm. uh, like the band gap of the hybrid materials okay and by this way you can see the activity of the hydrogen's uh, evolution how much is the like uh, like i'm not able to uh, tell you that like like when you change the central metal atom from phosphorus to silicon to aluminium uh, uh, and so what we are saying that as the redox activity changes its uh, amount of hydrogen produced is also changes so the like till now most of the people have concerned about the titanium core but nobody thought about the ligand how uh, how the ligand can also um, also tune or change the re reactivity of the material so this is this is where we concentrated our study and uh, and actually we are we are we published uh, a good number of papers and very good like three and gangrene they came to nature materials we have published already in this uh, in this field uh, so yeah this is that, that's really yeah. great, sir. That's a great achievement, sir. Uh, the cryotem part also was very interesting. First time I've seen such a thing, ligand is also... Yeah, yeah. The cryotems are really, really very nice, actually. So that must be very one of your papers, right? This uh, something... Yeah, yes, yes, yes. This Anguante uh, uh, paper and uh, the Nature Communications paper, yeah. we have all these uh, publications. Okay. I'll get in touch with you, sir, if I need some help. Sure, sure, sure. Thank sure. you. Always, always. Yeah, I'm working on drug delivery and Parkinson catalysis also. Nano catalysis and all. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Always welcome. You can. Yeah, talk. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next, thank we are you. moving to another topic that is MOF and emulsions. Uh, so, for this section, I invite Dr. Sonal Aitaku, the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, the MS University of Baroda, Baroda, India, uh, to share. None we can take. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for uh, welcoming me. Uh, so uh, the sessions are going on very nicely, uh, nicely organized. And thank you, organizers, for uh, giving me this opportunity. So moving on to the uh, sessions, uh, I would like to call uh, uh, the presenter for IEL 113, uh, Dr. S. V. Prabhakar Vatikuti from School of Me Mechanical Engineering. Are you there here? From South Korea. Are you here, Dr. Prabhakar? It seems like it is not here right now. Yeah, it looks to me also. Yeah, I cannot see in the participants. And you can call at your the next person. Yeah, I'll call. Okay, so we have one one IL one one four. Uh, Ma'am, you said he is not there, right? Doctor Arun Kumar T. Uh, no, no, he will not be there. Yeah, no, we can't. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So then we'll have to move on the next session. That is uh, uh, IL one one five. Doctor Geetu. Yeah, I'm here. From Kerala. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll have a presentation from Dr. Geetu uh, from Kerala, India. Her presentation is on influence of temperature on the structural property of ionic liquid microemulsions. She is in NIT, I guess. Yeah. Please proceed, madam. Yeah. Yeah, is my presentation visible? Hello? It's it's getting presented, don't worry. Yeah. Now full screen mode is needed. Uh, it can be seen. Uh, yeah, full please. screen mode, please. Yeah. Uh, not yet, ma'am. Now is it 
coming no uh, you have to uh, share the entire screen okay select the option of share the entire screen Um, yeah, I think. Okay, in that mode, if you can move the slides, it will be fine. Okay. In that same mode, if you can move the slide, it should be fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, is it visible now? Uh, no. It's not no, it's not. Okay, now? No, ma'am, as soon as it will be visible, I'll tell you. But again, you do it the same way you did earlier. Okay. Uh, so can you just move the slides? Are they moving? Just go to the next slide. In this yeah. mode, that is a problem. The slides won't move. Yeah. What to do? The organizers. Uh, Huh? Uh, it's not moving actually. No, the slides are not moving on the screen. That's what happens when you don't do it on full screen mode. So you can mail the presentation to them in that case. Yeah. yeah I have already mailed. Mail. Yeah, I, okay, I okay. have. Okay, okay. Then they will present. Mm -hmm. To which okay. address? Is it seminar at ng.ac Robin? That mail address? You have sent? Uh, no, I have sent to the nano, uh, nano, nano materials. Dr. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I just wanted to confirm that Dr. Gidi is uh, doing the presentation or not. If not, uh, maybe we'll call the next person. Yeah, her presentation is ready now. No problem. It's fine. Okay, it's okay, fine. Then yeah. I can present. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, Dr. Gidu, can you please uh, try moving the... Okay. Presentation. Go the screen does, the slides don't move, madam. It's I think moving. that's what you tried earlier. Do it, okay, try. okay. Can you, can you, Gidu, can you please check your internet and come back, and so that we can, uh, we can call the next participant or. Okay, Doctor. Prab yeah, is Doctor Prabha over there, or uh, or do you want? Uh, you have shared the entire screen. Yes. Yeah. You have shared the entire screen. Maybe yes, there is some yeah. connectivity issue, or if you you can just save as a PDF. By the time we have the next presenter presentation, you can save as a PDF and try that also. Okay, okay. Is mm -hmm. Prabhav, is Dr. Prabhavati over there? Has she joined? Oh. Hello. Uh, Dr. Sonal, uh, can can you please call IEL uh, SIL hundred and thirteen? One one three once again. Yeah, SIL hundred and thirteen one one three. Yeah, Prabhakar, na Dr. Prabhakar. Dr. Prabhakar, are you there? Hello. 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 Yeah. Dr. Prabhakar, are you there? No, I don't see him in the participants itself, madam. The participant list is not there. Yeah, she said she's joining and uh, it is uh, Prabha. Is she Prabha? Hello. Please present now. Can you hear me, ma'am? Okay, okay, it's you. Okay. Yeah, 113, IL 113. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you? Okay, I'll introduce you. You can uh, start your presentation meanwhile. Is she, ma'am? Okay, so that I, I, so we have here now. Dr. I, I, Dr. I, Dr. Sonal Thakur, can you please confirm her that she is IL, uh, SIL one one three? Yeah. Okay. Madam, can, are you one one uh, one one three? Uh, can you tell me which place you are from? I'm from Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu. Velu, Velu. VIT University. Yes. Yes. So she's the same. Yeah. But here we have. Uh, uh, your title, please. Your title, please. Ma your title, can you tell me? Echoing. Uh, you have opened two devices, uh, Dr. Prabhavadi. Maybe you can just cancel one and then join. Okay. Yeah, the thing is, I'm asking you to the your title. Ma'am, here some other name is written. That's why. The title is Tin Nickel Biometallic Organic Framework, isn't it? Uh, she is, uh, she is uh, Dr. Sonal. It is S I L, short invited talk. Okay. As a lecture okay, okay. by Prabhavadi. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Then I'll have to see the program, ma'am. Actually, this was a screenshot uh, that I yeah. had with me. Sorry for the inconvenience. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'll just go back to the program. Is she sharing? Yes, ma'am. I can. Uh, shall I sh oh, start share? Yeah, please ma? share your presentation. Yeah, please do it. Please do it. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Prabhavati uh, doing a research under the guidance of Arun Dr. Arun Kumar Chandrasekhar in uh, School of Electronics Engineering, Velur VIT. And my topic, uh, my research area is nano sensors and nano generator. And the today's topic I'm going to present is the stationary materials for triboelectric nano generator. Tribo in, in the sense triboelectric nano generator and its self powered applications as theft alarm system. And the content of this topic is abstract introduction, design mechanism, and results and discussion, demonstration of proposed work, conclusion, features, and future work. And the work uh, starts with uh, the 
triboelectric nanogenerator. It is a self-powered energy harvesting device which can harvest energy by the uh, electro sorry by the mechanical uh, motion. From that motion, it will convert it to a uh, electrical energy with the help of the triboelectric materials and the train. Uh, 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 triboelectric material combined it will act as a nano generator and the, uh, it there are many application in that field one of the uh, application i'm focused is security purpose and the major drawback uh, in the security applications is uh, power consumption for the power consumption we go for a self power device which is uh, advantage in triboelectric nano generator field and the self power generator is this Tank was uh, uh, integrated with it. Uh, myself, I'm doing this uh, tank device for the self security application in the room, uh, which can be integrated with the table's draw. And for it will be helpful for security application when the someone or else a stranger comes and uses that table's draw. It will be in, instruct the instruct about the stranger to the uh, room owner or else uh, the people who is uh, belonging to that uh, room, and this thing will be fixed at the bottom of the drawer, which will work uh, in the thing uh, triboelectric nano generator. There are four working modes, which will be upcoming, uh, which will be in the upcoming slides. And in that four uh, modes, I'm using lateral sliding modes, and which which can uh, uh, harvest energy from the push pull actions of the uh, uh, tables draw the, uh, where the tank device is fixed beneath the draw and the electrical performance of the device was studied using this, uh, different sliding materials the materials uh, here i took pet nitrile and the paper and aluminium and kapton which which are all the easy uh, stationary materials we can call it as a stationary materials easily available in in day to day life and comparatively, though in uh, comparing those uh, sliding material, I got a uh, slightly above high uh, electrical performance from the nitrile sliding material, 3.2 volt and the 112.4 nano ampere. And um, by you help, by the help of Arduino and Node MCU, uh, we can instruct the uh, intruders or strangers to the uh, owner. At, at the night time, it will be very help, helpful for the uh, unknown behavior. Introduction about the triboelectric nano generator and this uh, tank will uh, works on the principle of contact electrification and the electrostatic induction. And this contact electrification we can see um, uh, we can see by combing uh, hair. We can see that the paper will be plugged uh, with the comb while keeping the comb in the small bits of papers that that concept is known as contact electrification or else triboelectrification tribo in the sense uh, rubbing the rub, uh, rubbing the two materials so uh, contact electrification will works on this principle and electrostatic induction will transfer the electrostatic induction is known as the transfer of electrons from one one material to another material so that we can collect the electricity and the advantage of advantage of this uh, field is material availability and material flexibility and easy of fabrication device and the compact in size and it will be low cost it, and the frequency of operation will be minimum and the gen, uh, it will generate the stable power uh, and there are many researchers working on this uh, area from the 2012 from the year of 2012 and combining different polarity of the material we can get a, a efficient output in this tank field there are four, uh, as i said before there are four working modes here we here we can see the four working modes among the four working modes i'm uh, concentrating on the lateral sliding modes mode uh, as a proposed work in lateral sliding mode when the top electrode sorry there will be a three layer one is uh, Aluminium electrode A and aluminium uh, electrode B in a lower layer. In between that, um, there will be a cap down, which is fixed above the uh, uh, aluminium electrodes. Uh, above that cap down, there will be a uh, contact sliding material, which will be any uh, kind of sliding material. Nitrile, I, uh, where I took as a nitrile paper pit. When we slide forward, uh, outward from the original position to the outward, we can get the positive half cycle that 
by by the help of uh, uh, transfer of charges from aluminum electrode b to aluminum electrode a the then there will be a positive charge uh, the same vice was a concept while the sliding out uh, inward to the original position there will be a negative uh, half cycle of the um, pulse so so that the once uh, full cycle we can, we can we can get it from there my device uh, my uh, fabrication of the devices first uh, i took electric uh, acrylic sheet for the dimension of 15 cross 5 and then the segmented sorry sorry and the segmented aluminium electrode is fixed above the acrylic acrylic sheet and then uh, the dimension of the acrylic segment is 4 cross 4 sorry 1.4 in there it is it was wrong 1.4 cross 4 1.5 centimeter cross uh, 4 centimeter and above that aluminium segment i, I kept the capped on uh, the uh, dimension of 15 cross 5 as it as it is in acrylic sheet the side uh, the side view of the uh, device is uh, shown in the fourth figure and the fabricated finally fabricated proposed design was kept in the fifth figure uh, i took one side uh, i assuming that one side of the draw in uh, with the fixed uh, device I, I i designed like this uh, at the end um, we can fix the whole combined with the uh, uh, draw by using this by compare uh, comparing paper nitrile sliding as a sliding material i got a, a voltage with a one point sorry one volt and 1.2 volt and then 1.5 volt like that uh, I got uh, by uh, in that comparison, I I, I get uh, much more if, uh, high with nitrile material by comparing uh, as uh, as it is nitrile material with um, different tapping uh, sorry with different sliding speed. I got like this slow, medium, and uh, fast sliding speed. And then at the third figure, uh, it's a it is a test of uh, testing of stability of the device with ten different days. And here the uh, discussion about the current. I got the current with uh, um, 0 0.1124 micro my, micro ampere. It, it, we can say it as a 112 nano uh, ampere. And zooming that uh, current signal with first uh, say uh, first um, first cycle, we can see that three pulses are there. Why I got like this means uh, by sliding with the six segments, I I, I kept the six segments in my device. For the six segment, it take it as a uh, three positive uh, aluminum electrode and three al negative aluminum electrode. So so that I can get three pulses like a uh, one three full cycles for sliding one time and slide for sliding backward. We I, I get another uh, uh, cycle and the third figure shows that the charging and discharging of a capacitor ca capacitance charging discharging with the 0.1 microfarad capacitor and the fourth one in that was a accumulated charge which is accumulated on the device by using the current um, signal and this is the demonstration of the device we can see that in first figure uh, the demonstration of a arduino device with the help of a node mcu we can see that led is glowing we can uh, so so that we can come to know about the strangers or there or else someone is using or else someone is um, uh, opening the draw so that we can uh, be alert and the second one shows that with before sliding and first one is uh, after sliding and the third one is led sorry third figure shows the L lcd showing that a uh, command and the fourth figure shows the LED uh, glowing with the sliding by harvesting energy using a sliding motion. At last, uh, finally, the theft alarm system was built with, which can harvest energy from the drawer's push pull action. The draw uh, tank was designed to avoid the theft by using the message uh, converted by, in, uh, by the help of Node MCU and uh, Arduino with the LED or else. Um, with the help of a message transferring from one uh, one device to another and so the device can help the catching else in catching the trans strangers for their mischievous behavior 
uh, by by a, by a mobile phone using Arduino buzzer sound like that. This can uh, this will be helpful. Sorry, this will be a uh, have the features like a uh, cost effective and biocompatible in nature. And it is um, it was a portable application such that the monitoring of someone's belongings and the device was comfortable to contact with skin. No, there will not be any uh, irritations or else there will not be any problem. And this work will uh, tries to tries to support the global goals of uh, for sustainable uh, development by the scavenging a, a mechanical energy from the mechanical motions. And the, and the last feature is fabrication of the device was very easy and the availability of the materials is also easy and the size of a comp, uh, uh, device, device is a compact. And the future work will be, uh, we can extend this uh, number of segments by extending the extending this number of segments, we can get more uh, voltage, um, more electrical performance and increase by changing the tri materials, we can get the efficient output and the reference of my work Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. And now it is open for discussion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. It's a very different uh, field that I have seen here, actually. Yes, I must, must say. And uh, uh, but is this uh, like uh, such devices are not available already? Yes, ma'am. It's a new one. Application is a new one, ma'am. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Prabha for yes, the very you. different type of uh, topic uh, introducing here. And uh, let's see, I hope you can do uh, really develop something commercial on this line. Isn't it? Yes, you already are saying it's cost effective. So maybe you can work harder and try to get something translational. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so if much. There are no more questions. Uh, what do we do, madam, next? Organizers? Uh, ma yeah, Gitu, yeah, uh, Dr. Gitu, are you ready? Yeah, are you ready? Yes. Try to present, please. Okay. Try to present. Is my uh, slides are visible? Is the slide, sir, visible? Yeah. No, ma'am. Uh, uh, okay. Have you no. sent the no. PPTs to MGU? At the, uh, I have, I have, I have already already email we just mentioned. Yeah, OK. Uh, now yeah. we can just present. OK, please wait. Okay. I, I will present. OK, thank you.
yeah shall i start yeah yeah please yes yeah so good afternoon to everyone first i would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work in this presentation i will be talking about the work which i have done during my phd at soft materials laboratory department of physics indian institute of technology madras so the title of the presentation is influence of temperature on the structural properties of ionic liquid microemulsions so in this talk first i will be discussing about what are ionic liquids and what are their importance and then i will talk about what are microemulsions and what are their and finally i will be talking about what are the influence of temperature on the structural properties of microemulsions prepared with ionic liquids so now coming to the introduction can i have the next slide slides are not moving uh, no slides are not moving uh, they are doing it right okay, okay yeah yeah they are doing okay yeah so here we have the introduction so ionic liquids are nothing but molten salts which consist of bulky organic anions paired with inorganic anions and will have a melting point less than 100 degrees celsius here the photo of the table salt nacl and an ionic liquid at 27 degrees celsius is shown as implied from the photo nacl is in the solid form and ionic liquid is in the liquid state at 27 degrees celsius so the ionic liquids why they are liquids at room temperature so ionic liquids are liquids because the liquid state is thermodynamically favorable due to the presence of bulky groups and due to their conformational flexibility which leads to small lattice enthalpies and large entropy changes that favor melting Now, a hundred years ago, a scientist named Paul Walden has investigated the ionic liquid ethyl ammonium nitrate, which is a hello, Gidu. Oh. And uh, so. yeah so coming back to the introduction uh, 100 years ago the scientist called paul walden has investigated the ionic liquid ethyl ammonium nitrate which is a yellowish liquid having a melting point of 12 degrees celsius and this is the first widely known ionic liquid so this happened 100 years ago and but still the ionic liquids are very uh, relevant topic uh, so can i have the next slide so ionic liquids are found in nature as well it has been reported that when two ants fight with each other they will produce a special substance which is an ionic liquid now let's see the characteristics of ionic liquids so uh, next slide yeah so as we said already ionic liquids are molten organic compounds which are liquid at room temperature and they have almost negligible vapor pressure they can be dissolved in water and can easily be recovered by evaporation they are usually non non flammable and they have very high ionic conductivity and very high thermal stability another important property is that the physico chemical characteristics of ionic liquids such as their polarity hydrophobicity and viscosity those properties can be determined based on the cationic and anionic constituents so uh, if we if we wisely choose the constituents we can de uh, design their solvents their solvent properties so they are known as designer solvents that is their properties can be tuned or designed accordingly by choosing the ionic constituents further due to the non volatility and reusability of ionic liquids they are also known as green solvents so these are some of the characteristics of ionic liquids so can we have the next slide yeah 
Now, since the properties of ionic liquids can be tuned to some extent, according to the requirements, they are used as solvents and additives in different chemical reactions. Further, they find applications in catalysis, electrochemistry, analysis, and also in green chemistry. So, uh, these are about ionic liquids. Now, let's move on to the next topic, which is actually microemulsion. So, the title, as the title was indicated, discussed about ionic liquids now let's see what are micro emulsions so micro emulsions uh, belong to the category of colloids they are thermodynamically stable liquid mixtures of water oil and surfactants here a photograph of a micro emulsion is shown uh, where uh, it is actually a clear transparent liquid now uh, there are different phases of uh, micro emulsions the main uh, the most important two phases are droplet phase and bicontinuous phase. So if we see a droplet phase, they are of two types. Whether uh, we can have uh, water droplets dispersed in the continuous oil medium and also the oil droplets dispersed in the continuous water medium. So uh, these are the two different types of droplet phase microemulsion. And then we will have a bicontinuous phase, which is actually consists of interdispersed oil and water nanodomains separated by flexible surfactant monolayers they are the bicontinuous phase now in this work i have investigated the droplet type microemulsion uh, so can we go to the next slide yeah so uh, here the droplet type typical droplet type microemulsion is shown which is prepared with water surfactant and oil so here the water droplets will be dispersed in the continuous oil medium and they will be stabilized by using the surfactant monolayer. The surfactant will have, surfactants are nothing but surface active agents. So they, they will have hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tail and then they will self assemble to form uh, uh, micro emulsion droplets. Now, uh, micro emulsions find different applications in our day to day life. We can see them as, um, in cosmetics, different food items, in medicine, uh, in as detergents, etc. So, uh, so far we find that, uh, yeah, so what are ionic liquids and what are micro emulsions and what are their significant, significance? So, uh, the aim of his present work, so can we go to the next slide? So, the what aim happened? of the present work to investigate the ionic liquid micro emulsions. So, uh, to investigate the influence of temperature on the structural properties of ionic liquid microemulsions with ionic liquid as a polar core. So this was the aim of our study. And then uh, the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So in this work, ionic liquid microemulsions are prepared with the ionic liquid 1-butyl-3-methyl-imidazolium tetrafluoroborate as the polar phase and triton X100 or TX100 as the surfactant and cyclohexane as the continuous oil phase. The chemical structure of the constituents which form the ionic liquid microemulsions are shown here. Now, next, in order to understand the influence of temperature on the dielectric properties of microemulsion, yeah, in the next slide, uh, we can see that we have performed dielectric relaxation spectroscopy experiments using a no control alpha N high resolution dielectric analyzer with active sample cell SEDGS as the test interface. Here, a temperature stability better than 0.1 Kelvin is achieved using no control quadro cryo system. So, the temperature stability is very precise. And a gold coated parallel plate capacitor with Teflon spacers was used as the sample cell for dielectric measurements. So, uh, uh, here the temperature control is achieved by uh, using purging nitrogen gas and uh, by measuring the impedance of the we will be measuring the impedance of the sample capacitor. So, from the impedance, we can get other parameters as uh, permittivity, uh, conductivity, etc. So, Z star is the impedance, complex impedance, and Z prime and Z double prime are the real and imaginary part of the impedance. Then we will get the complex permittivity and the complex conductivity. Yeah. So. Uh, that is the principle of dielectric relaxation spectroscopy. And in the next slide, we can see the photograph of a 
typical dielectric relaxation spectrometer which is there in our lab so here the frequency range is from uh, millihertz to 40 megahertz uh, it, it covers a wide frequency range and yeah then we can get the dielectric properties of the sample in this wide frequency range now the next slide so the variation of direct current electrical conductivity measured at 10 raised to 4 hertz as a function of temperature for a particular composition of ionic liquid microemulsion is shown here. As we can see from the plot, conductivity shows an increase with temperature and can be attributed to the percolation transition in ionic liquid microemulsion. So during percolation transition, the droplets of ionic liquid microemulsion come together and form droplet clusters and the ions can hop from one droplet to the other causing an increase in conductivity. So as we see here, there is a considerable increase in conductivity and we attribute this feature into the percolation transition in ionic liquid microemulsions. So uh, in the next slide, we can see that so this is the schematic representation of percolation transition where we have in the first phase, uh, first uh, part we have the droplet phase where the microemulsion droplets are dispersed in the continuous oil medium with increase in temperature these droplets come together and they form droplet clusters through which the ions can hop from one droplet to the other in that way it will increase the conductivity so this is a percolation transition model now next uh, in order to understand the structural properties, we have performed small angle neutron scattering investigations. So the temperature dependent measurements are performed using the SANS facility at the Dhruva reactor, Baba Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. So in SANS experiments, neutron beams are directed onto the sample. So we'll shoot the neutron beam into the sample and then measure the intensity of the angle. So by measuring the intensity of scattered neutron uh, we will get a sans profile and from the profile by modeling with suitable model the information about structure and interaction of the uh, microemulsion droplet or of the sample so in the next slide a photograph showing the sans instrument so uh, in the next slide we have a photograph showing the sans instrument at the dhruva reactor is given here so uh, one uh, yeah so this is the uh, sans instrument at, at the dhruva reactor baba atomic research center mumbai from there we have performed the experiments and yeah so uh, in the next slide we can see that how we are doing the uh, modeling so once we get the as a function of scattering angle which can be also represented in this way where the differential scattering cross section is uh, plotted as a function of the scattering wave ve scattering vector and by uh, using the suitable models we can fit the data and the general model is that uh, as we can see here the differential scattering cross section as a function of the scattering vector is given as phi v into rho p minus rho s whole square p of q s of q plus b so here uh, d sigma by d omega of u is the, the differential scattering cross section phi is the volume of scatterers and v is the volume of individual particles rho p minus rho s will be the contrast factor and p of q is the foam factor which is actually related to the structure of microemulsion droplets and s of q is the structure factor which is related to the interaction between droplets and uh, plus b which is the scattering background so by modeling with this general equation we can get uh, the different structural parameters and also we can get an idea about the interaction in uh, these kind of systems so this uh, i would like to mention that these micro emulsions are very small systems of few nanometers so uh, we cannot use any direct uh, technique like uh, microscopy or these are difficult there are some studies uh, they use the cryotem and such such kind of instruments but usually it is difficult to measure the properties uh, using microscopy so we have to go for the indirect techniques such as sands yeah and uh, the next slide so one of the uh, yeah 
in the next slide we can see that one of the main advantage of doing small angle neutron scattering experiments is the possibility of doing contrast matching so uh, we have x-ray scattering but uh, we can do small angle x-ray scattering that is also possible but one of the main advantages of neutron scattering is the possibility to obtain the contrast matching so as we all know that uh, the scattering length density of hydrogen and deuterium is very different because of that if you see here the first uh, first diagram shows that all the three components, the droplet core and then the surfactant molecules, all of them are seen. In the second picture, uh, the so we use uh, for preparing the so because of that, we have a polar core, which is hydrogenated, surfactant shell, which is hydrogenated, and it is dispersed in the continuous oil medium, which is deuterated. Because of that, we can exclusively get the scattering from the uh, microemulsion droplet, which is prepared with the ionic liquid. So for, because of that, yeah, by obtaining the scattering exclusively from these droplets, we can uh, determine the parameters precisely. That is the advantages of small angle neutron scattering. So in the next slide, yeah. Uh, so we have the scattering profiles here. So the differential scattering cross section as a function of scattering vector is plotted for uh, ionic liquid microemulsions at different temperatures ranging from 20 to 70 Celsius and is shown here. The SANS profiles are fitted with ellipsoidal core shell. Kindly wind up, madam. Uh, to yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are the scattering profiles, and we have modeled the uh, profiles using the ellipsoidal core Next slide. Yeah. So he here. Uh, the hard sphere radius obtained from the models are plotted as we can see here in the temperature with uh, increase in temperature it is not changing much so uh, i can conclude that yeah so i can conclude that this ionic liquid microemulsion they exhibit a percolation tran like transition uh, as implied from the dc conductivity measurements and then uh, as we can see from the small angle neutron scattering uh, the the uh, structural properties of microemulsions are not changing much with temperature. And this can be attributed to the fact that the electrostatic interaction between the ionic liquid in the core and the surfactant molecules at the interface is almost independent of temperature. That could be the reason that uh, it is not changing much. And yeah, with this, uh, I would like to thank. Uh, yeah, my supervisor, Dr. Dilip Kumar Sitabadi, for his help and support, and our collaborators from BARC, uh, Dr. Vinod Aswal and Dr. Indresh Yadav. So they helped us to perform the experiments and also for the fruitful discussion. And my friends from Soft Materials Laboratory. Yeah, thank you all for your kind attention. Okay, so I'll... okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so now, any questions? It's open for questions. Okay, I just wanted to know what is the advantage of this uh, incorporating ionic liquids in the microemulsion? Yeah, so usually microemulsions are prepared with water as the polar medium. So, uh, but some of the like water, we can't be able to solubilize these substances. But ionic liquids, they have more solubility. Uh, even continuous uh, oil instead of oil medium, we can use ionic liquid. So, we can solubilize more components, and that will be uh, interesting for the case of technological applications. So, that is one yeah, advantage. 
ओके फाइन थैंक यू एंड नाउ आई लाइक टू कॉल द नेक्स्ट स्पीकर नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटर सेमिनार एम जी यू कैन यू हेल्प मी यस मैम saumya di dunia uh, we have uh, the next session on nano rods <coughs> thank you ma'am for being the chair for the yeah. session also yeah 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 <laughs> i'll okay. yeah i'll try to continue i'll try to continue <coughs> so ma'am am i am i visible and audible clearly yeah yeah my slides are visible but i think right? full screen yeah full screen mode we have to do yeah yeah no yeah yeah it's clear yeah okay <clears throat> so good afternoon good afternoon to all of you uh, i am somodip bhuya and currently i am working as a postdoctoral fellow at iit gandhinagar in the nanoplasmonics laboratory and thank you uh, to isn 2022 for giving me the platform to present our work that i am working over here and the talk i am going to present now which is entitled like ph dependent flow sense enhancement of a stilbin derivative dye in the near field of plasmodic nanorods now what is surface plasma resonance you all know that collective oscillations of electrons conductive electrons in a nanostructure is basically known as surface plasma resonance uh, resonance now in case of gold nanorods since it's an anisotropic structure there are two types of oscillations or absorbance one is transverse oscillation which is occurs sidewise as you can see and another is longitudinal oscillation that means length wise so since the length of the nanorod is much more higher than the width so that's why the longitudinal oscillation which is uh, short, shortly abbreviated as lspr is much more than the transverse oscillation which is abbreviated as tspr now since these oscillations is much more higher according to the length of the nanorod so that's why they are uh, these forms a basically electromagnetic dipole i mean positive and negative charge and that's why the electromagnetic field is generated around the tiny surface uh, around the surface of the plasmodic nanorods and the electromagnetic field is much more higher than that of the corresponding nano particles so this is the advantage of gold nanorod that it uh, it forms a tiny electromagnetic region around his shape but the uh, field is much more higher to the tips as you can see from this structure why gold nano rod not other nano materials or other forms of nano uh, of gold you know, since it's comparatively easy to synthesize and the most uh, advantage of this gold is that once you synthesize it's highly stable i mean in situ it's highly stable and it's uh, highly non toxic so that's why it's have versatile applications it takes on imaging uh, drug delivery biocatalysis and using this gold nano rod uh, recently there are a couple of papers on the sars covid detection now <clears throat> coming to my work there are uh, previous literature where using this gold nano rod the enhancement of defined dyes i mean fluorophores were reported so if you uh, see this paper quite a long back ago 2013 michel orit from leiden university has observed that metal uh, this gold nano rod can act as a a nanoparticle antenna using this golden uh, golden nano rod the fluorescence enhancement can be uh, can reach up to 1000 fold and recently our group has uh, published 10 to the power four fold of fluorescence enhancement of a weak limiter in the plasmonic hotspot of this gold nano rod so what is a plasmonic hotspot so if two gold nano rod comes close together in, and forms a tiny uh, in between that a high electromagnetic Field is generated compared to bulk normal one bare nano rod. So on this uh, hotspot, if we place a dye perfectly, then we can observe a huge fluorescence enhancement or fluorescence burst. And this fluorescence burst can be observed in different different systems such as DNA origami uh, in presence of protein uh, in G quadrix DNA. And recently, from uh, Michelovitz groups, they observed two photon enhancement. and the enhancement can be go up to 10 to the power 8 level in 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 the plasmonic hotspots of this nano rods now uh, we are interested to system uh, a uh, dye tagged dna uh, dye tagged nano rod system where we can use as a uh, 
reusable system using this plasmonic enhancement property. For that purpose, we have synthesized the conventional Gortner rod by using uh, Morphe's group, I mean paper. And then we have wrapped this golden rod by PSS polymer, which is a negatively charged polymers. And initially it was uh, positively charged, that means 19 MB. And after wrapping of this PSS polymer, the surface charge becomes minus 14.85 uh, MB, which confirms the wrapping of the polymers around the nanorod. And the average dimension of the nanorods is 90 by 32 nanometer. And there is a small shift uh, due to the damping of the nanorods after the wrapping of these pieces polymers and the LSPR maxima of this nanorod each at 740 nanometer. Now for the plasmonic enhancement process we have chosen a dye, uh, cyanostilvin derivative dye uh, because of this, uh, because it has some advantages uh, regarding antifungal uh, anti property and it can be used as a targeted mitochondrial attacker because since it contains a positively um, uh, uh, in part so that's why it can bind with uh, specifically to the uh, mitochondria and it can be used for cancer therapy. Now what we observe in bulk level, I mean in normal fluorescence in cuvette, <coughs> there is a huge enhancement of the fluorescence of the dye in pens of this polymer wrapped golden rod and the absorption of this dye is around 500 nanometer and the fluorescence at 650 nanometer and there is an 80 fold of enhancement of this uh, weak limiting CNBR dye, I mean cyanostilvin dye in pens of this polymer wrapped golden rod, which proves the, the entrapment of those dye molecules in the surface of this polymer wrapped golden rod. Then we performed fluorescence lifetime study where you found that fluorescence lifetime initial increases and uh, changes on changing the pH, pH 3 and pH 12. Then <coughs> we performed a film study uh, where, you par or where you observe the fluorescence li lifetime distribution of the composite system which contains dye and polymer cap nanorod at aqueous P7 neutral pH and pH C acidic pH and pH uh, 12 alkali pH. The lifetime distribution was different. That means the structural heterogeneity, that means the orientation of the nanorod uh, nan around the dye is different. That's why their fluorescence lifetime are different in bulk level. We are interested that uh, what can be the fluorescence enhancement with respect to one nanorod. So for that, uh, we used uh, our home-built confocal microscope setup that we built over here at Gandhinagar, which uh, con now we have uh, currently two lasers at 532 nanometer and 560 nanometer. And then we perform the special filtering and the lighter coming from 80 to using this 8020 beam speaker from pinhole. And, uh, and coming to CCD uh, spectrometer, from there we can take the spectra of individual nanoparticles and <clears throat> we can record the fluorescence time trace as well as image by using uh, APD and uh, co uh, coupled with computers. This is the, uh, um, uh, this is the home build microscope that we are using over here. And this is the nanopogenin stage where we basically placed our sample. Then we observed that in single particle level, that means now we actually basically uh, um, set the sample on the glass surface and uh, we put a o-ring over there and we put the dye and now the solution is in 1 is to 1 quarter glycerol mixtures. Our target actually is to study the enhancement or the process what is happening with respect to one nanorod. I mean our laser focus is fixed with one nanorod and the dye molecules are moving and I want to say I want to see that what is happening the uh, uh, the fluorescence enhancement process or whatever what is happening with respect to fluorescence of the dye and I am monitoring the fluorescence of rod and if you see the absorption of this dye uh, which is 500 nanometer and the fluorescence of the dye around 670 nanometer and the red line which is actually the fluorescence of one nanorod basically and there is an excellent overlap between the uh, fluorescence of this nanorod and the fluorescence of the dye. So which actually allows us to enhancement process, fluorescence enhancement process. Now what happens? Now my nanorod is fixed on the glass surface and the dye molecules are basically moving on the solutions. And whenever it comes to this electromagnetic region, that means at the tip of the nanorod, so it will show burst, fluorescent burst. And from there you can say that this, uh, this, this uh, dye molecules are coming and binding to the nanoparticle surface. 
So coming to the data that we obtained in our single particles uh, st uh, study, we found this is the photo photoluminescence images, one photon photoluminescence images of golden hour, this is called golden hour, and each spot actually coming from a single golden hour, which is confirmed by this PL spectrum. So small FWHM confirms that it only contains one nanorod but not aggregate and we fixed on a single nanorod or I mean focus using 633 nanometer because the LSPR at 630 uh, I mean below uh, above the 650 nanometer so now he focuses the laser on one particle and we put the dial and fix the pH of the solution at pH 7 what we found the vast difference I mean enhancement process what happening but at pH 3 I mean acidic pH the vast events decreases and the intensity of the uh, vast events also vast decreases and at pH 12 almost vast almost all vast is abstinence so there is a change in the fluorescence enhancement process at single particle level where we are monitoring only one golden rod and with the dye basically <clears throat> now why this LSPR enhanced fluorescence so basically what happens, as I have told you that in case of gold nanorod, the electromagnetic field is created at the tip of the nanorod and in terms of a weak limiter, I mean dyes, what happens, it creates electromagnetic field and basically in terms of gold nanorod, the absorption of the dye, I mean extension of this dye, it just enhances. So faster rate of absorption and radiative emission happens and that's why the enhancement of the dye, of fluorescence enhancement of the dye basically happens. But the problem is that if the dye molecules comes closer to the surface of the nanoparticle, then it will show coins because then the process of foster or fret will happen or peak will happen. So there is a interplay between the distance. If it comes close to the surface, then it will show fret. But if it's maintained the optimum distance and which is in the region of this electromagnetic field, then it will show enhancement. But if we, if it crosses the uh, optimum region of the flows, I mean, uh, electromagnetic field, then it will also not does not show any fluorescence enhancement. Now, the enhancement that we are observing at pH 3 and uh, we observe that there is no fluorescence enhancement in case of pH 12, I mean, alkali medium. Now, whether this fluorescence enhancement is due to this LSPR or electromagnetic field, for that purpose, we done one uh, control study where we fixed uh, uh, one particle, which is red line, and we put the dye over there at 1 is to 1 glycerol or water glycerol mixture and we found the fluorescence enhancement process in terms of fluorescence burst up to 300 nanoseconds uh, seconds but when we took the fluorescence time test where no nanostructure is present we didn't show any enhancements so which conclusively proves that that only enhancement is coming due to this electromagnetic field of this i mean near field of this gold nano rods now coming to the fluorescence enhancement mechanism so <clears throat> initially golden hour rod was positively charged because it's set up coated then we are in, then we have wrapped with ps which is negatively charged polymer and the dye um, we were using have a positively charged positively charged positively charged now what happens actually the uh, according to previous literature that at low ph i mean ph3 this polymer wraps a uh, polymer actually remains in the compressed form in, in such like in this way but at high pH, when the pH is uh, crossing 8, this polymer remains in the extended form, I mean in long form. And due to this, sorry, sorry, due to this C double O minus charge charge repulsion. So at pH 3, acidic pH, it remains in the compressed form. At acid alkali pH, it remains in the extended form. And what we are observing? We are observing that in acidic pH, pH 3, we are observing huge fluorescence enhancement, I mean bust. But at pH 2, we didn't see any fluorescence uh, enhancement so we have come into conclusion that probably in case of ph3 acidic ph the uh, due to this compressed form of pss the the optimum distance of the dye and the poly uh, nanorod electromagnetic field is maintained however in case of ph12 since the dye molecule are free to diffuse to the nanorod surface so probably due to this foster and uh, the transfer the fluorescence enhancement is not happening now, uh, now the question is that what is the utility of that so initially our target was to synthesize a nano tag which can be used for the reversible purpose what is the that initially if we uh, tagged this nanorod pss uh, and a dye and if we change the ph right 
then what will happen the dye molecule will basically remove from the surface and we will again in encapsulate dye and we will use as a fluorescence micro bead for the uh, for the uh, alignment of our microscope and again we will change the ph and it that dry will remove so in this way you can use uh, this dye tagged uh, uh, golden dot system as a reversible manner so coming to the conclusion of future prospect so actually we have uh, investigated the wrap the role of the wrapped polymer in the uh, fluorescence enhancement process at different ph and which can be uh, help to further improve the um, to design multifunctional uh, probe nano probes and the thing that we are trying to achieve the reversible loading and unloading of the dye can be done at uh, around the nan polymer coated nanorod surface and uh, can be uh, studied in this single particle level by using this simple polymer configuration and by using this simple technique by changing the ph so <clears throat> coming to acknowledgement thanks uh, slides i want to thank to my supervisor professor somukanti khatua and uh, my lab members uh, nanoplasma research lab at iit gandhinagar so if you want to ask something or if you want to write something then you can write in my mail id that's why i put my email id and thank you for your kind attention okay thank you now the session is open for questions uh, i must say it's a good work very good work and again a very different field and i really like the way you presented and explained congratulations for that thank you thank you ma'am so have you started using this device sorry device or oh, instrument instrument sorry yeah 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 actually uh, i joined over here uh, just a, a 11 months ago so we the, at that time this instrument was not running after uh, four months it's come perfectly running after that we have built another two microscope so whatever we are doing so in this microscope what we can do we can do the single particle fluorescence spectra of one on nanoparticles so another two microscope that we are targeting what we want to do we want to couple uh, here it's uh, uh, fluorimeter is coupled as you can see this specially fluorimeter which is coupled with this instrument microscope another two microscope we are actually all, one is already, already built where a uh, home built ramon is attached so we want to see that single particle ramon enhancement sars enhancement and another in microscope which is under construction i mean uh, my lab mates are building they are targeting to show uh, to to our study the single particle electro uh, i mean electro chemistry at single particle level i mean whatever will happen uh, will um, will immobilize the samples on the nanorod surface and will fix the laser on the nanoparticle and we will whatever we will do at single particle level and three microscope will run hopefully within few time uh, at uh, single particle of Uh, single particle fluorescence spectra of nanoparticle, single particle Raman spectra of nanoparticle, and uh, single particle um, electrochemistry will uh, hopefully be. But that is not my expertise area. I'm very weak in this electrochemistry area. Okay. So any other question? Uh, we can move to the next presenter if there are no more questions thank you you can stop presenting thank you thank you who is the next presenter it's sonaja devi okay i can see your slides uh, department of chemistry trist kaur bank loan on a uh, photo degradation study is on rhodamine we using coprino incorporated titanium carbon is it visible ma'am my slides are visible ma'am hello yeah 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 is it visible yes yes am i audible yeah yeah you can proceed yeah 
So good afternoon to all. So the topic for my presentation is the photodegradation studies on rhodamine B using cobalt incorporated titanium carbide maxine and the modified maxine heterostructure. So myself, uh, Dr. Sunaja from the Department of Chemistry, Christ Deemed to be University, Bengaluru. So maxine is a new family of a two-dimensional material. If you are looking at the uh, structure of the maxine, we can see that it has a general formula of M n plus 1 xn and tx so that is a general formula of the maxine and if you look at the articles that is published from the scopus index publication which we had taken you can see that there is no much publication which was coming uh, uh, era before 2012 because 2011 was the first maxine which was published actually and the past two years the number of articles which are coming regarding with respect to maxine or the more modified maxines you can see the number how much it is increased so it is a re, it is a 10 year uh, old child maybe we can tell that it is going on uh, increasing the application and the modified forms many groups are started uh, working on this particular area so as i mentioned that 2011 it was synthesized the first maxine by nagubi ital and he has uh, his group has synthesized the TI3C2, that is the first maxine which was synthesized. In the group with a formula which I told you that M N plus 1 X and T N, where M stands for any of the transition metal ion, and X can be a carbon or a nitrogen, while T represents the termination group, which will be generally oxygen, fluorine, or an OH group. And 2014 was the year where the first uh, maxine has been used first for the dye degradation studies. And before that, we, as we know that titania is one of the uh, photo degradation uh, material which was used from the early stage and the modified forms of titania has been used in a vast with the uh, incorporation or the doping or the composites, etc. has been used in a vast area. And this area now, with respect to the titanium carbide maxines, has been studied from 2014. And we have enough number of papers which was showing uh, about just the maxine or the modified forms of maxine for that. And the maxines are generally having the, what, why it is important in the photodegradation studies. The main thing is the tunable band gap. As all of us knows that for the photo degradation studies, we should uh, be able to get our material to trap the light energy. And if it is able to trap the light energy in the visible region, our solar light itself will be able to uh, utilize as much as possible. And it is a non-toxic, high thermal and chemical stability, high metallic conductivity, and it has a large specific surface area. Any catalysis, the specific area is one of the important area where we have to work on to get them as much as possible. And in the studies, we had uh, modified first the maxine, TI3C2 maxine, uh, using a cobalt ferrate. So what we've done is that we synthesized the TI3C2 maxine and mix it and cobalt ferrate separately. And we had mixed it by uh, using an ultrasonication method and uh, using a water bath, ultrasonication water bath. And then we had dried it, grinded it in order to get the TI3C2 cobalt ferrate uh, composite. And into that one, we wanted to modify it again. For that, if we synthesize the GC3N4 uh, you are from melamine at a 550 degrees Celsius for a four hours time in order to get this GC3N4. And we had incorporated this uh, GC3N4 inside the uh, uh, binary composite of Maxine in order to get a ternary composite. And um, just to mention that TI3C2 is prepared actually from titanium aluminum carbide by etching method using lithium fluoride and HCl. Using an etching method, we prepared the titanium carbide and then we prepared the titanium carbide cobalt ferrate and GCN has been incorporated again using this ultrasonication method. And we had uh, uh, used the um, hydrothermal method in order to uh, heat it. And finally, we are getting the uh, ternary composite of TI3C2 cobalt ferrate and GCN. And GCN is also a layered structure, while titanium carbide is also a layered structure. So we are getting the layered molecules, actually. And uh, in the layers, we are assuming that our cobalt ferrate is also incorporated in that. And we had uh, done the different characterization techniques uh, for the prepared catalyst, mainly the XRD, FTIR, scanning electron microscopy, the DLS, Di dynamic light scattering study, because that is one of the uh, important uh, study which will give you uh, what is the particle size and what will be the zeta potential value of that material. 
and the uv drs from that we had uh, plotted the top plot also in order to calculate what will be the band gap energy that it is coming and we had used the application as i mentioned it is for an environmental remediation where we had used the dye degradation studies uh, uh, we started with the rhodamine b study and but we had utilized the material for the other dyes also so coming into the results and discussion part you can see that the titanium carbide which we had prepared actually titanium carbide which is having a major peaks which you are coming is around 9.1 which corresponds to the 002 plane and 18.4 which is a 004 plane and 28.2 which is a 008 plane these are the three major important peaks that you are expecting uh, which is already literature also has been proved that one and uh, in our ternary composite solo we can see that the three major major peaks which are present in that one and we checked it with the cobalt ferrite which is also a non material of the cobalt ferrite so it is having a 35.2 corresponds to a 311 plane and 41.8 corresponds to the 012 plane and 60.8 corresponds to the 110 plane that is for the cobalt ferrite which is also present in our ternary composite and also in the binary composite which we prepared and for the gc3n4 graphitic carbon nitrate the general peaks which we are obtained which should obtain is at 13 degree uh the, which corresponds to 100 plane which will be generally a very small of intensity one while 27.3 corresponds to 002 plane is actually the um, um high intensity one but if you can see check the ternary composite we were not able to see that particular peak as a major peak in that one because the quantity of graphite carbon nitrate what we had incorporated is actually in a very small quantity so we are not getting that particular peak in the xrd but uh, when we do the elemental studies we understood that it is present in the material then we done the ftir spectroscopy also and uh, all the peaks corresponds to the graphite carbon nitrate uh, uh, trias in unit are also present so that also confirming that uh, gc3n4 is incorporated in the ternary composite all of the peaks are corresponding to the titanium carbide maxim and for the cobalt ferrite maxims are uh, present in the composite we had shown for the titanium carbide the binary composite and for the ternary composite and this is for the ti3c2 alone that is coming there so these studies confirm that our ternary composite what we are expected is already formed in the mixture this is the um, scanning electron micrograph images for the titanium carbide cobalt ferrite and you can see the carbon oxygen fluorine aluminum titanium uh, aluminum is actually uh, a small quantity still present in the mixture because as i mentioned that we started the titanium carbide preparation from titanium aluminum carbide so that aluminum is not completely eliminated so a small quantity of aluminum is still present which is already uh, uh, reported that we cannot eliminate completely the aluminum from that mixture so we are getting a small amount of the aluminum also in the mixture but when we look at for the titanium carbide we can we are getting the layered structure which we were expecting actually the layered structure of the titanium carbide and cobalt ferrite alone we had taken the scanning electron microgram and these two images are at 200 nanometers and 2 micrometers of our ternary composite and uh, it is uh, clear that the incorporation of the cobalt ferrite particles can be seen and uh, uh, we are getting uh, the incorporation of uh, other nitrogen uh, content even though here it is uh, showing zero percentage but in this spectra you can see that it is seen the car graphite carbon nitrate that nitrogen amount the uh, quantity is there but it is found that uh, the quantity is very very small in that one when we started to uh, find out what will be the uh, band gap energy and for that we had conducted uh, we had performed the uv dr studies so from the uv dr studies titanium carbide we had done and the binary composite of uh, titanium carbide and cobalt ferrite and cobalt ferrite and gc3n4 also we done and finally the ternary composite of maxim cobalt ferrite and gc3n4 we had calculated and the values you can see that it is all coming in the visible region and the uh, <coughs> sorry and uh, it is uh, the ternary composite is having a much much uh, lower value of the band gap energy and which confirms that why it is showing a higher activity when we are doing our uh, application studies also this uh, diagram shows about the zeta potential and the dynamic light scattering studies what will be the particle size it is not coming in the nano range at all it is in the uh, range of uh, 
uh, the two peaks which we are uh, getting is 1400 nanometers it is coming so we cannot call it as a nanometer it is a composite that is why we are not getting as a nanometer reach but the zeta potential value which is a minus 36 in the case of the ternary composite since the surface is found to be negative it will be good that when you are doing a dye degradation studies it is better for a cationic dye to study because we are not getting the results for the anionic dyes this is confirmed from the zeta potential value because the surface itself is a negatively charged and the diagram shows for the uh, binary composite of titanium carbide and the cobalt ferrite where the zeta potential value still is a negative value minus 16.9 but in the case of a ternary composite it was found to be minus 36 so it is more negative when a ternary composite is coming for that first we studied with the rhodamine b which is one of the uh, important uh, dye that is used in the uh, textile industry and uh, as we know that uh, the water is getting polluted by means of the different processes that is happening in the textile industry because they have to color the different uh, clothes and uh, this water is actually just uh, uh, eliminating a sign in the wastewater and this is getting accumulated in the water bodies and it is harmful for the uh, different organisms in the water and also harmful for the human so we wanted to degrade this uh, rhodamine b into a smaller molecule so that uh, we are not assuming that we hadn't studied that complete elimination is happening or not, but we had we are uh, found that uh, by it can be uh, divided or a, the degradation of this particular molecule is happening, which is less harmful to the environment. And the degradation efficiency we had calculated using the formula one minus c by z zero into hundred in order to see how efficient is our material. So first we took the binary composite and we done the rhodamine B study using a very small quantity which is 0 0.05 gram of the catalyst and we can see from the spectrum that the rhodamine B the peak is going on decreasing as the time goes we just done for a comparison 240 minutes we had done but we had uh, kind of, we had done it till it is coming to the zero value also we had done it it is taking around the 5 hours of the time uh, then it reaches to the zero value and uh, we had uh, taken a different quantity also with a smaller quantity of 0 0.01 gram to 0 0.1 gram we had done but 0 0.05 gram is the one which is showing the maximum efficiency of the removal or the degradation of the dye so we had fixed the 0 0.05 gram as for the further studies and also we uh, done with the uh, just the maxine ti3c2 maxine and only the cobalt ferrate and the modified form of a binary Ti3C2 and cobalt ferrate and you can see that the degradation efficiency has been increased within a 240 minute. Uh, it was around 40 if it is only a maxine and it is around 68 percentage it is increased. Using this concept we took the ternary composite because we were expecting little more higher efficiency because of the presence of the graphite carbon nitride which is found to be one of the photocatalysts. So here also we use the 5 ppm solution and in the 240 minutes you can see that it is almost in the zero level it is reached. And we got around 92 percentage degradation efficiency within the 240 minutes. When we compare the other photocatalyst and we had done all these things using the visible light region. You, we had just tried it we are using a uh, UV, re, UV light also. UV light it is so fast in such a way that uh, within one hour we are getting the result. But our aim is that using a solar light or a sunlight so that uh, efficiency will be maximum without using any other light so how to increase the efficiency uh, using the maxine so that is why we had incorporated the graphite carbon nitride also and within a 240 minutes of time we are assuming that it is coming or we are getting a result of almost 0.92 uh, percentage it is coming and uh, here if you in change the quantity from 0.05 to 0.1, there was not much difference it is seeing. So we had we understood that there is no need of higher amount of the catalyst. The amount of 0.05 is sufficient for a 5 ppm uh, rhodamine dye, uh, rod, uh, 5 ppm dye solution. So we had fixed it as 0.05 grams of the catalyst. As the concentration of the dye is increasing, the degradation efficiency is found to be decreasing as it is a common phenomenon that as the dye concentration increases, you have to use more amount of the catalyst. But we fix the catalyst as 0 0.05. So automatically, it is the general phenomenon that more concentration of the dye, the degradation efficiency will be decreasing. But when we increase the amount of the catalyst from 0.05 to 0.1 gram, we can get this 20 ppm dye solution also. It is coming around 80 percentage is coming. 
so you can vary the amount of the catalyst and depending upon what is the concentration of the effluent that is coming or the dye sol solution that it is coming you can vary the amount of the catalyst and uh, finally we calculated the dye degradation efficiency of all the materials what we prepared the tcg represents the ternary catalyst and uh, we just calculated all the and we can see that the ternary catalyst is showing the maximum which is of around 92 93 percentage efficiency by knowing about the rhodamine b which is found to be one of the uh, difficult dye that is undergoing a degradation so we had used the other dyes also that is malachite green congo red methylene blue and crystal violet all these are found to be the cationic dye we had studied actually with respect to the anionic dyes also but there was no result or the degradation efficiency was below 20 percentage is coming which means that the surface is actually negatively charged so it is not getting absorbed on the surface to undergo the degradation so we stopped with the anionic dye studies and we used all the cationic dyes and most of the other dyes within 30 minutes itself we are getting all nearly the 100 percentage result rhodamine b alone is the one which is taking it because the structure it is because of the structure of the dye Rodman B is having a, a bigger structure and it is very difficult to undergo the degradation. While the Congo red or a malachite green or a methylene blue, which is a structure is very small and it is easy to undergo the degradation rate. And we are getting a very good result of almost 99 percentage within the 30 minutes of the time. So in conclusion, I would like to explain that the XRD, FTIR and the scanning electron microscope and the EDAX confirm the formation of the our ternary composite, that is the TI3C2 maxine with the cobalt ferrite and graphite carbon nitrate. And the UVDR studies confirm the reduction in the band graph of the ternary composite. And the zeta potential value of the catalyst confirm the adsorption of the rhodamin B or the other cationic dye, why it is giving you the more um, uh, more results or the uh, why the degradation efficiency is higher for these particular dyes. And the efficiency was found to be more than 90 percentage for almost all the dyes within 30 minutes other than rhodamine B. And the photocatalytic degradation efficiency of the rhodamine B using the prepared catalyst was found to be 92.1 that is for the 240 minutes. And uh, this can be used for as an efficient photocatalyst for the degradation of the organic pollutant. Actually, we don't need to use any of the other light. You can just put it in the sunlight itself. The degradation is happening. Our next future plan is the we have to use this particular material and uh, study how much is uh, the TOC, that is total organic carbon, how much is coming, which confirm that uh, whether the rhodamin B or the other uh, dyes, whether it is completely converted into the carbon dioxide or the water. Now we are assuming that it is not completely converted. It is only a degradation is happened and uh, it is converted into a smaller molecule. So uh, the uh, how much is the pollutant that is coming into the water bodies can be reduced, but it is not completely eliminated. So with this, I will just conclude. And uh, these are the few references which we had used it. And uh, almost all the work of titanium carbide-based uh, uh, maxines are uh, the last two years is the maximum work that is uh, done. So we just added a few of the references. And thank you. OK, the session is open for question answers. Any questions? I'm ready to answer for that. What are the final products of degradation? Um, actually, um, it is uh, dividing into different, depending upon the time, it is getting different, different products. So if you are keeping it for the uh, five hours and the six hours, we are getting a smaller, smaller product. But we are assuming we have to get it finally into the carbon dioxide and water, whatever be the uh, dye structure is there. The end product has to be the carbon dioxide or the water that is coming, but we are not getting complete product there. Yeah, so that is where we have to work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we have to, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So can you please repeat once uh, the mechanism? Probably I have missed it. Mechanism, I hadn't uh, explained it completely, but uh, I can tell you that it is a reduction in the band gap, actually. Okay. Uh, because of that, in the ternary composites, uh, maxines uh, and cobalt ferrate and uh, GC3 and 4 is coming. So we are actually working on the mechanism. It can be an EZ scheme mechanism that we are uh, 
assuming, but uh, we have to get few more results to propose the actual mechanism. Either it can be an insert scheme mechanism or an S scheme mechanism that we are assuming now. Okay. Since okay. the result is not completely got it, so we are. Uh, that is why I didn't show the actual mechanism. Okay. 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 Yeah. Fine. Fine. Um, so I think if no more questions are there, we can move to the next session. Thank you, Dr. Sonal. Next, yeah. Ma'am, so, uh, you can conclude now. We can we we have uh, another chair chair. Okay. So you can conclude for this session. Uh, 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 um, it's uh, pardon. Uh, uh, we have uh, another uh, session in our yeah. next in okay. session is on okay, okay. session and okay, we have chair on that. Yeah, yeah, got so, it, got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we are very thankful to you because you you have done a, a great thing. Uh, thank you, uh, Sonal Ma'am, for being a chair yeah. and a fully thank active in this session. Thank you very much from Mahatma Gandhi University. Okay. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, now we have uh, concluded this session and now. Now we have uh, another section on encapsulation, and I welcome uh, Dr. Saud Saumedi Bunia uh, from IA Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar, for chairing this session. Okay, so thank you, the organizer, for giving me this uh, cha to chair on this session. So this is uh, on this session we have our one talk from Vijay Lakshmi Ghosh. She is an assistant professor uh, at ZD. Rangta College of Science and Technology, and her talk will be on polymeric encapsulation of anti larval essential oil nano emulsion for controlled release of bioactive compounds. So, with this, uh, I want to uh, I want to request Vijay Lakshmi, please proceed with your presentation. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Is it visible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's visible. Please go on the full screen mode. Please go on the full screen mode. Yes. Sir, is it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, fine. It's fine. Please proceed. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, uh, Assistant Professor in GD Rungta College of Science and Technology, Bilai, Chhattisgarh, India. So today I'm going to talk on polymeric en encapsulation of anti-larval essential oil nano emulsion for controlled release of bioactive compounds. So this is a brief introduction about mosquito and uh, the disease that they transmit. So basically mosquitoes, they transmit deadly diseases including malaria, dengue, filariasis, chikungunya, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, Zika fever, etc. All of us know. According to WHO 2021 report, so there are 241 million cases of malaria that occurred worldwide, of which India accounts for 4% of malaria cases. So these are transmitted by uh, the mosquitoes so they are anophilins and uh, there are total 58 anophilins of which there are uh, the six species are known to transmit malaria again of these six species the two commonly known species that's the anophilis culicifices which is a rural vector and anophilis stephensi which is the urban vector these are the primary vectors of malaria in chhattisgarh so this slide shows the malaria scenario in Chhattisgarh. According to National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program, uh, the, they estimate that 
annual parasitic incidence that's the api score of chatisgarh is between 5 to 10 and out of 27 districts in chatisgarh 19 districts are endemic to malaria so the government uh, malaria control strategies they include indoor residual spraying and long lasting insecticide treated nets llins so of this irs that's the indoor residual spraying it's commonly used by the government vector, uh, programs for vector control and these programs they use synthetic insecticides or the pesticides uh, of different categories uh, they are organochlorines organophosphates pyrethroids but uh, this uh, synthetic pesticides they are used repeated use and indiscriminate use they cause harmful effect on the fishes and other non target organism and also they uh, they um, lead to insecticide resistance in mosquitoes so this is the data of insecticide resistance in malaria um, malaria vectors of chatisgarh of we can see the vectors and that's the mosquitoes they have become resistant to ddt malathion and delta methrin so this is a report uh, which was published in the year 2012 by the nimr field unit raipur so that's why we are looking for an alternative source uh, to combat which would be a green uh, source or the bio biological source and the option is plant essential oil their property of rapid degradation in environment um, has favored its increased specificity and they include uh, the bioactive compounds which are non-toxic and they are alternate uh, insecti insecticide repellents which can be used for humans these plant essential oils they contain bioactive compounds such as eugenol linalol menthol cineol estragol pinine and the list goes on so these uh, bioactive compounds they contribute to the properties that uh, the uh, plant essential oil inhibit but uh, the disadvantage is that the essential oil as the name says oil but it's not oil but uh, it's a collection of the bioactive compounds which happen to be hydrophobic in nature that's why we need to have a formulation development so that we can solubilize in water while using it for uh, mosquito vector control programs so uh, the formulation which uh, is to be developed is plant essential oil based nano emulsion and uh, their advantage is that the, these are sub micro uh, size uh, uh, they are submicron size uh, formulations of uh, two immiscible liquids that's uh, oil and water and they are stabilized by surfactants or the emulsifiers and due to the low droplet size that's the, normally the size ranges between 10 to 100 nanometer in case of nano emulsion so this uh, very low droplet size that it renders high uh, physical stability high bioavailability and low turbidity but again, uh, as it is uh, uh, the essential oil uh, imparts the property basically due to the bioactive compounds. These bioactive compounds, uh, we already discussed that they are hydrophobic uh, and also they are highly volatile in nature. So what happens due to the vol volatile nature of the um, phytochemicals, we have to frequently apply these uh, products and we, because uh, they get evaporated so uh, what we have to do is we have to encapsulate so the nano encapsulations uh, is the alternation uh, or the strategy so here uh, it is a vesicular system in which a drug is confined here it, the drug is essential oil or the essential oil based nano emulsion so it's uh, confined in a cavity consisting of an inner liquid core surrounded by a polymeric membrane the significance is it, it is uh, um, it helps in controlled and sustained release of the bioactive compounds and it also protects against uh, the degradative reactions and it increases the protection time or the activity time of the bioactive compounds so these are some of the factors that affect encapsulation the chemical nature of the core that's the essential oil it's the bioactive compound the molecular weight the chemical functionality that's the functional groups present the polarity the volatility 
and also the shell material properties that means the uh, encapsulating material whatever polymer you are choosing and what technique you are using for micro encapsulation the size of the core material also plays an important role for diffusion and permeability and control release of the bioactive compounds so here the objective is to prepare plant essential oil based nano emulsion with uh, low droplet size and greater stability and then to select uh, the optimized uh, nano emulsion with uh, low droplet size and greater stability to encapsulate the optimized uh, nano emulsion for control release of the bioactive ingredients then finally uh, we have to uh, study the mosquito vector uh, larvicidal activity against uh, the primary malaria vectors in chatisgarh so before beginning uh, uh, the study we first analyzed the essential oil here we have taken the lemongrass essential oil for the current study and the gcms graph shows that uh, geraniol is the uh, major bioactive compound with uh, 45.10 percentage and the other compound uh, which was important was uh, neral contributing 31.16 percentage then we have prepared nano emulsion using low energy method so first uh, we prepared the organic phase by adding uh, oil and surfactant so here the oil is uh, lemongrass essential oil and surfactant we used is 280 why we have chosen 280 because it's a low uh, low molecular weight surfactant and they easily get absorbed onto the oil droplets in the emulsion and uh, uh, hence uh, they minimize the droplet size uh, with a greater effect than when compared to the uh, high molecular weight uh, emulsifiers for example the polymeric emulsifiers so first we have uh, prepared the organic phase by mixing uh, 280 and uh, lemongrass essential oil then this organic phase was dropwise added to aqueous phase and the aqueous phase was maintained uh, on the magnetic stirrer at 400 rpm so the emulsion was uh, for the nano emulsion was prepared using the spontaneous emulsification method uh, you see we got the optimum result with uh, 1 is to 3 ratio of uh, oil and surfactant and the optimized uh, droplet size it was 14.5 nanometer you can see the dls data shows that it's a single peak distribution and also uh, the droplet size range is very narrow and figure b uh, shows the visual uh, how the uh, optim uh, your nano emulsion looks so it is uh, uh, it's uh, optically transparent so basically the uh, visual appearance gives and data about preliminary data about uh, the droplet size if uh, the um, the so the solution or the emulsion is uh, milky white then it is uh, in greater uh, droplet size range but if it is translucent or transparent the, uh, that means it, the uh, droplet size had reduced to nano range and uh, this is due to uh, the fact that nanometric uh, droplet size they scatter the light waves very weakly so that they make the system optically transparent so once you have uh, the emulsion uh, which looks optically transparent so you can uh, confirm uh, or you can say it is uh, opti uh, it is uh, in nano range uh, the droplet size in nano range again it can be confirmed by draw dls data so this is the uh, tem micrograph of the nano emulsion here we can see the nano emulsion droplets are spherical in range and also it provided the additional data about uh, the droplet size uh, which ranged between 10 to 100 nanometer then we check the stability of the nano emulsion the optimized nano emulsion so as we see the when we stored it at uh, room temperature for 6 months and still it's stable uh, so there was no phase separation of the nano emulsion into the constituent phases so there was no flocculation or creaming and also uh, when dls data confirmed that there was no significant change in the droplet size so the optimized uh, nano emulsion it was chosen for 
encapsulation. So here for encapsulation, we have uh, um, selected uh, chitosan polymer, which was obtained from shrimp cells. And here we used 2% of uh, chitosan. And uh, the optimized chitosan and uh, lemongrass essential oil nanoemulsion mixing ratio was uh, 1 is to 1. So this is how we uh, encapsulated the nano emulsion. First, we prepared the chitosan, uh, that's 2% weight by volume ratio in 1% uh, uh, solution of acetic acid. Then it was filtered through Wattman number one filter paper just to uh, separate out the bigger particles uh, that was present in the um, chitosan. Then the filtered the chitosan solution was mixed with lemongrass, uh, the optimized uh, lemongrass uh, essential oil and uh, it, the solution was uh, homogenized using sonicator. Finally, uh, the mixture solution of this chitosan and uh, lemongrass oil, it was uh, added to the beaker containing sodium hydroxide using a gauze syringe for bead formation. And then the beads were washed uh, with double distilled water. So this is how the encapsulated chitosan bead looks under uh, ACM, that's the scanning electron microscopy. So it was nearly um, smooth in smooth surface and uh, spherical in shape and the size was approximately uh, 0 0.5 uh, millimeter. Then the um, encapsulated nano emulsion, it was uh, selected for uh, mosquito vector activity. So here, uh, before going into the activity, just to know uh, what is the life cycle of uh, anophilene mosquito. Uh, so mosquitoes, they undergo four uh, life cycle, uh, four stages. Uh, that's the larva, pupa, uh, adult, uh, larva, uh, sorry, uh, egg, larva, pupa and adult. So we have chosen for this study uh, the larva as our agent. So we checked larvicidal activity against the anophilus bacteria uh, anopheles mosquitoes so uh, third instar and early fourth instar larva were collected and uh, then different uh, concentration of chy chitosan encapsulation beads were added and it was incubated for 24 hours after 24 hours the mo motility was checked by uh, probing into the siphon region of the uh, mosquito larva so this was uh, done by following the who protocol uh, for the year 2005. So here, as we see, uh, we have checked uh, the activity, larvicidal activity against the Anopheles uh, stephensi, which is the urban vector, and Anopheles culicifisis, which is the rural vector. And the activity was uh, carried out uh, till 24 hours period. Mm, so here, you can see the 1000 uh, milligram of the encapsulated bead, uh, it resulted in 100% mortality in case of anaphylis defensi within uh, um, 12 hours. And 750 milligram of uh, chitosan beads, uh, it resulted in 100% mortality only after uh, 24 hours. But in case of uh, anaphylis culicifisis, you can see the 100% mortality was observed uh, in uh, within eight hours uh, while uh, with 100, uh, 1000 milligram of the encapsulated beads and uh, within 16 hours in case of uh, 750 milligram of encapsulated beads. So you can see between anaphylis stephensi and anaphylis culicifis is the larvicidal activity was better against the rural vector that's the anaphylis culicifisis. So what we conclude is uh, stable nano emulsion was prepared using lemongrass essential oil by spontaneous uh, emulsification method. And the nano emulsion with low droplet size and greater stability, it was encapsulated by chitosan polymer. Chitosan uh, encapsulated uh, lemongrass essential oil, it uh, demonstrated significant mosquito larvicidal activity against malaria vectors and the larvicidal activity was better against the rural vector, that's the anaphylis culicifisis. So what we conclude is that uh, the nano emulsions, they are bio-based uh, larvicidal agents so they are eco-friendly and it is also cost effective because you need very less amount of uh, um, 
emulsion for the killing the larva or for the larvicidal activity. And the fact that 75% uh, of total population of Chhattisgarh, uh, they live in villages. And our findings uh, of uh, about the larvicidal activity, that uh, the, it was the better larvicidal agent against the rural vector. So we can say that it can be used for malaria control in Chhattisgarh in future. So that's what I want to conclude. These are some of my references. Yeah, I want to acknowledge ACRB NPDA Fellowship and Ravi Shankar Shukla University where I carried out my work uh, along with uh, the NIMR, uh, the National Institute of Malaria Research Field Unit, Raipur. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> ma'am, for your nice presentation. Uh, you are working actually on real problem. Uh, which is going to helpful to our society. Now the floor is open uh, for open questions and discussion. So please uh, yeah, start your, with your queries. Anyone have any questions? Okay, so if there is no question, then I should ask one question. So you, what you are talking about the <coughs> nano emulsion, is it yes. forming a micelle or reverse micelle? It is forming micelle. Micelle, yes. okay. Now the point and is that why- Basically, I am formulating oil in water nano emulsion. Oil, oil in water. water? Yes. Oil in water, okay. Yes. So uh, then, uh, then how much, I mean the ratio? that you are achieving that i mean uh, how much uh, ratio of oil and surfactant actually uh, yeah, yeah. i'm taking maximum of oil actually we have optimized and the uh, ratio which i have uh, at the concentration of oil which i have taken ranges between six percent to ten percent and uh, the okay. ratio between oil and surfactant uh, it uh, varies from one is to one to one is to five and uh, I choose mostly uh, the high HLB value surfactants. The, mostly they are polysorbates. The, and uh, 20 and 80, I got better results. Between 20 uh, and 80. Okay, okay. Yes. So what I have seen that you have used, to, uh, I mean, 20, 80 or 2020. I mean, this is non-ionic surfactant, right? Yes, yes. Did you check with cationic, I mean, or anionic charged surfactant? Or is there any disadvantage of using charged surfactant over non-ionic surfactants? I mean, non-charged surfactants? Actually, uh, this I have chosen uh, based on the HLB value. So high HLB value, they uh, um, they are preferred for oil in water solution uh, emulsions. So when we talk about high HLB value, uh, these polysorbates they will fall under high HLB value surfactants. Okay, I see. Yes. Last question from my side. So if you go to your DLS data and TAM data, it will. Yes. Uh, can you open is your uh, yes. DLS and TEM data? Yes, DLS. So in your, I mean, uh, DLS data, you found the optimum size is 15 nanometer, which is yes. hydrodynamic diameter, right? Yes. Emulsion solvent molecules. Yes. But in case of uh, TEM, you are observing, a, I mean, distribution from 10 to 100 nanometer. Yeah, actually, uh, you can see there are only one or two bigger size droplets. Mostly they are smaller size droplets from the TAME data. And sometimes maybe it is also due to the fusion of the uh, droplets too. So we cannot conclude the TAME data for size. But yes, we can see uh, say that additionally it provides the size data. Because uh, when we talk about emulsions, uh, they are water in oil. So once water is, uh, you are drying, so the droplets fuse. So it is not a proper method to calculate the size from TEM. So hydrodynamic di uh, diameter is the better parameter. Better but parameter. yes, for the morphology, we have to do TEM. And yes, yes, yes. yeah, approximately actually, it provides the data, not the accurate data. Uh, yes. Actually, I have faced uh, during my PhD where we have synthesized nanomaterial in, inside the reverse myself. Yes. So when we did TEM, at W naught is equal to 5 and 10, we got 10, very good 10 meta. But at higher region, W naught is equal to 20, where water percentage is much more, we didn't get any TEM data. I mean, yes, it is very difficult. Data. For me also, I don't get always the proper TEM data. Yes. Yes, yes, I know that. Okay, so uh, thank you for giving a nice presentation. And uh, 
thank you organizer also for sharing this session so should i uh whom should i hand over now thank you thank you somebody sir for uh, sharing the <coughs> session and and all the uh presented participants we are now going to the short invited lectures and i invite melanda uh, to chair the session So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the coordinators of this ICN 2022 for giving me an opportunity to chair the session. So the first speaker of this SIL is uh, Shubham Shekhar Mandal from the School of Material Science and Technology, IIT Bhubaneswar. So he will be uh, Shubham. Are you there, Shubham Shekhar Mandal? Shubham. Hello. Uh, yes, you can start your presentation now. Can I please share your presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I request you to maintain the 10 minutes time. Can I start? Hello. Hello. Uh, Shubham, uh, can you please put on your presentation the full full screen mode? Because we could uh, we were able to see your presentation, but it was not in the full screen. Okay. Yeah, it's okay now. Okay, now. you can start. Please start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am here to present my short impacted lecture on polyurethane based system for insulin delivery. Uh, I am from School of Material Science and Technology, IIT PHU. Uh, my supervisor is Professor Roy Mankey. So, as the title says, polyurethane based drug delivery system for insulin delivery. So, diabetes. It is a disease caused by blood glucose level and blood glucose, which is uh, main part of energy which comes from the food. And uh, diabetes, a, a diabetes is uh, cured by a hormone called insulin, which is secreted from the pancreas, and it helps glucose to get into the cells and use as energy in the human body. So sometimes uh, human body doesn't make enough insulin. So that's why the blood glucose is high and is called diabetic. So in um, it is studied that in 2030 diabetes mellitus may be up to 17.4 million in India. So in, in this scenario, all those diabetes treatment have gradually improved during past few decades, but still there is some difficulties. So, in uh, so for better drug delivery of insulin, we synthesize a polymeric system, which is uh, uh, in so, so to synthesize this polymeric system, we use polyurethane. So polyurethane is a biomaterial or a synthetic polymer which has attractive physical properties and good biocompatibility and good mechanical stability also. In, in literature studies, we can see that uh, polyurethane is applied in various biomedical fields like uh, wound dressing, 
cardiovascular studies, tissue reconstruction, and breast implants, etc. Few are generally synthesized by using polyol and a diastyrene. By condensation polymerization, we make polyurethane first, and as our requirement, we add in extender to it to modify it. Uh, hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. So, few material are made this made from this different isocyanate give the distinct properties. Few are coherently uh, coherently linked to drugs and make a drug embedded polymeric system for sustained drug delivery. And here, uh, main, our ex main ex objective. To study the cellular viability, sustained drug delivery, and cell addition. So my methodology is in the first step, first step making a P polymer, which come from a diisocyanate and a polyol in some organic medium like DMF or DMSO. In the very next step, we add gene extender. As a grafting agent, which create the grafting reaction, and the poly P polymer grafted main system were embedded with drug. Then the drug embedded polyurethane system is further examined for cellular viability and drug release study for both case in vivo and in vitro. My experimental work. Uh, in this case, we take polycaprolactone diol and hexamethylene diisocyanate uh, as diisocyanate, and which give a pre polymer like this. Uh, in this case, we use three um, three neck round bottom flux and which is equipped with a mechanical stirrer, and we applied a moderate temperature around uh, 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. And in the very next step, we at alpha cyclodextrin, which is a, a polysaccharide, consists of uh, one fold link, six uh, pyranose, uh, one fold link, six pyranose ring. And we assume that uh, here the reaction will occur in the primary alcohol and P polymer is attached to the primary alcohol, and um, the final system is going to be like this. So in UV data, we get for pure polyurethane, we get uh, UV absorption spectra at 289 degree. And for pure polymer, uh, for pure cyclodextrin, it is uh, almost no peak there. So here 289 uh, degree, at 289 nanometer is uh, appear due to end to pi star transition. And into pi star transition, or in case of uh, polyurethane grafted cyclodextrin, the absorption peak appear at 292 nanometer, and which is um, somewhat uh, red shift, and which indicate the um, better hydrogen interaction, uh, better hydrogen interaction in the system, and for then we add the drug and for drug loaded material pure polymer appears at 290 as the pure drug case the pure drug case the peak appears in the uv absorption spectra at around 290 to 80 and for polyurethane graft cyclodextrin the uv absorption peak appears around 290 degrees Celsius, and here the XRD data shows uh, for polyurethane shows two peak at around 21.07 and 23.97, which is due to 110 and 220 pin of um, soft segment of PU in case which is our PCL diol. So, in case of FTIR study. Uh, it is also uh, confirmed that uh, for polyurethane, the CO linkage 
of urethane CO function of urethane linkage appears at uh, 17,000 uh, 1722 cm inverse and for Hydrogen bonded uh, OH and NH2 at 3398 cm inverse. And here the NH stretching for polyurethane, NH stretching for polyurethane appears at uh, 1530, which is well matched to the literature. And in case of uh, in case of cyclodextrin grafted polyurethane, it is appears slightly lower range. For hydrogen bonded OH and NH, it is appears at uh, 3388 cm inverse. And for uh, NH and NH stretching and CO bonded um, CO stretching, it remains in the same region, and which is confirmed the grafting of cyclodextrin to the polyurethane. And in case of cyclodextrin, it is a um, broad peak appears at in the range of uh, 300, 3000 to 300, uh, 3600. In case of uh, drug loaded materials, we see that uh, the peak at 3300, it becomes broader and which signifies the, which signifies the loading of drug into the material. In case of in case of um, polyurethane grafted cyclodextrin, it is also shows that uh, the broad peak appears at uh, at the peak range 3350. So in AFU study for pure alpha cyclodextrin, it shows like this, and for polyurethane, it shows a strip like behavior for heart segment for the reason of hard segment and soft segment of PU and as we grafted cyclodextrin, the um, strip like behavior somehow diminishes and the effect of cyclodextrin is uh, affected in the polyurethane grafted cyclodextrin. And in case of uh, release study for pure polyurethane, we get a bar please around in four hours, we, we get that uh, almost 95% drug was released, but in case of a polyurethane grafted cyclodextrin system, we get a sustained release behavior of up to 12 hours. So, uh, conclusion is uh, cyclodextrin grafting on polyurethane chain, in chain lead to the sustained release of drug and efficacy of grafting polyurethane on cyclodextrin is examined by controlled drug delivery studies and the better interaction with uh, cyclodextrin and polyurethane also examined by UVIR, UV and FTIR studies. And in further, we also um, uh, studies uh, cellular uptake and cell viability studies also or also in also in, in animal model thank you thank you thank you shivam for your presentation and now the session is open for discussion audience please ask questions So I have a small doubt, uh, like uh, can you control this sustained release of drug by using this uh, polyurethane? Control the release efficiency. So you have mentioned that it will be a sustained release. So can you control uh, this release for particular time? So for in, uh, for diabetic patients, uh, like it, it should depends on the uh, patient's condition, the release of the insulin. So can you control the uh, drug release uh, depending on the patient's condition or? If we 
carried the uh, uh, grafting ratio on polyurethane, or we grafted polyurethane on cyclodexin. So, so if we uh, optimize this ratio, we can uh, we can control the sustained release of drug. Okay, thank you, Shubham. I think there are no questions from the audience. So, thank you, Shubham, once again. So we shall move on to the next participant. The next one is uh, SIL 103, Swikriti Tripathi. Swikriti, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can share your presentation now. Okay, ma'am. So Swikriti Tripathi is from School of uh, Material Science and Technology, IIT Bhuvaneshwar. And her so, topic I'm is... From, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm from IIT BHU. Okay, IIT Bhuvaneshwar, is, is it? Um, is my screen visible? Yes, can you please uh, make it full screen? Yes, Is it visible now, full screen? Yes, you can start now. Uh, good afternoon to all panel members and also to the presenters. I'm speaking with Jibarth, a resource scholar from the School of Medical Science and Technology, IIT BHU. I will be giving a short invited lecture on graphene oxide based system for targeted drug delivery. So the, the contents of my lecturers uh, have included introduction, objective, methodology, experimental, experimentation, results, and conclusion for the system. So regarding uh, the interaction, since we know cancer is a very deadly disease and it is one of the leading cause of death worldwide, accounting for nearly 10 million deaths only in three years. So there are various treatments that are currently being uh, used for cancer, like uh, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Still, they, they have certain disadvantages that make them less efficient. Uh, for the cancer treatment, for example, we get the burst release of drug solubility, like uh, problem in solubility of drugs, and also the cancer treatments cause toxicity to the normal cells, and also they have certain side effects like anemia, and also uh, hair loss, loss of appetite, weight loss, and there are certain more side effects which are involved with the conventional cancer treatments. That's why we are using the novel drug delivery systems. So these drug delivery systems are basically engineered systems which are designed to overcome the certain uh, limitations and disadvantages so that we can efficiently deliver the drug to the desired disease site. So what happens is that basically a drug delivery system can consist of basically a four parts that uh, consist of uh, four things that we uh, mainly focus on that is on the route of delivery, on the delivery vehicle, on the cargo and also on the targeting strategies. So basically, my work is mainly to focus on the delivery vehicle. So for those vehicles, I'm using certain biomaterials, nanopolymers, uh, nanomaterials, polymers, and also their composite systems are mainly used these days as a vehicle for these drug delivery systems. So I have, as mentioned in my topic, I am using graphene oxide based drug delivery system. Uh, so I have. Uh, so the purpose of using graphene oxide is that it has various uh, advantages. For example, it is cheap and easy to synthesize. It has easy dispersion. It has a planar structure with high surface area. Also, it has low biocompatibility. And since it has certain functional groups like carboxylic group, hydroxyl group, and epoxy group attached attached to its surface, that's why we can. Uh, that's why it is easy to functionalize. And uh, it is one of the most efficient property of uh, the phenoxide. Uh, the oxide. The oxide has a, a really uh, vital role to uh, be used as a carrier as a, uh, for uh, these drug delivery systems, as they can increase the bioavailability and also they can uh, reduce the burst uh, release of the drugs and they can cause control release of the drug to the targeted cell. And these graphene oxides are also used for delivering other agents like genes or peptides or other uh, bioactive agents. 
the objective of my whole work is that the i will be uh, functionalizing graphene oxide such that i can uh, efficiently uh, deliver the, uh, the drug to the site uh, especially to uh, by a targeted delivery so for that i need to uh, add or i need to functionalize my graphene oxide with the targeting level and after my functionalization i will be uh, carrying various cellular uh, studies with viability uptake addition and drug delivery so the methodology which i have used that i have first synthesized my this is like a broad method uh, broad uh, thing which uh, i'll be doing so first i'll be synthesizing uh, and i'll be uh, synthesizing to modify graphene oxide then i'll be adding the drug and then further i'll be doing the studies so coming to the uh, experimental part first i have used uh, graphite plates and uh, then i have performed the modified uh, hammers method it is like well known where we use the kmno core for oxidizing agent in the presence of h2so4 and h3po4 so after fun after uh, uh, oxidation of the five flakes, we get graphene oxide and groups like epoxy group, hydroxy group and carboxy group gets introduced. And uh, for attaching to the linker, we use EDC and it is activation group, uh, which, uh, which attaches the linker group to the carboxyl group only. So for uh, before it was COH and then further, the carboxyl group gets modified to only C double bond and the G part is my linker part, which is attached for the targeting ability. So further after, uh, so for adding the drug, what I use that I basically uh, try to uh, chemically modify the system so that I can chemically attach the drug to the it. And so the linker gets, you can see that in the MGO drug system, the, my uh, linker further uh, gets attached to the D, the drug, thereby. Uh, this is the final system which I'm thinking of uh, working. So coming to the characterization, in the UV characterization, you can see that we have n to pi star transition at around 258 for the green oxide. And then further after modifying, we can see the red shift to 262 nanometers. And further after incorporation of drug, uh, major significant peak at 450 nanometer confirms my uh, incorporation of the drug doxorubicin. In the XRD section also, we can see that we have a distant peak at 10.2 around, which uh, confirms my oxidation of graphitic flakes. And further after uh, functionalization, this peak gets, uh, this peak is shifted to 7.7, uh, and uh, but thereby decreasing the crystallite size. And also there are two peaks, uh, which is pre uh, present at around 26, which uh, is due to residual graphite flakes, which might be present in my system as not all the graphite flakes uh, gets oxidized here. And uh, coming uh, to the FTIR, where we have a um, hydroxyl group uh, is present, which uh, confirms my uh, confirms uh, graphene oxide synthesis. And also you can see that there is a minor shifting of hydroxyl group in uh, all the three, um, in all in both the modified system further, which may confirm uh, my functionalization uh, to the graphene oxide. Also there is a new peak, uh, NH uh, new peak can be formed in my modified system, which thereby confirms my uh, addition to the lentil. And uh, also there is a new peak, which is formed of C double bond in, in my drug part, uh, which uh, may uh, confirm the chemical functionalization of my drug to the modified graphene oxide system. Uh, whereas in the uh, Raman, uh, we can uh, see that the ID by IG ratio was uh, my ID by IG ratio uh, for the graphene oxide it was around 0.8, and then as you further modify the distortion increase and the ratio increased from 0.8 to 0.96 for the modified graphene oxide. And also after addition of drug, the ratio further increased to 0.96 to 0.98. And it can also confirm that the drug has been incorporated to the modified graphene oxide system. Uh, below that, I have my SEM image. Uh, the SEM image for the graphene oxide, drug graphene oxide shows a flaky structure. Whereas for the modified in drug, uh, we can see that there are small uh, element, there are small structures which are present and which is comparatively increasing as compared to the graphene oxide, which might also confirm my uh, uh, functionalization to the pure graphene oxide.
Uh, I have performed the cellular studies. For the cellular studies, uh, for the cell viability study, I have done MTT assay. So for the MTT assay, I have taken HeLa cancer cell line. So I have performed the study for the two concentration, that is for the lowest 20 microgram per ml and for the 100 microgram per ml. The study was performed for uh, consecutively three days. And my study uh, shows that the modified graphene oxide system has more cell viability as compared to my pristine graphene oxide. As you can see that the cells, uh, more than 80% of the cells are viable in all the three cases for both the concentrations. So we can say that my modified graphene oxide is a biocompatible material. Below that, we also have the fluorescence image of the same MTT uh, study, which I did. And uh, I, also, I have also performed the cell arrangement study. As we know that uh, cell arrangement is a major part uh, for the it is very important for cell signaling and communication. So I have done a celebration using crystal violet assay. And in that, I, we can see that the modified Pokemon state system is more adapted to the cell as compared to the clear graphene uh, oxide system. Below also, below that I have shown my uh, the images for the same bright green image for the same um, cell addition studies. Since I have no, uh, not completed my whole uh, study of my whole uh, delivery part in that, so I am uh, presenting to this. My work is in a progress now. So for uh, till now, what I have done, uh, if I conclude that, then the modified system which I have synthesized displays more of cell viability, compatibility, and addition as compared to the failing graphene oxide. And also, the linker which I have attached for modifying the graphene oxide may also act as a targeting molecule which can directly deliver the uh, therapeutic agent to the cancer site thereby it will not affect the normal uh, cancer cells and uh, it can also thus it can also reduce the side effects which is a limitation for conventional treatments and also the system can also uh, be used to uh, deliver another agents like genes drugs and protein to the desired selected site so here are the references which are used and uh, thank you Thank you, Sweetie. Now the session is open for discussion. then I have a doubt like uh, okay, so uh, graphene oxide has some um, uh, negative impact on these active cells you know, normal cells so uh, will the modification can overrule this uh, no, uh, that, uh, it is thought that graphene oxide has normal uh, effect uh, it has like uh, negative effect on normal cells um, like I uh, um, Ma'am, actually, first of all, I am doing my studies on cancer cell. So I am uh, using a, a cancer, uh, like, a, uh, like a drug which can kill my cancer cells. I'm using doxorubicin hydrochloride. So ma'am, uh, the thing which I was trying to tell uh, is that the, the conventional treatments, they affect the nearby normal cells also. Like uh, the normal cells are also getting affected by the treatment strategies. So what I'm trying to make is that I'm trying to make a targeted system which can directly release my drug to the only cancer site. Ma'am, I am attaching the linker and that linker has only capability to release that the drug only to the cancerous site because that linker is redox responsive linkers. Thank you, Sweetie. Thank you. Is there any more questions from the audience? So I think there are no more questions. We shall move on to the next speaker. So the ne next one is SIL 104 by Sri Hari K S.
in the department of physics and electronics christ university bangalore sri hari are you there hello sri hari ah yes yeah, yeah. you can present now yeah. please share your presentation yeah, yeah, sure. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I start now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, what my work is based on, like a detection of a toxic metal, heavy metal, with the help of a carbon nano material derived from a medicinal plant, by utilizing its fluorescent properties. So, like as we all know. Uh, so the contents of my presentation will be the introduction and how I synthesis my precursor and the results and discussion for that and also the future works. So as we start, we all know that carbon dots, which is being the latest advancement or which is the latest introduction to the carbon family has uh, very much unique properties like the optical properties, uh, photoluminescence, chemical properties and the biocombability. So, one major thing which we concentrated, which I concentrated here, is the photoluminance properties because because of their excellent uh, how they adjust with, or how they can easily detect the changes in the fl fluorescent level and how they easily react with the light and the interaction between other particles here. So uh, we thought that why not not use this fluorescent property to detect the heavy metals. In this. So uh, so the one major heavy metal which we concentrated is the Heavy metal cadmium, and uh, as we all know, it is one of the most poisonous metals as far as human beings are concerned. Because if consumed, they can lead to the effects of uh, nervous systems and other kidney related issues. And also, one thing that uh, it is cadmium is not good, anything it is not something which is beneficial for us. And uh, also, that when consumed, it can also bring psychological changes and behavioral changes in both humans as well as animals. So that is one thing which alarmed us and there are even though there are already existing chemical sensors which can be used to detect cadmium but then again a need of a greener and a more convenient method was still lacking so what what we thought of was bringing out a producing a carbon precursor which which is again synthesis with using a greener dot which can actually bring detect this cadmium and sense the amount of cadmium in our sample or any other thing. So what we did was we took a help of a medicinal plant, which is the Justicia vinaria leaves or commonly known as the Candacea leaves. So what we chose here, the hydrothermic method, because again, that was again a clean, cleaner and a greener method, which didn't involve any chemicals. So we, sub, we took out the leaf and then we made out a concentrated solution using that. So we prepared a concentrated solution by boiling the leaves in one liter of water. And then that was again reduced to 500 ml by heating it. So this liquid was uh, subjected to hydrothermal method at a temperature of 200 degrees for so 10 hours. And uh, the solution which you obtained after the hydrothermal method was uh, centrifuged at 1000, 10,000 RPM and then filtered using a 0.1 micron molar sheet. So what we got was, so after that, what we did was we needed to find out the emission, emission of how these carbon dots or the carbon nanomaterial which we got and how the fluorescent properties actually work on it. So what we did was we took a fluorescent study of it, which is the like the PL studies, and we could find out that the, it had a dual emission kind of like a mechanism. And we could find out that the maximum emission wavelengths was at 570 nanometer. So as we as what we then planned was what we did is we did a quenching mechanism. What so what actually we did was we prepared the cadmium uh, so cadmium uh, solutions from the standard salts, so like the varying one molar, one millimolar, and one micromolar, and, and again similarly one nanomolar solutions were made from the corresponding standard salts. And what we did was we added this to the solution, the solution which we obtained after the uh, centrifuge and the filtration. So the carbon the solution contained the carbon nanoparticle and this cadmium solution was mixed up and then again subjected for the fluorescence. So what we could see that uh, the, even for the nano, nanomolar region, even for the nanomolar solution, the carbon dot showed the carbon graph or the fluorescent graph showed some quenching. So 
what can you crunching is that it has the added solution that is the cadmium and the carbon dots produced inside the proton which is present inside the solution they kind of interacted chemically or biologically or physically so what happened was uh, due to this interaction some kind of energy was lost so in the graph that it is already seen that also the top one is the normal emission graph without adding any solution that is a cadmium solution and we can see that even for a nanomolar range we can find out some kind of degrees in the point so, so we can see a crunch in the graph so with the help of this we could find out that the solution which we prepared or the carbon nanomaterial which we prepared was able to detect uh, cadmium even at a level of nanomolar region so which is again a good result for us so with that we we tried to plot a stern warm up probe and trying to follow the detection limit so what we could find was it could detect up to up to a range of 5.25 235 nanomolar which is a, like a really good result so that is the entire conclusion of our work so we could produce a carbon dots from the novel precursor which is a justicia vinaria leaves and uh, which is a hydrothermal method again a green method so we were successful in that and the carbon dots again showed uh, the outstanding optical properties and we could see that it showed a detection limit of 5.235 when we used it as a fluorescent probe for detecting cadmium and uh, so again still this is like a starting work so what we can add to it is that the quenching which is happening here was a dynamic quenching so again the quenching constant varies with temperature so what we can do is i had prepared the sample at a 200 degree celsius so maybe uh, we can prepare the sample at say higher temperature say 220 or 240 and then try out the same experiment maybe hopefully we can get a better result and a better detection limit for that and then also another future work for this can be thought of like uh, doping our carbon dot solution with uh, other particles or composite like maybe like zinc oxide or any other oxides so that it gives a better fluorescence since as we get better fluorescence so a better detection limit for it um so yeah, so these are the few references and uh, thank you thank you srihari now the session is open for discussion Hi, Sri How you have purified your carbon net uh, synthesis from hydrothermal method? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? How you have, how, how you have purified your carbon net? What? 500? How you have purified after synthesis by hydrothermal method? Yeah, yeah. So we, 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 it was purified. The water was, uh, it was boiled and we filtered it. Uh, filter size. What filter size was 0.1 micrometer. But here came uh, CD size is too much small, no? Then that was your filter micron size. Yeah, we use right? the 0.1 micrometer uh, filter size. So. Yes. And how will you see that the other particles are removing? Yeah. Before that, so we had concentrated the solution. So, and with the help of that, that may be a. So we made sure that. No, no, no. I am not talking that. I am asking that. The impurities of the uh, uh, reactants okay. that will also uh, will go through this uh, filter paper. No? Either you have to uh, do column or you can basically you have to do column if you uh, want to get the purified carbon. It is better to do column chromatography and it separate it out and then check the same purity level. And uh, one thing you say I told that uh, you observe for dynamic quenching. Uh, did you perform the lifetime experiment? Which one? Fluorescence lifetime experiment. <clears throat> a fluorescent lifetime, uh, we haven't yet done that. So, only thing which okay, I did was the fluorescent fluorescence and then the quenching part. And what do you think? What is the mechanism of this uh, sensing? I mean, what happens with this carbon dot and when we are putting CD? Uh, fluorescence is going down. That's your that is obvious. Uh, your uh, your 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 object from screen. Yeah. What is the problem mechanism of quenching? Yeah, it was a dynamic quenching mechanism. In which way? Uh, either crystal reagents, reagent and spark, or PET. Something you have to tell the mechanism about. No? Why it's a quench? Why quenching in the sense that uh, the cadmium molecules were interacting with the carbon dots which were in the solution. So, again, there was an energy transfer and energy change in that solution. 
Yes, yes, you have to yeah. I mean, uh, you have to show the mechanism, otherwise it's very difficult to understand why it's happening, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank yeah. you for the Okay. Thing. Okay. Thank you so much. Any more questions from the audience? I think uh, there are no more questions. So thank you, Sri Hari, for your presentation. Yeah. So we shall move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much for this opening. Thank you, Sri Hari. So the next speaker is SIL 105, Loganathan G, from the Department of Microbiology, School of Life Science, Pondicherry University, India. Ma'am. It's Adam, audible, Logan, Adam, please. Yeah, you are audible. Can you please share your presentation? Ma'am, it's simple, ma'am. Can you open your slides now? We can see your okay. screen. Yeah. Um, now it's fine. Now it's, now it's fine. fine. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, Please start. Myself, Lok Punadan, uh, research scholar, Department of Microbiology, Pondicherry University. And my research topic is in vitro bicompatibility assessment and of by phytofabricated selenium nanoparticles for biopotential applications. In coming to the introduction, um, antibiotic resistance and the food safety have become the two major uh, health hampers for the public, government, and regulatory agencies in the last two decades. Other, the use of the synthetic antioxidants, like, um, food additives, is one of the most concerns in the food industries because they insist the food digestive food disorders. Disorders. Among the nanomaterials, the selenium nanoparticles have been widely accepted in biomedicine, food science, due to their low toxicity and high biocompatibility. And selenium, selenium is also a trace element which is required for the human. For in from 40 to uh, 300 mg per as a daily supplement and selenium and its nanoparticles have a high potent free radical scavenging activity in both in vitro and in vivo conditions and selenium nanoparticles can be synthesized physical chemical and biological approaches in the biological uh, synthesis the selenium nanoparticles were performed with the help of microorganisms on the plants but coming to the the use of plant materials for the synthesis of nanoparticles might be beneficial over the microbial synthesis by eliminating the extravagant procedures for the maintaining of the cultures. And these are the plants which have been used in previous studies for the synthesis of selenium nanoparticles. And, the, and we, in, in our study, we first reported for the quick synthesis of selenium nanoparticles from the Emblica officinalis. Emblica officinalis is, a, uh, is known as a Phylanthes emblica, which belongs to the family of Phylanthes, Phylanthesi and the genus Phylanthes, and which edible, fruit, edible fruits were widely used in the Indian Ayurvedic medicine. The Emblica officinalis is a rich source of phenolics, flavonoids, tannins that play a key role in reducing and regulating the shape of the nanoparticles. And coming to the synthesis, optimization, and characterization of the selenium nanoparticles. Uh, First, we synthesized the selenium nanoparticles and optimized and further the synthesized nanoparticles were characterized with UV, DLS, FTR, Raman, XRD, SEM, and TEM. And this is the brief synthesis of selenium nanoparticles. In this, the fruits were uh, collected from the uh, local market and the, the fruits were further washed and sliced, ground, uh, extracted, and the extracted uh, fruits, the extract was further filtered and filtered was for, stored for the uh, uh, synthesis. The, the final fruit extract and the sodium selenide were mixed with one is to one ratio and uh, in one is to one ratio under the ma uh, magnetic stirrer for 24 hours uh, there was a color change from colorless to uh, red color which is an indication of the selenium nanoparticle formation and later further the crude selenium nanoparticles were washed thrice with uh, uh, sterile distilled water into two pure uh, selenium nanoparticles the selenium nanoparticles were further dried uh, and uh, stored at 4 degrees centigrade for uh, further characterization and uh, applications. And this is the optimization of the selenium nanoparticles. We take we, we took different uh, concentrations of sodium selenide, that is A, B, C, D, E, as uh, different concentrations, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 10 are the different uh, volumes of the uh, uh, 
plant extract were added and uh, so we optimized and but the, the ph of we also optimized with the help of the ph but uh, at the lower ph at lower ph and the uh, and the higher ph there was uh, the sedimentation of the nanoparticles after uh, appeared which clearly shows that the at no, not all ph only the, there is a the formation of nanoparticles is good which was confirmed with the help of uv visible spectroscopy and this is the formation of nanoparticles at 0 hours 12 hours and 24 hours and coming to the characterization of the slim nanoparticles first we characterized with the uh, uv visible spectroscopy we found the peak at 270 nanometers which is an agreement with the earlier reports and uh, the dls we found the nanoparticles of range of 20 to 70 nanometers with the quality specific index 0 0.2 uh, and found the zeta potential at minus 24 degree minus 24 millivolts which is uh, clearly shows that the nanoparticles were negatively charged and uh, we are coming to the FTR the functional groups uh, the, the groups the functional groups present in the plant extract were responsible for the uh, formation of the nanoparticles were determined with the help of uh, FTR and coming to the to found the nature of the nanoparticles were determined with the help of preliminary he confirmed with the help of Raman uh, the peak at 253 and the uh, extra the broad uh, Bragg's peak which is an indication of the, the selenium nanoparticles were amorphous in nature and the size of the nanoparticles were determined with the help of SEM uh, and confirmed with the help of uh, TEM uh, and coming to the composition of the nanoparticles were determined with the help of UDX and next coming to the in vitro biocompatibility assessment of phytopublicates to selenium nanoparticles the biocompatibility of the selenium nanoparticles were associated with the various cytotoxic assays such as MTT and live and dead cell assays. And the molecular me mechanism held behind the biocompatibility was studied with the help of MMP and caspase 3 assays. First, coming to the MMP, the MTT and live and dead cell assays. The MTT and live and dead cell assays were studied uh, and, and taken, micro studied as the concentration of the sodium sulfide metal precursor and the concentration of the uh, selenium nanoparticles increases the viability of the cells decreases decreased which was confirmed with the help of mtt and uh, live and dead cell assays as uh, but the uh, when compared with the sodium sulfide metal precursor our selenium nanoparticles are 10 times lower like toxic when when compared with this um, metal precursor which was shown in the figure uh, and by the MTT and the dead cell assay, uh, live on dead cell assays, we found the IC50s and IC90 values for the sodium sulfide and uh, selenium nanoparticles. And these are the uh, microscopic images of uh, cells. At, uh, uh, when the cells were treated with IC50s and IC90s of sodium sulfide and uh, uh, selenium nanoparticles with uh, positive and negative controls. This is the uh, images of uh, live on dead cell images, images of uh, of the, when, when the cells treated with uh, IC50s of sodium sunlight and IC50s of uh, uh, selenium nanoparticles and uh, the, when the sun, green fluorescence is an indication of live cells and red fluorescence is an indication for the formation of uh, uh, dead cells and uh, coming to the molecular mechanism held behind the um, cytotoxic activity was uh, determined with the help of MMP and caspase activity uh, the method was uh, assessed with the help of rhodamine 123 staining and its fluorescence strength is directly proportional to the MMP levels. And the caspase protein activity was determined with the help of caspase 3 assay. And as, uh, as the concentration of the sodium sunlight and the selenium nanoparticles increases, the MMP levels decreases and the uh, caspase uh, protein levels increases, which is an indication of the cells undergoes into the apoptosis. And this is the images of uh, fluorescence of. Uh, green fluorescence of the MMP levels, which is an indication for the uh, directly proportional to the uh, MMP levels. As the fluorescence uh, decreases, the, the MMP levels uh, decreases, and the whereas caspase levels increases. Coming to the, the present study, the sodium sulfide and the selenium nanoparticles have depleted the MMP and elevated the caspase reactivity in dose-dependent manner. The study also concluded that sodium sunlight and the selenium nanoparticles induces the cytotoxicity by apoptosis process through depleting the MMP levels. However, the sodium sunlight has depleted the MMP and elevated the caspase activity at lower levels compared to the selenium nanoparticles. And these results were in accordance with the cytotoxic assays. And next, coming to the uh, 
uh, anti uh, oxidant activities of the selenium nanoparticles the free radical scavenging activity was uh, selenium nanoparticles were determined by the help of dpth and apts assays uh, and uh, we found the ec50 of the selenium nanoparticles and the ascorbic acid and uh, uh, the uh, Antioxidant activity of the selenium nanoparticles and ascorbic acid were dose dependent. Uh, our selenium nanoparticles shows a potent uh, comparable results with that of standard ascorbic acid. And com coming to the conclusion, in the present studies the phyto shows the phytofabrication of selenium nanoparticles from aqueous fruit extract of emblica optionalis with the facile, green, and economic and eco friendly approach. The synthesized selenium nan nanoparticles exhibited high, highly stable, negative charge, amorphous nature, spherical shape with nano size. The sodium selenite have inhibited the solvability at lower concentrations compared to the selenium nanoparticles. So the sodium selenite has depleted the MMP and elevated the caspase reactivity at much lower levels compared to the selenium nanoparticles. Uh, the selenium nanoparticles also uh, shows a potent free radical scavenging activity. It was uh, found to be comparable with the standard antioxidant ascorbic acid. So the selenium nanoparticles have been to, can be used tremendously to be applied in the pharmaceutical, biomedical, food industries exclusively as antioxidant agent. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Thank you. Uh, now the session is open for discussion. Other than the theoretical, uh, this type of application where we can use this selenium, this nanoparticles. No. Where all where all other things we can apply this selenium nanoparticles. Anti we can use as also antimicrobial agent and antifungal. Also we can use. Already we tested. Okay. Okay. Then you have to speak about uh, FTIR. So yes. we have talked about some of the functional groups. So which I can name some of the functional groups which you have found out of the important ones. Oh, um, main, majorly amide groups uh, amide groups are responsible for the formation of selenium nanoparticles, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions? I think there are no more questions. We shall move on to the next speaker. And once again, thank you, Loganathan, for your excellent presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So the next participant is uh, SIL 106, Dona Merisa from Stella Maris College, Chennai. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, can you please share your presentation? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, is my slides visible? Yes, ma'am. You may stand now. Okay. Good afternoon all. I am Ms. Donna Merisam, Research Scholar, Department of Chemistry, Stella Maris College. I have done this work under the supervision and guidance of Dr. Mary Ennell, Head Department of Chemistry, Stella Maris College. So uh, for the topic for today is fabrication of flexible symmetric wearable supercapacitor from polymer nanocomposites and their antimicrobial anti studies. Coming to the introduction, supercapacitors. Supercapacitor is also known as an ultra capacitor. It's a high capacitor that bridges the gap between electrolytic capacitors and rechargeable batteries by having a capacitance value significantly higher than the ordinary capacitors, but with a lower voltage restrictions. And they have high specific power, moderate energy density, excellent reversibility, eco-friendly nature, and long lifetime. They are showing high power densities and can be fully discharged or charged in seconds and it is suitable for large instantaneous current densities. It is highly dependent upon the surface area of the electrode. 
mainly supercapacitors are classified into different types that is electro electric double layer capacitors pseudo capacitors and the pseudo capacitors are again classified into metal oxides and conducting polymers our main focus is based on this metal oxides and conducting polymers some of the applications of supercapacitors in the present scenario is uh, supercapacitors are used as medical biomedical implants and uh, they are used as wearable electronics materials and method the materials which we have used for the synthesis of this polymer nanocomposite is cobalt oxide nanoparticle and conducting polymer orthophenyl diamine first uh, the synthesis of cobalt oxide nanoparticles using drumstick ports the drumstick ports were dried and they kept under uh, sun for 10 days then the drumstick port extract were kept for uh, stirring and it is uh, diluted with the cobalt oxide hexanitrate and pvp were uh, PVP were added in drops, then NH were NH also added to reduce the pH and to get precipitated. Finally, uh, uh, it was filtered and dried at 100 degrees Celsius for four hours and calcinated at 500 degrees Celsius for two hours to form the cobalt oxide nanoparticles. Coming to the synthesis of uh, polyorthophenyl diamine. Uh, ammonium persulfate in one millimolar of HCl were taken and to that OPD were mixed and uh, we were taken these uh, solutions in a round bottom flask and it is subjected to microwave irradiation. Uh, then it is uh, filtered and collected and finally the POPD that is our uh, uh, polyphenyl orthodiamine polymer were obtained. Next is preparation of uh, POPD, that is cobalt oxide nanocomposite. Uh, 0.2 gram of uh, POPD were dissolved in 10 ml of, 10 ml of tetrahydrofuran and uh, 5, 10, 15 and 20 concentrations of cobalt oxide were dissolved in tetrahydrofuran. All the solutions were sonicated in a bath sonicator for 15 minutes and, uh, uh, and cobalt oxide uh, nanoparticles and POPD were also uh, mixed together and it is stirred continuously for 28 hours which forms 5, 10 and 15 and 20 percentage of POPD1 polymer nanocomposites respectively. This is the swell oxal which we set up for the electrochemical studies of the synthesized samples. It, uh, it contains a coated fabric uh, which, is, which is act as both cathode and anode and a separator of PVA KOH film which is also uh, behave as the electrolyte. Uh, this is the result and discussion part. That first one is the UV visible absorption spectroscopy. The main prominent peaks which is absorbed for POPD are 295, 380, and 550, which corresponds to the pi to pi star transition of benzenoid rings, and 380 corresponds for the genoid imine units. 550 responds for the n to pi star transitions from the non bonding electron pairs on the nitrogen atom. This is the UV visible absorption spectro, uh, spectrum we have got for cobalt oxide nanoparticle and POPD1 and its corresponding wavelength and absorption are listed here. 40, 435 uh, corresponds for the O2 minus to CO2 plus charge transfer transition and 748 for the O2 minus and CO3 plus charge transmission. 550 responds for the secondary interactions of cobalt oxide with these non-bonding electrons leading to the effective formation of nanocomposites. This is the top plot which we have uh, got for uh, POPD and POPD1. Here we can see that the band gap is found to be 1.8 electron volt for POPD and band gap is found to be 1.4 electron volt for POPD1, which infers that lowering of band gap for the nanocomposite indicates greater conductivity of the nanocomposite POPD1. This is the FTR spectrum which we have uh, obtained for uh, the POPD, cobalt oxide nanoparticle and uh, POPD. And uh, the main uh, functional groups are enlisted here. 335 uh, corresponds for primary amine, 16864 for quinoid structure, 16284 for carbonyl group, and 1368 for amide group, and 117 for the CH in-plane bending vibrations. This is the XRD pattern which have, we have obtained for the POPD and the POPD1. Uh, the peaks and the diffractive peaks uh, shows that the peaks arise from the incorporation of cobalt oxide nanoparticles in the polymer matrix and they are well in accordance with the JCPDS card number. Therefore, the effective formation of these nano nanocomposites can be confirmed through the diffractograms. Scanning electron microscopy, which is used to analyze the surface morphologies of the uh, synthesized samples. Here we can see that the same images of cobalt oxide nanoparticles uh, with the lower and higher magnification. 
the morphology of bare polymer nanocomposites and the nanoparticles are given in the images uh, cobalt oxide exhibits a spherical morphology with the evidence of agglomeration here and the average diameter of the nanosphere is found to be 17.6 nanometers this is the EDAC spectrum energy dispersive x-ray analysis which we have got for popd and the popd1 which shows that uh, the elemental mapping depicts that the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are the constituent elements of bare polymer material and the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and cobalt are the no, uh, constituent elements of nanocomposite material. The homogeneous distribution of cobalt oxide nanoparticles can be reaffirmed by its white percentage of 41.37 percentage. This is the thermogravimetric analysis which we have done for our POPD and uh, POPD1 which shows that the first degradation peak is observed at 280 and the, the for popd it is of popd1 it is observed at 9 290 and second degradation is uh, for 380 and uh, for popd it is 580 which responds that which infer that higher thermal stability is due to the incorporation of nanoparticles the additional of minimal amounts of nanoparticles the polymer matrix increases the thermal stability to a greater extent and the char residue for popd is found to be 32.30 percentage and for popd1 it is found to be 49.29 percentage nanoparticles can act as a barrier to the transfer of heat and protect to the polymer against degradation of all uh, degradation leading to a higher charge residues moving to the cyclic voltammetric uh, analysis of uh, synthesized samples of popd and popd1 this is the cyclic voltagrams of uh, popd and popd1 which shows that a quasi rectangular shape which is an indicative of pseudo capacitive characteristics this can be attributed to the introduction of electron rich heterograms in the heteroatoms in the polymer matrices which influences the electron mobility and in turn the charge storage characteristics we have done the specific capacitance values for 5 to 100 millivolt per second and we have found out that the specific capacitance is high for popd1 compared to popd that is 189.65 and for popd it is 176.02 this is the chronopotentiometric curves for popd and popd1 which represents the charge discharge profile of the bare polymer and the nanocomposite at the current densities of 1 to 5 ampere per gram at a potential range of 0 0.4 to uh, minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.0 volt from the discharge profiles we can we could say that the discharge patterns are triangular in shape and the samples exhibits discharge time and their rapid charging characteristics which is also implying that there is a pseudo capacitive behavior in the synthesized polymer nanocomposites and uh, the discharge time also increases from the bare polymer to the nanocomposites indicating enhanced electrochemical performances on the addition of cobalt oxide nanoparticles to the polymer matrix this is the electrochemical impedance uh, values which we have got for uh, uh, synthesized nanocomposites. Uh, we have used the Randall circuit and this corresponding uh, uh, values are enlisted here. And the fitting parameters were in the table. R1 is the solution resistance, R2 is the charge transfer resistance and C1 is the capacitance. And we have used uh, SIMFIN software to fit this uh, circuit using the Nyquist plot. POPD exhibits the higher charge transfer resistance and thus lower conductivity when compared to POPD1. The higher conductivity can be attributed to the pseudo capacitance arising from the incorporation of cobalt oxide nanoparticles in the polymer matrix. And finally, this is an antibacterial study which we have done for our uh, polymer nanocomposites. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, bacteria which we have used for this study is where Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas aerogenes and uh, the control we used is, sorry, the standard we have used is streptomycin. And all the sh samples showed antibacterial activity compared to that of the control and the highest antibacterial activity was observed for POPD1 followed by POPD. The presence of cobalt oxide in POPD1 contributes the high antibacterial efficacy of the nanocomposites. nanocomposites. Nanoparticles are reported to produce reactive oxygens uh, which inhibit the bacterial strains and uh, we could say that uh, POPD1 which shows the highest, highest antibacterial efficacy due to the incorporation of our heteroatom cobalt oxide. 
let me conclude by saying that in this present work uh, based on fabrication of flexible symmetric wearable supercapacitor from polymer nanocomposites and their antimicrobial studies mainly focuses the synthesis of polymer nanocomposites of polyorthophenyl diamine and cobalt oxide uh, cobalt oxide was synthesized using a green root using moringa oil for a plant extract and a specific capacitance of 186 0.4 Faraday per gram was observed for POPD1 nanocomposite based device at a charge density of 1 ampere per gram. And the overall results suggest that this nanocomposite can be used as textiles for therapeutic applications and the future scope of the present in investigation thus involves the application of this materials as coatings for textile used surgical applications. From all the results, we could suggest that uh, there is a successful incorporation of our cobalt oxide nanoparticle, the bare polymer. That's why we got a higher specific capacitance with compared to our bare polymers. These are the references which we ha I have used for the studies. Thank you all. Thank you, Donna, for your presentation. Now the session is open for discussion. Donna, I have a small query that uh, why POPD showed an uh, inferior thermal property when compared to POPD1? Uh, Ma'am, it's because of the incorporation of metal oxide only. POPD1 shows higher thermal stability. Why? Because the cobalt oxides can give uh, higher thermal stability. Uh, that's why they have shown uh, the second degradation peak difference from 280 to 290 degrees Celsius. Thank you, Donna. Okay, ma'am. Any other questions from the audience? So, thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. We shall, we shall move on to the next speaker. The next one is... Ankita Dhiman from School of Basic Science and Advanced Material Research Center. IIT Mandi. Yes, ma'am. Kita, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can present now. Okay, ma'am. Please share your presentation. Yeah. Ma'am, my presentation is visible. Yes, uh, can you please put on to the full screen mode? Yeah, ma'am. Last time I wow. had a problem yes. with that. Uh, I, I wasn't okay. able to move my slide. So now it is moving. Yeah, it's moving now. It's perfect. Please continue. Okay, ma'am. Thanks. Good afternoon, one and all. Myself, Ankita, and I'm a PhD student at School of Basic Science at IIT Mandi. Today, I'm here to present my research work entitled Development of pH and Redox Responsive Sodium Alginate Nanoparticles for Controlled Agrochemical Delivery. And the content of my presentation is divided into five parts. First one is introduction. Then I will show you the fabrication of OALGDP nanoparticles, their characterization, agrochemical release studies, followed by conclusion. First of all, introduction. Here, I will explain why we are interested in agrochemical, sac agrochemical sectors and why we are choosing this uh, topic. And uh, as we all know that world population is increasing very fastly and it will reach 9 billion by 2048, which is a huge number. So the requirement of food will also increase. This graph is showing the global progress in food consumption where by 2030, every person need more and more food resources for their survival. And as I discussed here, the population will reach 9 billion by 2048. So to meet the demand of food for this huge population, we need to enhance the agricultural output. But 
there are several factors in the agricultural field which affect the agricultural yield like diseases the attack of insects and pests even the unwanted weeds which is growing besides the crop can also adversely affect the agricultural output so people start using different type of insecticides fungicides and herbicides to get rid of all these factors and even they are providing uh, nutrients to the plant so that the quality as well as the productivity of the crop can be increased although all these substances are good for agriculture but still there are several challenges in the agricultural sector that needs to be addressed and these challenges are excessive usage of fertilizer insecticides and low moisture retention ability of the soil and which leads to consequences like eutrophication leaching infertile soil salt burn and nutrients runoff and researchers are continuously working in agricultural sector to address these challenges so by taking the motivation from the work which has already been done we fabricated a polymer based material to reduce these challenges and this is the journal schematic representation to fabricate oalg dp nanoparticles where first step is the oxidation of sodium alginate and this oxidized moiety was further treated with a cross linker containing nh2 which on combination uh, leads to the formation of oalg dp nanoparticles and these particles were further utilized for diuron loading which is a modal herbicide and the release was checked in different millimolar concentration of gsh and ph variation so firstly we have taken the dls spectra for uh, our particles and we found that the hydrodynamic diameter is 286 nanometer and the zeta potential was minus 36 millivolt which showed the uh, positive cha uh, negatively charge negative charge on the surface of particle as well as the good stability of particle for longer duration of time after that the morphology of the prepared nano formulation was checked by a scanning electron microscopy which was showing the uh, mean size of 161 plus minus 21 nanometer as my as i uh, as my title of the presentation is ph and redox responsive particles so after that we check the ph and redox responsiveness of our particle by adding uh, different millimolar concentration of hcl and gsh into the dispersion of our particle and we found that after 24 hour of treatment a clear solution was there which was due to the breakdown of acyl hydrazone bonds in the presence of hcl and disulfide bonds in the presence of 50 millimolar gsh after that the regeneration of particle was also monitored on addition of base and an oxidizing agent so this experiment shows us that our particle is ph as well as redox responsive after that the regeneration of particle was further confirmed with scanning electron microscopy in ph responsive media and redox responsive media then uh, the starting material the intermediates even the cross linker and the particles were further characterized by ftir and the particle was showing the additional peak at 1665 cm inverse which was due to the carbon double bond n which is formed in the particle by a condensation reaction between carbonyl group of oxidized moiety and nh2 group of of our cross linker so after successfully confirming that our particles are prepared then we load our particle with a modal herbicide that is diuron and we found that the loading efficiency is 7.6% in this case and encapsulation efficiency was 84.4% then these loaded particles were further utilized to check the release in different millimolar concentration of gsh 
and in different variation of pH. And we found that in case of uh, GSH, two millimolar was showing the slow and sustained release for longer duration of time. And in case of pH 5, the release is sustained. And by sustaining the release for longer duration of time, we can cope up with the uh, one challenge that is the excessive usage of agrochemical. We can minimize it so that the its adverse effect on the environment can be nullified. After that, the reduced form of these particles was further utilized to capture these two metal ions. And these two metal ions are uh, present uh, in paddy field, and it is very harmful for plants. And when our particles com uh, combine with these metal ions, they form a complex, and their absorption by plant can be uh, reduced. So its adverse effect on plant can be nullified by, use, uh, by using reduced form of particle. At last, I would, I uh, am concluding my presentation by saying that, that my particles are biocompatible, biodegradable, and dual responsive. And we are using less agrochemical so that adverse effect on environment can be reduced. Apart from that, it is showing control release for uh, around 3 ATR. And we can use these type of systems for loading micronutrients, fungicides, insecticides, which can improve plant viability and productivity. At last, I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Garima Agarwal, for her co constant support and guidance, my lab mates, IIT Mandi and AMRC for instrumentation facilities, MHRD, SERV for financial support, ICN 2022 for providing me this opportunity to present my work in front of everyone. Thank you. That's all now. Thank you, Ankita. Now the session is open for discussion. Hello. I think there are no questions from the audience. Is there any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you, Ankita, for your excellent presentation. We shall move on to the next speaker. Thank you, ma'am. So the next speaker is uh, SIL 108, Anu Rose Chakur, from School of Chemical Science, Mahatma Gandhi University. Anurosh Chakku, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you please share your presentation? OK, OK. Hello, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, you may start now. OK, ma'am. Good evening, all, and welcome to my presentation. I am Anarosh Chako. Uh, first of all, let me thank all organizers of uh, ICN 2022 to, be, to give this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, let us start the uh, presentation. The topic is uh, selective detection of Mercury and amoxicillin through electrochemical switch on of response of carbon content dot. Uh, the presentation is uh, structured as follows. Introduction, characterization, results and discussion and conclusion. On moving to the introduction, 
carbon quantum dots are zero dimensional non carbon nanomaterials it has a uh, quasi spherical morphology and its size of less than 10 nanometer it shows unique properties and potential applications uh, they possess attractive uh, properties like chemical inertness resistance high stability to photo bleaching bright fluorescence low toxicity excellent uh, solubility and biocompatibility application of cds include sensing bioimaging drug, drug delivery photocatalysis electrocatalysis and ele electronics we are adopt we are adopted electrochemical uh, sensing for the study uh, next is preparation of uh, carbon quantum dots i am synthesizing carbon quantum dot from waste paper through uh, hydrothermal method uh, for this uh, synthesis uh, 3 gram of waste paper weighed in a beaker and 100 ml deionized water added to it sonicated for 30 minutes after sonication uh, transferred the solution into a stainless steel autoclave under high pressure and temperature it turns to carbon quantum dots uh, the obtained uh, solutions and refuge filtered and stored at low temperature um, the synthesized uh, carbon quantum dot were uh, characterized by various techniques first of all uh, uv visible spectra the optical uh, properties of cd was measured using uv visible uh, spectroscopy two peaks are obtained at uh, 205 and 275 nanometer uh, 205 corresponds to the uh, pi to pi star transition uh, of uh, c double bond c and 250 to uh, 75 corresponds to the and two pi star uh, transition of c double bond o uh, next is FTIR. Mm. The functional uh, group of C, uh, CDs were identified using FTIR spectroscopy. Uh, presence of different oxygen uh, functionalities um, uh, uh, presence of, uh, were confirmed by uh, the spectra. Mm. Next is XRD. The broad uh, peak between uh, 20 degree, 20 to 40 degree corresponds to uh, 0, 0, to plane of graphene, so it confirms the um, amorphous character of uh, synthesized CD. Uh, next is Raman spectra. Uh, the uh, structural features of uh, synthesized CD were uh, further examined by uh, Raman spectroscopy. Mm, the spectrum shows uh, D band and G band. It, con uh, it confirms the, the presence of sp2 and sp3 carbon. Um, next. Uh, HR time and SPS. Uh, the size and morphology of synthesized uh, uh, CQD were analyzed using um, HR time, and the average size was obtained. Uh, the average size obtained was uh, 4.87 nanometer. Now, finally, XPS uh, measurement were carried out uh, to know the uh, chemical state of oxygen, carbon, and oxygen. Uh, on moving to the electrochemical metal drug study, um, uh, this was explained through switch on of platform. Um, we carried out electrochemical switch on of sensing uh, in 0 0.1 molar phosphate buffer solution after uh, practical optimization. Uh, first, we screened um, CDs uh, affinity towards uh, different metal different metals metal ions and only uh, mercury ion shows with significant redox peak uh, among the other metal ions hence it was uh, termed as um, switch on state uh, the uh, dpv dpv and cv were used to check the uh, effect of concentration of mercury uh, the calibration uh, the calibration plot shows uh, based on the calibration uh, plot we get 5.5 uh, nanomolar as the limit of, limit of detection mm. the next stability study and and the interference study of synthesized CQD uh, the stability of CQD was monitored uh, daily mm. uh, after 25 days uh, the uh, there was a small decrease in current response uh, compared to 
the initial uh, response uh, current response and inter under, uh, anti interference study of cd revealed that redox signal of uh, mercury cd was unchanged with other metals next we uh, examined the affinity of cds towards the different drugs uh, then we found that um, peak current of uh, mer uh, mercury cd decreased in the presence of amoxicillin out of other drugs hence it, this uh, dictation was uh, uh, termed as switch off state again deep, oh, sorry again bpv and uh, cv uh, were used to uh, check the uh, effect of concentration of amoxicillin we get 16.3 nanomolar as limit of dictation um, uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy was used to know the electrochemical electron transfer resistance of cd and uh, its um, analyte complexes uh, the uh, peak current is decreased uh, then resistance is decreased uh, the surface uh, so the surface of semi circle uh, is also decreased uh, it also confirms the uh, proposed switch on of mechanism uh, confirm uh, mechanism next conclusion um, metal free carbon dots from waste paper was successfully synthesized and characterized uh, the uh, in the cd fabricated uh, the cd fabricated gc electrode were used to used for the electrochemical sensing of mercury ion and amoxicillin the electrochemical response of wpcd towards the mercury ion and amoxicillin was studied and optimized with cv and bpv uh, the limit of detection of mercury and ion uh, mercury and amoxicillin was 5.5 uh, 5 and 16 0.3 nanomole respectively. Uh, combining all the uh, characterization and electrochemical uh, results, the developed uh, CD uh, as a successful electrochemical switch, electrochemical switch uh, on off switch. This is all about my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anuros Chaku. For your presentation, the session is now open for discussion. So, I think there are no more questions from the audience. So, we shall move to the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anu. So, the next speaker is Azile 109, Sujitra S. Mishra. Sujitra, are you there? Sujitra S. Mishra. I think she has not joined. Let us move on to the next session. So now let us conclude the short invited session on biomedical applications. I congratulate all the participants who has presented their work. So congratulations. Uh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Yes, uh, yes. Ma'am, myself, Ruksana Begum, can I? Uh, now yeah. only I join. OK. Uh, your presentation will be in which session? Please let me know. Actually, 550 to 6, ma'am. Now, uh, somebody call me. Now you can join and you can present your uh, presentation. Uh, are you sure that you are in hall 2 or in hall 3? 
Can you please confirm? Yeah, uh, ma'am. Uh, just a minute. I will check. Okay. Uh, ma'am, hall two, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Uh, no problem. Uh, so you are Sheikh Rukhsana Bikam, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, you may present. So now let me just uh, give a small introduction. Like uh, now this is a session on uh, energy, short and vital lectures. This will be again of uh, 10 minutes and followed by further discussion. So I now I welcome Rukhsana Bikam for her presentation. You may please start your presentation now. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, ma'am, my slides are visible. Yes, but it is in a smaller size. I think it's fine. Ma'am, actually, I sent you. Uh, I sent you. Or, uh, I sent you uh, my slides, ma'am. Can you please? Yeah, we will uh, we'll do. Okay, wait. So, I will think it's now. Uh, You could see a glimpse of your presentation now. So, okay, then we'll present it from our side. So, can you just wait for some time? We'll move on to the next speaker and then come back to you. Is that fine? Okay, ma'am. Okay. So now uh, let me invite Shruti Rajeshikaran, SIL-115 from the Department of Chemistry, Christ University, Bangalore. Shruti Rajeshikaran, are you there? Ma'am, once again, I'm just connecting to this. Uh, can you wait for two minutes, ma'am? Or can I present yeah, sure. next? Or how is it? Okay, no problem. Uh, because... Uh, okay. okay I'll present next, ma'am. I'm just making it ready. Two... Uh, Uh, Rukhsana, can you please assure to which melody you have uh, shared your presentation? Uh, ma'am, Sheikh Rukhsana Begum, ma'am. Uh, can you please mention which to which melody you have shared your uh, presentation? Nano materials at the Nano macro. Okay. Uh, macro. Mm -hmm.
मैम कैन आई प्रेजेंट नाउ हेलो श्रुति आर यू रेडी विद योर प्रेजेंटेशन यस यस आई एम रेडी मैम Okay. Uh, so I request Rukhsana to wait for some time while we are download the things. So now I request Shruti to share your slides and start presentation. Ah. Uh, okay, ma'am. Ah. Uh, now only. Ah. Uh, okay. Again, I will send you, ma'am, that same mail ID. Okay. 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 Fine. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Shruti, please share it. Yes. Yes. 